Okay, I think we're ready. Uh, good morning, everyone. I would like to call this meeting uh, to order at 10 a.m. As many of you know, the governor has recently signed Public Act 101-0640, making certain amendments to the Open Meetings Act so that we, along with other boards and commissions, can continue to host virtual meetings during this COVID-19 public health emergency, provided that certain conditions are met. One of those conditions is that I, as head of the Chicago Plan Commission, determined that an in-person meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission is not practical nor prudent. I want to make sure that our virtual meeting meets all uh, the conditions of the Open Meetings Act as amended. Therefore, I am making a determination pursuant to the newly created Section 7E2 of the Open Meeting Act that an in-person meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission is not practical nor prudent. Similarly, I am also making a determination pursuant to the newly created Section 7E5 that because of the disaster as declared by the governor, it is unfeasible for at least one member of the Chicago Plan Commission or its chief administrative officer or its chief legal officer to be physically present at the meeting place in as much as there is no physical meeting place. Before we get into the full meeting agenda for the April 19, 2023 Chicago Plan Commission meeting, I would like to ask everyone that because we are meeting virtually, please be mindful of your surroundings in terms of noise. Please remember to keep yourself muted when you're not speaking. The meeting is being recorded and also live streamed for public viewing. Lastly, if you're an active participant in the meeting, especially if you're speaking, please do not watch the live stream as this will cause auto interference. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to also provide guidance quickly to those who have pre-registered to provide testimony on the cases presented for public hearing today. Those who requested to testify at the plan commission today should have already submitted testimony forms, which included the speaker's full name and address, as well as the public hearing item number, and those have been gathered by the staff. I would also like to remind our presenters to please be mindful of their presentation length and to please stay on point in a concise and efficient manner so as to respect the time of all in attendance. Out of respect for others, speakers should please limit your comments to three minutes. When your name is called, your microphone will be unmuted to allow you to make comments. Please attempt to refrain from repeating comments that have been made by previous speakers. The public comment portion of the meeting is not a question and answer session of the staff or the applicant, but an opportunity for attendees to voice their opinions on a particular proposal. Out of respect for others, please do not interrupt or disrupt the speakers. Any individuals who disrupt the presentation or any subsequent comment session may be muted and removed from the virtual hearing session. We will not call the roll. Can you please verify that you can hear me and see me? Um, Commissioner Barkley. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Viaggi. Don't believe she's here. Commissioner Brunfield. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Burnett. Not here yet. Uh, Commissioner Cox. Uh, here, I can hear you and see you. Thank you. Commissioner Escareño. Not here yet. Commissioner Flores here. Commissioner Garza. Not here today. Mayor Lightfoot, not here today. Commissioner Lyons. Here, present, thank you. Th thank you. Commissioner Murphy, not here. Commissioner Novada, not here. Commissioner Osterman, not here yet. Commissioner Reyes. Here, present. Thank you. Commissioner Soto. Not here yet. Commissioner Esposado. Not here. Commissioner Tillman. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Tunney. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Villegas. Not here. Commissioner Wagensback. Not here. Okay. Uh, we will now approve the minutes from the March 16, 2023 regularly scheduled plan commission meeting. Uh, the minutes were distributed prior to today's hearing. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the regularly scheduled meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission held on the uh, held on March 16, 2023? 
So moved by Commissioner Brumfield. Thank you, Commissioner Brumfield. Do I have a second motion? Second by Commissioner Tillman. Thank you, Commissioner Tillman. Roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Barkley? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Brumfield, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cox? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Flores is a yes. Commissioner Lyons? Abstain. Okay. Commissioner Tillman? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tunney? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I believe that's Gentlemen, it. Let's go back yes. to Commissioner Reyes. We skipped Commissioner Reyes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Sorry about that. Commissioner Reyes? Abstain. I was not present. Okay, got that. And I believe that's it. Did I miss anybody else? No, okay. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, deferrals. We have three items for which we are seeking a deferral. Uh, the first item is number three under the ANLPA uh, and ANLAP heading in the omnibus section, a resolution recommending a proposed ordinance authorizing an adjacent neighbor's land acquisition program generally located at 7414 South Phillips Avenue to uh, Marshana Marie Cooley. And this is in the seventh ward to a future plan commission hearing date. Do I have a motion to approve the deferral of this item? So moved. so moved by Tani. So moved by Tani. Do I have a second? Second by Lyons. Thank you, Commissioner Lyons. Roll call vote. Commissioner Barkley? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Brumfield? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Flores is a yes. Commissioner Lyons, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tillman? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tunney, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. The second item is number five uh, under the ANLAP heading in the omnibus section, a resolution recommending a proposed ordinance authorizing an adjacent neighbor's land acquisition program generally located at 7507 South May Street to uh, Zachary Lee Jones. Uh, this is in the 17th Ward. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the deferral of this item? So move, Reyes. Thank you, Commissioner Reyes. Do I have a second? Tony. Second. Second by Tony, thank you. Roll call vote, Commissioner Barkley? Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Brumfield? Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Flores is a yes. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Reyes, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tillman. Yes. And lastly, uh, Commissioner Tunney, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Uh, the third and last item for deferrals um, is item number D2, a proposed amendment to residential business plan development number 139, submitted by BAI Century LLC for the property generally located at 2828 North Clark Street. The applicant proposes to amend a plan development, uh, plan development number 139 to remove limitations and the ability to seek liquor licenses for the property, no physical changes or new land uses are proposed. And this is in the 44th Ward. Do I have a motion to approve the deferral of this item? Move, Tillman. Motion Second. by Commissioner Second Tillman. Barclay. Second by Commissioner Barkley. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Brownfield? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Flores is a yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Tillman? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tunney? Yes. Thank you. 
motion passes. We will now, uh, yes. Commissioner Flores, um, just since this is in 44, I wasn't aware of the deferral. So the applicant has asked for the deferral. Yes, um, yes. Uh, it's Noah. They, they have um, some of their legal documents and ducks they need to get in a row. So uh, Nick could okay. submit it. Just so I know, surprise yes, to me. Sir. Sorry Thank about you. that. I'll uh, talk to the planner. We will now take uh, public testimony for the items remaining on the agenda today. Uh, a reminder that items number three and five under the ANLAP heading and item D2 have all been deferred. If you have signed up to speak on any which was deferred, you are welcome to do so or to hold your comments to uh, the future plan commission hearing at which that item appears. Um, we have received speaking forms from eight individuals for items on today's agenda. The first speaker is Ms. Bonnie Sanchez Carlson to speak on item D12 at 1225 South Indiana, if she can get ready to speak. She Good will morning. be followed. Thank you. I, we can hear you. You can go ahead. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the commission. My name is Bonnie Sanchez Carlson, and I am the president and executive director of the Near South Planning Board. We are a not-for-profit community-based organization serving the businesses, institutions, and stakeholders on the Near South side. Thanks to Alderman Pat Dow, Near South Planning Board had the opportunity to review plans submitted by 1200 South Indiana as the applicant seeks lakefront protection approval for the property located at 1225 South Indiana Avenue. These plans call for the construction of a five-story multifamily building with 100 dwelling units built on a vacant lot with sufficient parking provided and approximately 12,000 square feet of open space within the original Central Station PD. Near South Planning Board is pleased with the amount of open space planned for the area including the privately funded park, which would be accessible to the public by three entry points during hours of operation. While the development team mentioned tree replacement along the parkway to improve the landscape, Nearsop Planning Board requested from them a more thorough landscape plan and has yet to receive it. While we believe this aesthetically pleasing building has been thoughtfully designed and fits in with the character of the neighborhood, we do have concerns related to the height of the raised terrace wall for the units facing Indiana Avenue. Based on the proposal, the terrace wall has the appearance of being too high, especially on the north side of the property towards Roosevelt Road, where, it's, where the street slopes. Our organization sought clarification on the height of the wall along Indiana at its highest point, which we recommend should not exceed four feet, and we have not received a response. So we asked once again, what is the height of the terrace wall? Our issue arises out of safety concerns for those tenants. While we asked the applicant to heed our recommendation regarding the height of the terrace wall, Near South Planning Board does in fact fully support the approval of the lakefront protection application and urges plan commission approval. We look forward to seeing this project come to fruition. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. The second speaker is Mr. Patrick Cott, also to speak on item D12 at 1225 South Indiana. He'll be followed by the third speaker, Mr. Daniel Lynch. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Patrick Cott, and I am the president of the Tower Residences Condominium Association at 1235 South Prairie Avenue. On behalf of Tower Residences, I'm here to convey our objection to the planned residential development at 1225 South Indiana Avenue because it violates the height restrictions specified in the Declaration of Restrictive Covenant from September 20th, 2004, a copy of which we have provided to the Plan Commission in our written submission we sent on Monday. Over the past several months, we've been in communication with the developer, his architects, and his attorney as well as Alderman Dowell's office to explain how the proposed development exceeds the height restrictions specified in section one of the restrictive covenant, which states 
no structures or buildings on the property, including but not limited to water towers, standpipes, penthouses, elevators or elevator equipment, stairways, ventilating fans, skylights, tanks, cooling towers, wireless radio or television antennae or flagpoles located upon such structures or buildings shall exceed a height of 70 feet above the zero baseline of the Chicago city datum. In our discussion with the developer and his team, they provided us with a site survey that clearly shows that the great le grade level at 1225 South Indiana Avenue as it is at an elevation of 13.74 feet. We have also provided this version of the survey to you in our written submission. This survey further shows that the grade level of our building at 1235 South Prairie Avenue is at an elevation of 14.88 feet, which we have confirmed with the firm that created the original plat of survey for our building is 14.88 feet above the Chicago city datum. We've also provided a letter and plat of survey from the surveyor, McTigan Associates, which confirms this. The building height diagrams that the developer has submitted to you show that the highest point of the proposed building, which is an elevator enclosure, is at 78 feet above grade level. This means the top of the proposed building will be at 91.74 feet above CCD, exceeding the height limit specified in the restrictive covenant by 21.74 feet. We have shared our objection with the developer, his architects, and his attorney in writing, in phone discussions, as well as at Alderman Dowell's recent town hall meeting on March 16th. In all these settings, the developer and his team have not acknowledged that their plans violate the restrictive covenant. And the developer's recent removal of all references to grade level elevation and CCD in their submission to the plan commission implies that they want everyone to ignore that the grade level of their property is in fact 13.74 feet above CCD. Because we have a legally binding covenant that restricts the height of any structure or building on this property to 70 feet above CCD, and because this proposed development clearly exceeds this limit, we urge you to reject this application until they submit a revised plan that conforms to the height limitation set forth in the restrictive covenant. Thank you for the opportunity for me to convey our objection and the reasons behind it. Thank you, Mr. Cott. And I think we have a clarification uh, from Noah on this. Thanks, Chairwoman. Yes, just for, for the plan commissioner, so they have the general information. Uh, the attorney for the applicant will be on uh, to present, and questions can be directed to him about uh, the legal agreement. Noah, uh, could you speak up? I can't hear sure. you. Yes, Alderman, sorry about that. So the uh, the private attorney will be on later, uh, Nick Patikas, to speak about the applicant's discussions and about their obligations under the private agreement. Noah, you're okay. fading in and out. All right, how about now? Is that better? If you'd stay at that level or I'll, that's... <laughs> I'll try, I'll try to stay at this level perfectly. So again, while Nick Fatikas, the attorney will be on later to speak to the private agreement and discussions that have happened amongst the parties, the zoning ordinance, the plan development ordinance that was approved permits a building of this size, density and height. Um, there is indeed a private agreement that was made between parties and they'll have to work those details out, but nothing in the zoning ordinance prohibits this development from happening. As a matter of fact, the zoning ordinance allows a building much larger than this to be built on the site and uh, could be expected given the context in the surrounding areas. So I just wanna make it clear that it's not a zoning ordinance restriction or a height or density restriction that's in place. It's a private agreement amongst two parties. Thank you, Noah. The third speaker signed up uh, is Mr. Daniel Lynch on item D1. Uh, okay, before we move on to the speaker, uh, Commissioner Tunney, you, you have a comment? Yeah, uh, thank you, Noah. I, as zoning chair, I'm well aware of restrictive covenants and city is not party to these things. However, if if this is, this will be an interesting discussion point um, for us as commissioners to listen to the arguments on both sides. To me, it's a valid argument, whether it's a private agreement or not. Um, but it's just, um, it'll be interesting to see what the developer as attorneys feel about this. So, right. absolutely, Thank Alderman. You. I, I will let you know, Alderman, that we did make uh, Nick Fatikas aware of the uh, issues and that he should be prepared to discuss those with any questions or objections the plan commissioners had today. So, he, he is prepared to discuss that at your will or uh, in response to any questions when the item comes up. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Daniel Lynch to speak on item D1 at 453 West Briar. Is he ready? If you could give me 30 seconds, not even, I apologize. 
No okay, worries. Thank, thank you. I'm prepared. Okay. Please go ahead. I'm. Uh, my name's Dan Lynch. I'm here to speak on behalf of uh, Agnes Brooks, who's the neighbor for this proposed development at 453 West Bryant Place. And in addition, several other um, members of the community that um, received notice have asked me to also identify them uh, in their opposition to the uh, proposal to build this structure. Uh, I'd like to call them out by name, Joanne and Antoine Bobble at 422 West Briar. Steve and Lizanne Phelan at 454 West Briar, excuse me, West Berry. Uh, Alan Taman and Jessica Craig at 454 West Berry. Charlene and Dominic Rucolo at 454 West Berry. Thomas Stringer at 456 West Bayer. Natalie Russell at 3158 North Pine Grove. John and Karen Coons at 3162 North Pine Grove. And Merle Wolin at 3163 North Pine Grove. This proposed structure uh, rep uh, replaces some much smaller buildings um, and dramatically changes the look and feel of, uh, of Briar. Um, the specific comment that continues to come up among the people that have asked me to speak on their behalf is the setback uh, issues. Uh, the opposition is not so much to the proposal to build a much larger structure itself, but that in addition to wanting to knock down smaller structures and build a bigger one, the developer wants to uh, cut in half the, uh, the required setback, which will substantially reduce light and, uh, and airspace uh, and green space. Uh, in the neighborhood. And for that reason, all of the people that I've identified would like to make sure that whatever is constructed there is constructed consistently with the existing setback regulations. I, I appreciate the commission's uh, entertaining uh, the objections of the people I identified. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. The fourth speaker is Ms. Uh, Leandra Khan to speak on item D10 at 8201 South um, South Shore, followed by Mary Lou Cito. Good morning. My name Good morning. Leandra, my name's Leandra Khan. I'm a lifelong Chicagoan, a former Chicago Public School student, teacher, assistant principal, principal, and parent. I'm also the executive director at Epic Academy. Epic was founded in 2009 with the goal of providing the students in the South Chicago community with a high quality school high school option. I'm speaking today to talk about our desires to build a new school for the students of Epic and the community. Epic now occupies a CPS elementary school that was built in 1902. We are without a gymnasium, auditorium, library, full cooking kitchen, adequate science labs and adequate bathrooms. Yet we have been able to provide our students with four years of college and career skills coursework access to internships, dual credit and advanced placement courses and a variety of electives and enrichment programs and more, but our students and families deserve more. A new school for Epic is an issue of equity and access. Providing access to a high quality learning environment and a state of the art facility shouldn't be a privilege. It should be a right for every student, especially students in communities whose families depend on the quality education to catalyze generational advancement. Approving a new school building for Epic in the South Chicago community will not only work to catalyze long lasting change in the lives of students, but it has the potential to serve as a much needed hub for the community, a community that for far too long has experienced disinvestment. Science tells us that environment is critical for the growth and development of any living thing. How much more is this true for our students at Epic and its community? It is my hope that this project is supported because a new space they can see themselves in every young that they can see themselves in every young person that walks into the building that they can see brilliant leaders who just need more opportunity to thrive a new building shows them that we believe in them and are invested in their future thanks for listening thank you for your statement ms khan uh next is uh ms mary lou Seidel to speak on item D11 at 5950 South Stony Island. 
Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thanks. My name is, thank you, commissioners. My name is Mary Lou Seidel. I'm the Director of Community Engagement for Preservation Chicago. I urge you today to deny the plan for an accessible active playground on the east end of the Midway Plaisance in the Hyde Park neighborhood at 5950 South Stony Island. We support the design of this playground. The need for accessible play areas in Chicago is great. The Chicago Park District should move forward with this plan. They just need to do it through a transparent, equitable community process to identify a location that is truly underserved by parks at present. When the city of Chicago made the decision for the park district, where the replacement park for the Obama Presidential Center taking would be located, it was a top down, it was as top down as city planning gets. The city chose what potential sites would be considered without public input. The city developed a scoring matrix for sites that did not fully vet these potential sites, including not considering if the proposed replacement parks are in areas currently underserved by parks. The list was not informed by community residents or park advocates. There was no public discussion of what potential sites should be considered for this replacement park. What we end up with is a replacement park and a park design in a location that has Jackson Park, Washington Park, and the Chicago Lakefront within sight nearly. There are plenty of assessments done by park advocates on park deserts in Chicago and an abundance of vacant city lots that could be utilized for a new park. We end up with a park surrounded on all sides by busy streets and a well-traveled commuter and Amtrak train line. Traffic on these roads will only escalate as the OPC begins greeting visitors. We end up with an accessible playground that will put the health and safety of all the park visitors at risk. We end up with an accessible play playground without a adequate accessible parking. We end up with an accessible play playground that does not have restroom facilities. We end up with a plan that intentionally drains naturally occurring wetlands to achieve this misguided goal. As we enter a new administration, we have a new opportunity to plan Chicago parks equitably, inclusively, and well informed by the communities that this decision will impact. Will you stand today in support of transparency, equity, justice, and the environment? Please send this plan back to the Chicago Park District. This park design will be a great asset to visitors and it needs to be informed by an assessment of the true needs for access to parks and spaces that are safe for visitors. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Seidel. Uh, next is Ms. Uh, Lewis McMurray on item D11 at 5950 South Stony Island. She'll be followed morning, by Mr. Me? Adams. Yes, we can hear you. Can I start? Yes, please go oh, ahead. Okay. Good morning. Thank you so much for allowing me to come speak to you today. Uh, it's maybe a story of, of a park from 1893 to 2023. The Midway East section is an area that after the World's Fair, when all the buildings were taken down, what remained was a series of wonderful pathways that were created for wheelchairs throughout the park. The concept being that people who came to the World's Fair, many of them couldn't walk the distances. And so they created a wheelchair brigade of PhD students from the University of Chicago who paid their way through school by pushing people around the park on beautiful pathways designed for, 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 for inclusiveness and accessibility. Fast forward from 1893 to 2023, many of those pathways are now decrepit and falling apart. It's time we did something to improve them. I've come here speaking fully in favor of both our accessible pathways, of repairing our overused field for, for open sports play, of, of repairing the memorial to the Cheney good women who in fact were our first women senators uh, this district uh, from our area. And finally to create a playground that is open and accessible to grandmothers and grandfathers and children that are better disabled. To start first with talking about where we are today, we're in a place where post COVID, people do not come out and play. In fact, they stay inside. Children with disabilities, parents with disabilities don't come out and play. So having an open accessible playground is really, really important. Uh, the concept of, of a place to play that you can get to by paths that are paved and, and are open for runners and joggers and folks on wheelchairs is really, really vital and a vital part of this plan. 
our field that is in front of the, of the play area is a soccer field and a football field and a baseball field that has been used for years. I have coached there for 33 years, soccer, so I can, I can speak from experience of marking those fields and laying them out. It's been used by thousands of children who have loved being in that area, who weren't in danger, who had plenty of places to park and seats for their parents. Then the wonderful Cheney Goodman world, uh, Flora Sylvester Cheney and, and Hancock Good were polished for people who fought for the right for women to vote. They were elected as the first senators from the 5th District. Their, their uh, memorial was put up in the 1930s. And within a week of going up, according to the Hyde Park Herald, young men basically defaced the sculpt, the, the memorial, and it has not been repaired since. We have lots of sculptures for men in our parks. We have lots of memorials for men in our park. Almost none for women. It's now time that we begin to write that on the Midway. And finally, the whole concept of being in an educational community, which makes its way uh, in the world by offering offering ways to solve problems. This concept of a playground that's open and accessible to folks in wheelchairs, to folks that are walking, to folks that are from the community, it gives them an opportunity to have a playground they can use and enjoy. And it represents the finest in terms of thinking about how you include kids in the process. I, I urge you to support this uh, and look forward to your vote this afternoon. Thank you, Ms. McMurray. Uh, next is Mr. Butler Adams to speak on item D5 at 3.30 North Clark. Uh, and the last speaker signed up is Dr. Uh, Brown Nichols Lodato. Can Mr. you hear me? Adams? Yes, we can. Thank yes. you. Yes. Good morning. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of the project on, I think it's 3. 300, 320 North Clark Street. Uh, I spoke in favor of this project a few years ago. I think it was, I went through back in 2016. Uh, they had a public meeting back in May of 2016 in the Reed Murdoch building. I attended that public meeting all those years ago. And I remember this building was gonna be partial office and partial hotel. And I think right now they're going in for a change to possibly add residential as well. Um, so I certainly approve of that. This is the downtown area that's changing. It is more residential has been built and it's coming downtown. So this is kind of a simple change. I saw that in some of the submissions that Alderman, Alderman Riley also uh, stated his support, but he also did emphasize that uh, in the previous project, they were talking about decking over Carroll Avenue behind the building uh, to access uh, Clark and LaSalle Street. So I do hope that that's encouraged and stays in this plan. I will say one thing, uh, the presentation online had absolutely no renderings of the project that, uh, that got approved in 2016. Now I was slightly disappointed. I remember what it looked like, but I has also had to look it up because there was no, there are no renderings in the, in the documents placed online. So I do hope that that's uh, rectified in future presentations. And to the, um, developers, seeing as you are changing this to residential, I hope there's also a rethought of this building in, in its own. It was not a bad building before. The design was pretty nice. I think it was Greg Architects. I can't remember specifically. I think it was Greg. It was pretty decent design. <laughs> With it being also a potentially residential, I hope the developers consider maybe even going taller, having a more epic building there along the river's edge. As someone who's talked about buildings on the Chicago River, I've been doing that for more than 20 years. This would give me something else to talk about. So I certainly approve this project and I look forward to it maybe possibly actually moving forward after, well, seven years, I think. It's been about seven years. So look forward to this, uh, maybe taking baby steps forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Uh, the last speaker signed up is Dr. Nichols on item D11 at 5950 South Stony Island. Okay. Are you ready? Sorry, Chairman, what was the name again? I... Dr. Brown Nichols Lodato. Oh, okay, got it. Can you Go. hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Good morning. My name is Bronwyn Nichols Lodato. I am president of the Midway Plaisance Advisory Council, IMPAC, a public community organization that serves the Midway Plaisance as a Southside Park designed by Frederick Law Olmsted that is listed on the National Registry of Historic Places and is part of the historic Chicago Boulevard system. A popular 
location for active and passive recreation. The Midway hosted attractions during the 1893 World's Fair and continues to draw visitors from across the city and from around the globe for events, such as international music festivals that celebrate African American cultural legacy, ice skating, movie nights, and an event recently celebrating the contribution of women in politics in honor of the Cheney Good Memorial Bench. I'm pleased that Impact has prioritized advocacy for the Midway's ecosystem. This ecosystem can enhance the city's climate goals through the park's sprawling tree canopy and yes, it's wetland, a geological designation firm affirmed by the Army Corps of Engineers. In addition to its vital carbon capture function, the Midway's almost half acre wetland along with its tree canopy serves migrating birds that use the Mississippi Migratory Flyway. For these reasons, Impact supports an alternative plan to install native plants and enhance features of the wetland to pre preserve its environmental function while educating users about sustainability in our parks. The framing of the wetland as a nuisance attracting bugs and bird waste and that is basically nasty doesn't just cynically misinform the public. It has the additional chilling effect to obscure the reality of the key function of this environmental asset in absorbing carbon, offsetting the effects of the climate crisis that disproportionately adversely affect Chicago's black and brown communities. So what's characterized as a gross area is literally earth providing a life-sustaining function for humans and wildlife alike. The park district has consistently presented the public with a Ms. Nichols, we lost your audio. I have a feeling, Chairwoman, she might have lost her internet connection. Okay. Um, we can give her choice. a couple. Remove the wetland or have. <laughs> I am on the phone. You are going in and out uh, with your audio. Um, I think the last. 15 seconds or so, we couldn't hear you. I'm sorry, could I have a reset at that time? <laughs> sure. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. 130, Serena. Thank you. Thank you so much. The Park District has consistently presented the public with a false choice. Remove the wetland or have play space. This is not true. We can have environmental justice by preserving our parks environmental assets while making equitable park investments in areas where youths are underserved and deprived of safe, active recreational opportunities. As a start, please reject the park district's application and call for a public transparent planning process. Impact is pleased that its position is supported by organizations including Preservation Chicago, Jackson Park Watch, Open Lands, Landmarks Illinois, Friends of the Parks and the Olmstead Network, as well as the Chicago Metro Chair of the Climate Reality Project, to name a few. The Park District's Eastern proposal is a legacy of failed policies of the past that neither the Park District nor the city should continue. Chicago is a turning point where it can exploit its climate advantages and address past racial injustices. The Park District's proposal keeps us stuck in old patterns and practices that fail to do both. Let's move forward together and reflect new ways of thinking and practices that truly serve our communities. Thank you very much and happy Earth Day. Thank you, Ms. Nichols. Um, that is it for uh, signed up speakers. Uh, do we have any other members of the public who wish to make public comments at this time? Please raise your hand in the Zoom window and we will call your name in the order they appear. Commissioner Burnett, I see you're here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I believe we have one person uh, that has raised their hand. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, your woman, uh, Deanna Vaughn. Okay. Hi there, and I thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Deanna Vaughn, and I'm the president of the Museum Park East Umbrella Association representing the towers and townhomes south of 13th Street. The um, Umbrella Association was granted quick claim by Enterprise Development of Central Station to 13th Street between uh, Indiana and South Prairie Avenue, also known as Outlot One. Uh, we are a private road. We are constructed of pavers and not concrete which requires constant maintenance and additional traffic would further degrade the street uh, condition as it is. 
It has already been determined in court that 13th Street east of Prairie cannot support vehicles over 6,000 pounds, which causes recycle and refuse tr trucks to stay in the intersection. Uh, we do have, we are experiencing some issues because of that as well. Uh, but combine that with other service vehicles, automobile traffic to four parking garages and uh, townhomes in the near vicinity to uh, the intersection of 13th and Prairie, uh, as well as cars um, from people visiting the restaurant and dry cleaners uh, located at 1235 South Prairie. Uh, as well as pedestrians, we have many families, people with dogs um, traveling to the Webster Park, which is south of the intersection there, as well as other people in the South Loop community visiting those businesses and the South Loop market, all tra uh, traversing in the same area. Uh, these issues have significant impact on the safety of the residents in the area due to the volume and the poor visibility. We have had issues with close calls with pedestrians already. Um, the developer wishes to add his ingress and egress uh, of his 87 space garage at the intersection of 13th and Prairie, which further strains an already overburdened area. As it is 13th Street, between Indiana and South Prairie is a designated fire lane. It's narrow as is, and uh, the fire department has challenges navigating through there. Uh, the developer also wants to add a lay by lane further complicating uh, the street with stoppage and congestion. The past, in the past, the ingress and egress was supposed to be off of Indiana, and we would uh, appreciate the board considering the um, ingress and egress to be put back on Indiana. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bond. Are there any other speakers that would like to make a statement? Uh, I see Christy Rawson. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Christy Rawson. I am the treasurer of the Midway Plaisance Advisory Council. And um, I've been so for um, approximately a year and a half. And in that period of time, I have done a lot of research and um, a lot of advocacy around um, uh, impacts desire to save and enhance the wetland on the East End. And that's the topic on which I would like to speak. I am in full support of everything said by Mary Lou Seidel and Dr. Bronwyn Nichols Lodato. Um, this is the wrong site for an accessible playground. The amount of money that it would cost to drain a wetland is uh, it's like completely outside of anything that we could use to restore that area with enhanced with an, an enhanced the wetland with native plants that would absorb and grow and um, significantly increase the potent the area's potential for carbon capture. Um, the wetland has consistently in and of itself just inherently being a wetland. It has rejected our attempts to turn it into a lawn. It is not a lawn. A monoculture on a wetland does not enhance what nature intended for wetland sites. We need to plant appropriate plants in there surrounded by um, uh, some prairie restoration with pollinators that would attract birds and, po and well, surrounded by um, pollinator friendly plants that would attract birds, bees, butterflies. We lost a lot of biodiversity in this area when the women's garden was destroyed. There was constantly birds and pollinators. Things were constantly blooming, native and not native. There are a lot of different sorts of um, wildlife in there at all times. I saw bunnies all the time. The area has been greatly diminished in its biodiversity with the destruction of the women's garden to, um, to build the Obama Center. So we have an opportunity here not only to save a lot of money, beautify that block, and we'll have 
However, the, the city actually doesn't have a budget for the um, playground structure and the drainage of the of the entire block. So, but we are sure that um, whatever the city thinks that it's going to be able to spend in that site could be so much better spent building the same accessible playground in a an underserved, a parks underserved area in um, the south side of Chicago. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Ms. Rawson. Do we have any other speakers? If not, uh, then we will go on to the next item. I'm not seeing any more hands go up. Uh, next on the agenda are matters submitted in accordance with the Interagency Planning Referral Act. Do I have a motion to approve items number one under the disposition heading and items two through nine under the ANLAP heading uh, with a reminder that item three and item five have been deferred plus item number nine under the disposition heading? I need a motion for this. So moved by Brumfield. Thank you, Commissioner Brumfield. Do I have a second? Second by Tony. Thank you, Commissioner Tunney. Uh, roll call vote. Commissioner Barkley? Commissioner Barkley, we can't hear you. I see you're on. Okay, I'll come back. Commissioner Brenfield, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Burnett? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Flores is a yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Barkley is a yes. Perfect. Thank you, Commissioner Barkley. Um, Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tunney, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tillman? Yes. Thank you. And I see Commissioner Wagensback join. Yes, Chairwoman, I, if I could be recognized for purposes of quorum first, then I'd, I'll be a yes too. Thank you. Chairwoman, okay. also want to uh, recognize Commissioner Murphy is joining. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Murphy, would you like to vote on this? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, motion passes, thank you. Now we will move on to the public hearing presentation portion for matters submitted in accordance with the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance and or the Chicago zoning ordinance. Just a reminder that item D2 for 2828 North Clark has been deferred to a future plan commission agenda date. Also one quick note, we will be slightly adjusting the order of the agenda today with item D10 going first, and then we will return to the regular order of the agenda. Sorry for the confusion and the last minute changes today. And now I will turn on the uh, over the gavel to vice chairman Brunfield for this item. Thank you, Chairwoman Flores. Thank you. The first item today is D10, proposed plan development submitted by the School for Social Entrepreneurship, DBA, Epic Academy, for the property generally located at 8205, 8259 South Shore Drive, 3134, 3158 East 83rd Street, and 8283, 8258 South Brandon Avenue. The applicant proposes to rezone the site from RS3 detached housing district to RM5 residential multi-unit district prior to establishing the plan development. The plan development will support the renovation of an existing four-story school building and the construction of a four-story expansion building for a total of an approximately 67,000 square foot high high school with 17 accessory vehicle parking spaces and 12 bicycle parking spaces. The overall FAR for the development will not exceed 2.0. This is item 21178, located in the seventh ward. Erica Selke will provide the context overview and present the proposed plan. Erica. Yes, hi, good morning, Vice Chair and Commissioners. Um, I believe my screen is loading now, trying to go into, okay, here we go, full screen. Um, so yes, this is a proposal for a new PD in the seventh ward at 8231 South South Shore Drive. 
This is in the South Chicago uh, community area. Um, has about 27,000 residents. Uh, the area has seen population decreases over the past 20 years. Um, it's predominantly Black uh, with a large uh, Latino population as well. In terms of plans, uh, We Will Chicago uh, certainly is one um, that we'll look to uh, for this particular item in terms of ensuring um, uh, schooling for children and creating uh, learning environments. The South Chicago Quality of Life Plan um, uh, was developed in 2007, but also uh, uh, looks for expanding student and parent programs and enhancing academic achievement in the area. In Best Southwest, as well, uh, while this is not on an Invest Southwest corridor, it is within South Chicago, which is an Invest Southwest community area. Uh, and then uh, the final plan I mentioned is a recipe for healthy spaces, um, or excuse me, places. And uh, this talks about um, local schools and community centers offering uh, quality food. Um, and you'll see in that proposal, uh, the facility will have um, a new kitchen and um, community space. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Leandra Khan, who is the executive director of EPIC. Ms. Khan? Good morning again. Thank you for having me. I just wanted to talk a bit about what makes EPIC special. EPIC was founded by teachers. So this was a design with organization from the very start. What, um, what we focus a lot on is the student experience. So while we are providing a high quality high school education, we're also trying to ensure that our students are prepared for the future. So we, as I mentioned in my public comments, we offer four years of college and career skills coursework so that students are um, constantly being scaffolded through the, the post-secondary experience. We have a career intensive program where our students are paired with corporate business and community partners to work on real world problems that those organizations have. So each, each semester we have about eight to 12 partners. So our students will experience um, a work-like project um, 20 times over the course of their high school career. Each year we have a student, at least one student, who amasses a million dollars in scholarships. Last year, our students amassed over $5 million in scholarships. We, 100% of our students get accepted. Um, we have been striving even in our COVID, post-COVID experiences. Our teachers and staff are a reflection of the students that we serve. Um, equity and inclusion are an extreme important part of the culture at EPIC. Um, we're excited about the opportunity to provide our students with high quality physical education and health education with our new school. We are hoping that our community spaces like our gymnasium and our media center, um, our cafeteria can, can act as a, a place where the community can also gather. This school gives us an opportunity to increase programming, not only for our students, but for the South Chicago community. I've been the ED there since 2020, and um, this, this job was a dream for me because I'm also a former structural engineer. So having the opportunity to um, be the executive director, having 20 years experience, almost 20 years experience in education, and then my previous career as an engineer, um, marrying those two skills has been really important to me. So I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to do this work. Thank you. And I'll jump in now for the record. My name is Erin Lavin Kebanarji. I serve as the development advisor on behalf of Epic Academy. And first, let me thank Madam Chairwoman and the commissioners for having us here today. Um, it's a very exciting project. And uh, as Leandra mentioned, it's fun to work with a client who is a recovering structural engineer because uh, you can dream the big dreams. So they've uh, assembled a team that is largely minority and women-owned businesses to complete this project. Um, and has done a wonderful job in terms of outreach. Yeah, you can go to the next slide, please, Erica. Sorry, thank you. Uh, in terms of 
uh, engaging the community and understanding that this is a space and place that has been disinvested for many, many years. And so uh, the community is very tied to this place and space because it was a Catholic school and it was a place of assembly and a place of engagement. And so next slide, please. Um, we've hosted a number of different meetings, gone through various community outreaches and listening sessions to make sure that we understand what the community is looking for in this school and how it's to be reflected. Next slide, please. Um, we've had a number of meetings as well. This site has been approved by Chicago Public Schools as a relocation for EPIC itself. Next slide, please. The site is currently, as I mentioned, an archdiocesan property that we are purchasing. Uh, there are two members from the archdiocese, Carol Morris and Eric Whalen, on the call. If there should there be any questions later on, uh, we will be purchasing this property from them. It is currently in the um, South Chicago neighborhood, but about four blocks really uh, from South Shore, as you can see from this slide. It is uh, just west of the U.S. Steel property and just northwest, uh, northwest of the Russell Square Park. So it's an area that has um, wonderful potential and opportunity and fantastic students. Next slide, please. Who can access through the bus lines 5, 26, se <clears throat> pardon me, 71 and 95. Zoomed in here, what you can begin to see is the five minute radius walk shed. Um, but we're also well served by the Metro line, which is about a third of a mile to the west. Next slide, please. As you look at this site, this is a site and the plan development boundaries itself include the Cathedral of St. Michael's, the Archangel. Um, it is bound to the east by Brandon, the south by 83rd Street, the west by South Shore Drive. Um, and the site itself is comprised of two sub areas. If you can go to the next site, please slide please, um, that I'll show you the layout in just a moment, but I wanted to give you a sense of the character of the entire assemblage that's being acquired. The main school structure itself, the former St. Michael's School, has a lot of emotion and connection with people from the community who went to school here. Uh, it's been closed for over 10 years, um, and the campus was comprised not only of the large cathedral to the south that will remain, um, but it was comprised of a convent, a three-story convent to the south, a daycare center that's one story to the north, as well as some residential properties. And so the intention, and as you'll see Juan um, Moreno from JGMA explain, we're going to be maintaining the primary school. And because the floor to floor did not work out in terms of connectivity, uh, we'll be demolishing the smaller ancillary buildings in terms of the con convent itself and the one story auxiliary building and the adjacent residential so that we can uh, bring to fruition the dream and vision that Leandra and her team have laid out for students to be able to strive and, and thrive in a place that is inspiring um, and exciting. Next slide, please. So before I turn it over to Juan so he can share the vision uh, more eloquently, certainly than I, I just wanted to explain the, the sub areas. Um, so north is to the right in this imagery. The building that you see in the center of the sub area A is the building that will remain. Um, the ancillary buildings will be demolished so that we can bring to fruition a site plan that has been worked out through our traffic management that I'll speak to a little bit later, um, but also a fantastic place for laboratories, science labs, media centers, all the wonderful programming that these students deserve. Uh, because the space is um, uh, for parking is within the archdiocesan property um, and the FAR for the area has been established through the plan development boundary, you also see sub area B that is inclusive of the cathedral and inclusive of the parking structure itself. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Juan to speak a little bit about the design. Thank you, Erin. Chair, commissioners, always an honor to share our work with you. This is one of those projects that's so incredibly important. I just want to underscore without the vision of Leandra, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be sharing what we are today. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes it's forgotten how wonderful the South Shore is. And this project is a chance to really celebrate the incredible amenities that occur around it. But I think most importantly, Epic has been in this neighborhood. They're just around the corner and the chance to 
bring a former building back to life, but also add on to it and speak to the future is such an incredible opportunity for this community, for the faculty, for the administration, but I think most importantly for this youth. The next slide. You can see here just uh, the glorious location and just the potential, and that wasn't lost on any of us. Next slide. And that as you see the existing property, that connection to where Epic currently is, but then this starts to plant the seeds as our minds as we were thinking about it for connection visually to the lake and the city. Next slide. Because as you start to elevate within the building, and even for us, that was we walk through the existing facilities, the rooftops, this part of the city just presents itself in such an incredible way that it would be such a miss if we didn't use those incredible amenities, those aspects of our city that are so fundamentally important to all of us, the lake, the skyline, to remind the youth that they are such a fundamental part of our city's future, this architecture has that potential to do that and reinforce that in such a beautiful way. Next slide. So what came out of all of the meetings that Leandra, Evan shared is that this project has a chance to be a beacon, a beacon for the youth, for the community, and that's not lost on any of us and I'll share more what went into it in the next slides. Next. So these are many of the elements that are going into the design, but what I think is of utmost importance is how we can use history, the past as a springboard to the future. The moment when we get into the plans, you know, holding the former Catholic school in such high regard, but I think there's a chance to embrace that, but also create a new experience for the students and the youth. Next slide. So you'll see in the plan here, at the center is the Catholic school, to the right or to the north is the new addition. As we looked at it, we could have used the former entry, but I think that didn't meet the potential of connecting with community and also presenting a project that did reinforce you're also receiving an incredible project that is new. And I wanted to underscore that feeling of new for the youth that walk into this for day one. Next slide. So as you look at the levels from level one, two, three, and four, at the ground floor, it's a sense of entry, new entry, the connection to the community, and those aspects that you can break it down in these two ways. In the addition, are the programmatic components that do offer opportunities to connect the school with the commu community and the families. The classrooms by and large are going to sit within the existing Catholic church. But I also would like to point out, as Leander mentioned, something as critically important as gymnasium, recreation, eating, and community. Those are large spaces but also those are spaces of unique gathering that if you look at level four and where intentionally the gymnasium sits, we could have just stuck the gymnasium in a basement and called it a day, but everybody on this team recognized that that is this incredible potential to put this gem up on the upper floor and bring everybody that passes through this building and connect back to everything that we said conceptually, that is the South Shore, the lake, the neighborhood, and view it as an amenity and view it as such a fundamentally positive part of our city. And um, that really is what inspired the layout of the planning. Next slide. So as you look at the exterior, you can see, I'm going to point you to the bottom elevation to the right side of it. That is the existing Catholic school. When you look at what's new to the left of it, the addition, the verticality, the language, the rhythm, and what we're doing in the new is completely inspired by the former building. But yet it's not exactly the same, nor does it intend to be. So you have this incredible balance between that history and what that school meant to the community that will not be forgotten. And then this new chapter that is epic and the future of what 
epic is, and it's this great relationship between past and present that we achieved. Next. And this, just as we look at the building in the round, because I think that's also equally important, that the building is, is so visible in such a positive way. But you can see even in these images, there's, there's really no backside to this. This is the building that presents itself to the entire neighborhood in such a positive way to create, I guess, such a, a wonderful level of positivity that there is something happening here that is for everyone. Next slide. And then as we go through the images, this is on the northwest corner where you really see that celebration of the gymnasium and how it crests above at the top, but also the notion of, you can go to the next slide, what, how the project feels in relation to the former Catholic school and how they tend to work together in such a beautiful way. Space for outdoor gardens as well, as you can see to the right side of this image. Again, these are incredible moments for connectivity between Epic and the community. Next slide. And then on the east side of the project, the outdoor space, the outdoor recreation that again um, are absent in what they have now, but such a, a fundamental part of what the children deserve. Next. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Juan. Appreciate your creativity and passions here. Um, the project itself has a number of client directed requirements, uh, one of which is um, meeting lead silver, if not better, we certainly hope to do more and especially now with the IRA tax credits looking at different methodologies around reaching at least the prescriptive methodology set forth by DPD, um, but certainly hoping for more and more as we look into costing. Uh, the client has also is the, the EPIC is a unionized charter school and feels very strongly about community engagement, labor engagement as such, we'll be entering into project labor agreement uh, with our chosen uh, the, uh, general contractor. Next slide, please. Additionally, we do have KLOA on the call to speak to the traffic study. If you go to the next slide, you'll begin to see the turning radii that we've worked through with CDOT. We're in a really wonderful part of the city um, where a lot of South Shore has a protected bike lane or uh, uh, ability to have some of that. And so we've worked through with them different ways in which the bike lane can actually be elevated on the same level with the new sidewalks and how the buses turn in. So we're working through all of those details, but we're really excited to be catalytic in this area in terms of walkability and bike transportation as well. Next slide, please. Uh, the stormwater ordinance, obviously, uh, we're, we'll be managing the stormwater on site to the extent possible. Next slide, please. And then in terms of diversity and inclusion, our entire team, as I mentioned, is predominantly minority or women owned. Um, so we feel very strongly from that perspective that we've put together a professional services team as well as a construction team to meet and exceed all of those goals. So business participation as a floor obviously would be 26 and six. Workforce participation uh, will be obviously at least 50%. And we do plan and commit to engage with Hire360 who's been very successful in helping us in other projects to engage apprenticeship workforce going forward. Next slide, please. In terms of job creation, uh, the full-time equivalency projection for the school is about 45 staff members. And then uh, we've calculated the FTE for job creation at about 60 full-time. But as you know, the trades, as they come in and go, different part of the project, we'll have more than 500 people working on this project. So it will be catalytic in the area. Um, with that, I'll turn it back to Erica for the recommendation uh, piece, but we're very happy to be here and just wanted to express our gratitude. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Um, so DPD has concluded that this proposal is appropriate for the site and supports the development for the following reasons. Uh, it uh, pr uh, promotes safe pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicular circulation. Uh, it promotes pedestrian interest, safety, and comfort along South Shore Drive. Um, the building orientation and massing brings the edge of the building up to South Shore Drive and uh, creates a nice pedestrian uh, environment along the street. All sides and areas of the building that are 
visible to the public are treated with materials, finishes, and architectural details that are high quality of use. Um, and uh, because of this, um, uh, we believe that um, the uh, application should be approved. Um, and so now I will hand it back over to um, Vice Chair Brookfield. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, before we turn over uh, the questions uh, to the commissioners, I'd like to recognize uh, Alderman Sadlowski Garza. I believe I see your hand up. Alderman? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I have a question. Um, this sounds like an awesome project. This is directly, although it's in the seventh ward, this is directly across the street from my ward. Um, and this is the first I'm hearing of this project. Um, I, I just have a couple questions, if you don't mind. Um, what are you going to do with the existing cathedral? May I answer? Uh, the existing cathedral is not being amended at all. It's uh, It will be uh, ostensibly locked into its FAR setbacks, et cetera, as a function of this plan development. Okay, great. Because I, I know there's a huge push to landmark that building. I mean, it's it's absolutely gorgeous inside. Um, hopefully, Beautiful we can. Structure. Yeah, it it really is. Um, this anyway. Um, so do you do we have to acquire any land from the on the north end of the project? Uh, the school has reached out. Um, would love to acquire and complete the block. Uh, that process has not been perfected yet, but it's something that would be lovely to do longer term. Okay. So, and what's going to happen to Epic, the existing building, the one that's being utilized now? Are we still going to use that or? Uh, I don't think anybody from CPS is on the call. Leandra, do you, have you spoken to? CPS? Yeah. So CPS will, I mean, it'll just be another one of their um, um, properties that is not being utilized. Um, we asked them if we could potentially make it a, like an academic, like a ninth grade center, like where we can house maybe our ninth graders, um, but we haven't got that far yet, but it just goes back into their portfolio. What, was there any community meetings in regards to this project? Yes, yeah. Alderman Mitchell had a number of community meetings. Okay, I'll, I'll take it up with him. Um, I just, this is the first time I'm hearing of it. I think it's great. I mean, it, it's, it's a great way to utilize a, an existing structure. So thank you for allowing me to answer, to ask some questions and I appreciate everybody's work. That's all. Thank you, Alderwoman. Uh, do the commissioners have any questions of the staff or the applicant? I don't believe I see any hands. Uh, is, is Alderman, oh, I do see one hand. Uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Cox. Uh, do you want to hear from the alderman first? Uh, unfortunately, Commissioner, I don't believe the alderman was able to make the call. Uh, he was in support of the project. He uh, we actually moved this uh, to accommodate some of the scheduling, but it does not appear he joined the call. Mm -hmm. uh, then, okay. Then I would uh, just say, uh, um, Vice Chair, I, I um, to uh, um, Alderman Garza, uh, asked a number of the questions I had having to do with the um, existing structure and uh, what would become of that. And uh, I'm assuming that this is going to take, uh, what, about 24 months before you are, uh, or more, before you're able to, to vacate the existing building and move into your new? Could, could you give us a little bit of your expected timeline? Because you may have fundraising, um, you know, responsibilities, uh, just to give us a sense of when the building that you'd be vacating, when will that be an issue that we have to resolve? And I can speak to our general timeline. Um, we're at the uh, design development phase of the project development. We're interviewing builders um, who've submitted RFPs for consideration. So we're right in the thick of procurement. Um, related phases. Um, the acquisition itself of the property is contingent upon uh, zoning approvals. And so the intention is for EPIC to purchase 
the asset and make it safe. Uh, there's a significant amount of water infiltration into the building right now. And so we've had a number of roofers and other parties come in um, to stabilize the building. And so that will be one of our first steps as you'll see some immediate safety related and water infiltration related construction services. Um, and then the fundraising piece is not perfected as of yet. Um, and so that timeline will um, continue to go on. And as that funding is raised, then we'll be able to start construction. But there will be a pause before the remainder of the demolition and primary construction will take place. And mm -hmm. Leander, uh, correct me if I've said anything you disagree with. No, yeah, um, we've had to have conversations with CPS about the lease that we have with them. And I guess in an ideal world, I'd love for us to be in there in 24, 25. But, um, you know, magic can happen, I suppose. <laughs> so I, I think- project project's faster. No, yes. no <laughs> it's um, all about money. And well, and if, uh, if inspiring uh, folks to contribute is uh, a part of what the architectural vision has to do, I, I think you are well positioned um, um, in that regard. I, I do think that uh, I, I'm glad the conversation about what happens to the vacated building came because I, you know, obviously, you know, with the history of, uh, of public school uh, properties being vacant and what that could do to the neighborhood uh, surrounding them, it's a front of mine. And uh, this building happens to your current building happens to be um, wonderfully located in a very stable community, and uh, it's probably you know from uh, from our planning perspective we need to get out ahead of that. It sounds like we have a a two or three year window potentially. Um, so, uh, but that that said, I just want to um, compliment. Um, compliment you on your vision. Uh, you know, we when we when we saw this project, we were really um, taken by it. And, you know, a lot of times you wonder uh, how how does the, the client find the architect and, you know, that that alignment of, of vision. I think the description of your uh, executive director and her uh, her past as an engineer uh, help explain how this happened. Uh, and I will say that it does make a difference to have have leadership that really understands the the power of design and some of the simple things that were done, uh, like the location of the gymnasium, really as a, a viewing platform for the city at large is is an inspired choice. And uh, I mean, I think any of us who've been above the tree canopy of the one and two story buildings realizes the entire city opens up. And that is going to be the background that these young people uh, get to play um, play in. So I just appreciate that, and and also uh, highly appreciate um, the way that the team has interpreted uh, the history of the buildings around it. Uh, you can clearly see that it's paying homage to it without um, uh, replicating it. Um, so just just a wonderful project that we I, I look forward to. Um, seeing it built and uh, and your ribbon cutting and, and imagining how uh, how how inspired young people will be to go to school here every day. Uh, just thank you. Thank you. With that, are there any uh, additional questions uh, from the commissioners? If not, do I have a motion on a proposed plan development submitted by the School for Social Entrepreneurship, DBA, Epic Academy for the property generally located at 8205-8259 South Shore Drive, 3134-3158 East 83rd Street, and 8232-8258 South Brandon Avenue, finding that it meets the requirements for approval. Do I have a motion? So moved, Reyes. Second, Barclay. Moved by Commissioner Reyes, uh, seconded by Barclays. Thank you. Like with that, I'd like to do a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Barclay? Yes. Commissioner Brumfield is yes. Commissioner Burnett? Yes. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Commissioner Flores has um, is abstaining from this. Um, Commissioner Lyons? Commissioner Lyons? Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. 
Commissioner Tillman. Commissioner Tunney. Yes. Commissioner Villegas. Commissioner Walgus back. Yes. Motion, motion passes. Congratulations. Chairman, uh, I'm Commissioner Navarro is here too. I'm a yes. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Navarro. And my apologies, Commissioner Lyons is yes. Thank you. Both have been recorded. Congratulations, congratulations to the team. Beautiful project. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. With that, thank like for the kind words. Thank you. With that, I'd like to turn the gallop back over to Chairwoman Flores for the remainder of today's plan commission. Chairwoman. Thank you, Vice Chair Brumfield. Uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, D1, a proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lake from Protection Ordinance application submitted by Briar Street 453 LLC for the property generally located at 453 through 455 West Briar Place. The property is zone RM6 and is within the private use zone of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lake from Protection District. The applicant is proposing to construct a 76 foot and four inch tall residential building with eight dwelling units and 12 vehicular parking spaces. This is lakefront item uh, 775 and this is in the 44th ward. Danielle Kreider uh, will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Good morning, uh, thank you. My name is Danielle Kreider, uh, for the record, with the Department of Planning and Development. The applicant is here today to request mm -hmm. approval of a lakefront protection ordinance application for an eight unit, five story building on Briar Place between Broadway and Sheridan. Um, this project is located in the North region, the Lakeview community area and the 44th ward. There's approximately 100,000 people who live in the neighborhood. Um, the average age is 31, and the median income is about 92,000. Uh, the neighborhood has a high walkability and great access to transit. At this point, I will pass the presentation over to the la their land use attorney, Tom Moore. Thank you, Daniela, and thanks for all your help on this. Um, this project has been through a community uh, process. We had many meetings with Alderman Tony before um, going to the community and uh, there were significant, at the first community meeting, there were significant concerns and um, suggestions and the, the project was totally um, uh, changed and converted uh, to meet those concerns. And at the second meeting, um, uh, we, there were still uh, some people who just didn't want a bigger building, but uh, we had the approval of the Southeast Lakeview Neighbors Association. And um, we also appeared in front of uh, the zoning committee and where we had uh, uh, it unanimously uh, passed. And um, to give you a overview of the actual uh, proposal, I'd ask uh, Jeff Goulet to uh, the architect uh, to run us through the um, proposal. Thank you, Tom. Um, as Tom mentioned, um, through the process of engagement with Alderman Tunney and the community group, uh, this building started out as an entire story taller. So a story was removed from the project to um, uh, answer the concerns of some of those on the neighborhood group during our review process. The front facade of the building um, was also uh, redesigned um, in close consultation with Alderman Tunney and his organization to reflect the character of uh, this neighborhood and in particular this block. So our architectural design uh, really strives to do that. Um, uh, although the number mentioned in terms of description of the building height at slightly over 77 feet um, is accurate in terms of uh, uh, elements of the building that really is only the measurement to the very top of the elevator overrun at the middle of the building. Uh, the bulk of the building um, at the parapet of the, of the uh, roof is at uh, 65 feet. Um, so that's really a much more significant dimension in terms of the perception of the building overall as it will um, appear to anyone looking at it from the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, a significant point 
Um, as Tom mentioned, we achieved a unanimous vote of uh, change to RM6 for this site uh, from the zoning committee. And what we also looked at in studying this neighborhood was that the context of the side yard setbacks is um, in this block, um, nearly every building is at a zero side yard setback. You can sort of see that from this aerial view. Um, there are occasional side yard setbacks of three to five feet. Uh, the home that is immediately next to us to the east has perhaps the largest setback of the block, um, 14, uh, 13, uh, almost 14 feet to its main side wall, uh, almost 10 feet to a bay that protrudes in the western direction, in our direction. But otherwise, the average of the eastern side setbacks on the block, with most of them being zero, is only 2.64 feet. The average of the western side yard setbacks, again, most of them being zero, is only 1.58 feet. So um, we worked with a zoning um, department um, and um, with Commissioner Murphy to seek a, a side yard setback reduction based on meeting, uh, actually exceeding the, uh, the averages of the block. Our side yard setbacks are 3.8 eight feet for most of the length of our building on both sides. That increases um, at the center of our building. There are two light courts and our side yard setback there increases to six feet, eight inches. So we greatly exceed the average of the setbacks in uh, the side yard setbacks in this block. And therefore we were able to receive um, the side yard setback reduction that we sought through administrative adjustment in working with the zoning commissioner. Um, Danielle, can you please advance a few slides so we can see a little more? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Martin. So this shows the, another significant um, element of context in this uh, block is that there are six buildings that are taller than 85 feet. You can see that in this view. And there are, in, in fact, one of the tallest building on the block is 140 feet tall. So it is a very significant mix of taller buildings um, and, and therefore our proposed building does not um, stand out in a sense of, you know, what the context of the block is in that regard. If we could advance the slides. So this is another view that shows you the six buildings that are taller and their, uh, their appearance. Um, Let's go ahead further. Um, this also shows the block frontage on that side and our building in context of the rest. You can also see in that, and we'll see it a little better as we advance the slides, that really the tallest element mentioned was is the elevator overrun at the center of our building, whereas the bulk of our building is significantly lower than that. Let's go to the next slide. That is the um, proposed facade of our building. Again, we work closely with, um, with Alderman Tunney in studying um, the character of the buildings on this block in particular and of the Lakeview neighborhood in general. So we've got these uh, bay elements at the front that are inspired by um, the typical porches, the front porches that occur on a lot of the um, 1910s and 20s architecture that forms the, um, the context and the grounding of this beautiful neighborhood. Next slide, please. Um, that shows our building from the east. Um, and you can see that the bulk of our building um, is not up at the 77 foot height, but the parapet that we see there um, is at 65 feet. And there's a small element towards the front who has, which has a hipped roof you can't even see here. Um, and that it is at 66 feet, 10 inches. Um, and as this rendering shows, this is a fully constructed model. You cannot see the um, stair tower projections above the roof or the elevator overrun. Next slide, please. This gives the uh, summary of the timeline of the um, meetings that we undertook with the neighborhood and the aldermen and the changes that we uh, that we adopted into the building to um, answer some of the concerns. So principal among those, the reduction from six to five stories. Next slide, please. This is showing you the basic um, setting of our building um, in the context of the immediate neighbors within the block. Um, immediately to the west of us is a four plus one um, 
which itself sits upon its property line. Um, this is the ground floor of our building. So we have a parking garage, which extends all the way to the rear property line. However, um, if we go advance one more slide or maybe two more slides, now we see that the rear uh, wall of our building is actually set 40 feet, six inches from the rear property line in full conformance with the required rear yard setback uh, in the RM6 zoning. And in the RM6 zoning, the parking garage podium of our building is permitted to exist um, in, that, in that rear yard. Next slide, please. Uh, this just shows the uh, bulk of the upper section of the building. Uh, where there are private balconies extending into the rear yard, uh, suspended private balconies. Um, and so our building is um, eight units in total. Um, the units are approximately 2,343 square feet in size, with the exception of a duplex unit, which occupies the second floor and goes down onto the first floor podium uh, at the east side of our building. Next slide, please. Um, this is showing where we have um, stairs going up to the roof, top floor units, next slide. One of the other elements, if you go back one slide, I'm sorry, one of the other elements that we did in consultation with the Alderman and the Neighborhood Group was to reduce the bulk at the front of the building by diminishing the mass. You can see here that there are roofs that are uh, created at the fourth floor level, which set contribute to the setback of the building at the front and the um, expression of these porch-like elements that are inspired by the language, surrounding architectural language. Next slide, please. Um, this shows you the roof with the elevator overrun and the stair tower coming up at the middle. Next slide, please. This shows our building in its detail. Um, again, working um, to be inspired by uh, the language of the 1910s and 20s buildings that graced this neighborhood um, that was that provided the inspiration for the architecture we've presented here. Next slide, please. So that shows you really a better view of the uh, sort of context of the height so that the only element which goes up to that 77 foot height is the elevator overrun. Their stair penthouse is set right at the center of the building. Uh, which come up to 68 feet, but the parapet is at 65 feet with just a small 22 foot wide section with the hipped roof that you see towards the front that um, has its mean roof height at 66 feet 10. Next slide, please. That's the back of the building. The building is brick all the way around. If you step back one slide, please. Uh, what I forgot to point out, we also uh, brought the front wall detailing um, very significantly down the side of the building so that the pilasters and the ornamentation that um, we brought to the building through the inspiration from the other surrounding architecture of the neighborhood has also been brought significantly down the side of the building where the building is uh, most exposed given the fact that the neighboring building on this side is set back from us from our property line uh, about 14 feet and, and there's about there's 17 feet, seven inches between the buildings at that, at that point. We can advance the slides then. As I said, that's the rear of the building. It's brick all the way around. This is the side of the building that uh, we're very close to the four plus one on this side. So there was um, no reason to bring the architectural ornamentation down the side yard here because it's completely blocked by the presence of the four plus one uh, so closely set to us on this side. Next slide, please. These are some inspiration. This is the brick we're gonna be using, which is a water struck brick of very high quality. Uh, our center entry is gonna be using an inset curving brick specially cast to bring uh, a special sort of treatment and ornamentation to the center entry. This is an example of another building that was done that way. Next slide, please. That's the section which details out the heights as I've described them. Next slide, please. And this is some data uh, about uh, the project cost and um, the uh, data about our developer and builder. Tom, shall I return back to you for pickup of the presentation? 
Well, yes, or Daniela, um, uh, would you like me to speak to the 14 policies or is that something you would do or? I can take it from here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so for any lakefront protection application, there are 14 policies that they must be compliant with in order to approve. Uh, the bolded ones are the ones that staff found most relevant to this particular application. And based off of our review of the project, we do find that the project complies and we recommend approval of the application. That concludes my presentation and we're here for questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, do the commissioners have any questions of this staff or the applicant on this item? Not seeing. Okay, Commissioner Cox. Um, I don't really have any questions, uh, although I will sit, say um, that uh, I appreciate uh, the um, sensitivity uh, that uh, development and architecture team um, has in trying to understand uh, uh, the overall feeling of the block uh, and to uh, track fairly closely to something that feels like it fits in. Uh, it is uh, always interesting to hear the public comment uh, about uh, this, this type of density, which is extremely compatible uh, with the rest of the block. Uh, in fact, you know, I think the South and West Side would, um, would love to find uh, more opportunities for this middle density infill. Uh, I think they would be envious uh, that uh, four, uh, eight flats are being uh, inserted into existing contexts uh, with such care. So I look forward to the day when we will be seeing eight flats like this uh, popping up on the south and west side of Chicago, uh, not just in the north side. Uh, so uh, I think I'm happy to support it. But once again, it would be great to see this happening in the south and west side as well. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. Um, Alderman Tunney, would you like to make a statement? I would. Um, and I'm obviously going to have to recuse myself on the vote as it's in the 44th Ward. Uh, I think the team, as Commissioner Cox has said, has done a good job of trying to fit in with the character of the basically 1920s, 10s and 20s, where there was just a, a lot of development along the lakefront on the north side. Uh, some of the objectors uh, live immediately adjacent to this, um, were involved with my office and the department about an overall Lakeview historic district. We spent a lot of time on in the last four years to really see about maintaining as many of these structures as possible. We, um, this is very close to the Serbian uh, consulate that we were able to landmark and it is just in the backyard of this particular development. Uh, the two houses that were mentioned uh, were that are coming down Actually, one of the one of the owners moved into a development uh, of the adjacent a development with by the same GVC contractors, which is kind of interesting. Uh, the other building ended up being a more recent SRO with a, a you know rent by the month city pads or something like that that was popular right at the beginning of COVID and then just collapsed. Uh, the build that building is really not of significance. Um, the this team uh, took down the first building and and went through the community process with a four unit building, I believe. Um, and then the owner of the SRO uh, decided that uh, the you know their business was the business model was uh, extinct basically, and um, the, I didn't feel I don't think there was a, a great value to the building itself, and it was kind of a headache to the to the neighbors on the block uh, with uh, some front yard parking and other things in, in, that were a, a definitely a quality of life issue for the residents on the block. So they decided to take their four unit project to an eight unit project, which is eight large units, 12 parking spaces. There is no parking from the lake to Broadway and for that matter to Halstead. So 
they're being responsible given the fact that these will be expensive units um, to make sure their parking is enclosed. Um, and I think they've, you know, they've done a really good job of uh, trying to fit in with the character of the neighborhood. And uh, for those reasons, uh, it went through a community process. In fact, some of the objectors, I, I, I interestingly enough, were uh, probably either not at that meeting or certainly have not contacted my office to the extent that the public comment period um, uh, uh, elucidated that there was the immediate neighbors that, that were a, a opposed to it, which is last late minute news to me. And I'll be frank about that. Um, we worked very closely with some of those neighbors um, on, on the building that was directly behind it. So it's just kind of ironic that uh, they know who I am, they know our office, they know we go through a community process. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a surprise to me. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on the project. Uh, we've, we've worked it to the best of our ability. I think it's a, it's, um, a handsome project and eight units, Commissioner Cox, is not a lot for that block on Briar. You know, the, the four plus one must have 75 units next to it. Um, there was other buildings as was shown by the architect that are, um, you know, uh, very large buildings with lots of density. So I think from a density perspective, this is a, this is a very modest addition to the block. And um, with that being said, uh, while I'll be recusing myself, I think uh, the team has done a good job and the and the Department of Planning has helped make this a, even a better project. So I am in support of it um, while I cannot be a voting member today. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Tenney, for that background information. Um, are there any other comments or questions by the commissioners on this item? If not, then uh, do I have a motion on a proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lake from Protection Ordinance application submitted by Briar Street 453 LLC for the property generally located at 453-455 at West Briar Place, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? So moved by Brumfield. So moved by I have a motion by Commissioner Brumfield. Do I have a second? Second, Commissioner Wagenspeck. Thank you, Commissioner Wagenspeck. Uh, roll call vote. Commissioner Barclay, are you still still here? Don't think so. Okay. Commissioner Bramfield, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Burnett? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Escareño? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Flores is a yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Novara? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tillman? Not here anymore. Commissioner Tunney is a recusal. Commissioner Wagensback, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, as a reminder, item D2 was deferred earlier today. Um, so the next item on the agenda is D3, a proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lake from Protection Ordinance application submitted by St. James Interest LLC for the property generally located at 438 West St. James Place. The property is shown RM6 and is within the private use zone of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lake from Protection District. The applicant is proposing to construct a five-story residential building with four dwelling units and five vehicular parking spaces. This is Lakefront item 776, and this is in the 43rd Ward. Uh, Danielle will also be presenting this, um, and she will provide the context overview, and the applicant will present their proposal. Thank you. For the record, again, my name is Danielle Kreider with the Department of Planning and Development. The applicant, St. James Interests, is here 
to request approval of a lakefront protection ordinance application for a four unit five story residential building on the north side of St. James Place between Clark and Lakeview. This is in the 43rd Ward. All right. Um, it's in the North Region, Lincoln Park Community Area, and uh, which has a population of approximately 70,000 people, a median age of 31, and a median income of $115,000. The neighborhood has high walkability and great transit access. At this point, I'll turn the presentation over to their land use attorney, Andrew Scott. Thank you very much, Danielle. Uh, for the record, my name is Andrew Scott with the Law Offices of Dyke McGosset. I also have the project architect, Howard Hirsch, with me today, and also uh, Bob Krupa, the representative of the developer. And I'm actually going to turn it over to Howard to, to walk uh, the plan commissioners through the project and the surrounding context. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrew. Um, the site um, as you see on this picture in red in the middle is in a very densely developed area of Lincoln Park directly west of Lincoln Park itself is a very thin and long site which is unique uh, for this area in fact it's only 33 and a half feet wide uh, the project might look familiar to you we were here about a uh, last year uh, in which we received approval for a 10-story building uh, that would was uh, going to be built on this site uh, after the approval and as we started looking at this more and talking with the neighbors, uh, we realized how difficult uh, to build that tall a building on this small a site would be and what impact it would have uh, on the neighbors uh, between uh, tower cranes and other kinds of construction. So we've scaled down the project to a five story building, four units uh, in order to be able to build it more conventionally uh, with masonry and wood construction to have less impact on the neighbors. Next slide, please. The uh, The site is zoned uh, RM6, um, and you can see that it is um, surrounded on the east and the north by a very large plan development, and to the west remaining RM6 sites. Next slide, please. Uh, this site clearly shows some of the unique uh, nature uh, of the site. Uh, the plan development, which surrounds it to the east and the north, consists of a multi-story parking garage that is primarily underground uh, with one story above ground that houses an elevated landscaped courtyard. Directly to the east is a very large single family home, uh, often called the Morningstar Mansion. Uh, to the north are four story townhomes and to the east is a 26 plus story uh, condominium project as well as an existing church. Next, oh, immediately to the west is an apartment building that is 13 stories in height. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows a little bit of the context of the neighborhood. It's really a varied neighborhood. Uh, the majority of the buildings tend to be four stories or in that neighborhood, uh, masonry buildings. Uh, but again, it's spl uh, splattered with variations on that from the 13th story immediately to the west as well as the you know significantly modern composition at the top right of the house directly to the east. Next slide. So our project, as you see it in this slide, uh, is really a modest proposal and a modest project for the site. Uh, it is uh, completely you know adjacent to this 13-story building that is right next to it. Uh, as part of the process, um, we had numerous conversations with both the owner of the 13 building, story building, uh, the adjacent house to the east and the condominium buildings to the east in order to develop a project and a design that would be least impactful on these neighboring properties. Next. So here's a view as you look uh, sort of to the northwest, how it nestles up against the uh, 13 story building. Uh, our units will be single story units per floor. Um, and four units, again, sitting on top of a base. Next. Uh, this is a, a blow up of the entrance sequence, again, at only 33 feet wide. And again, without an alley, completely surrounded by the parking garage of the adjacent plan development, uh, everything had to occur along this front property. So in order, instead of having a lot of various elements that projected and pulled back in, we created a single 
a large opening with a setback that accounts for the residential entry on the west on the left the vehicular entrance through a glass garage door in the center and then the second means of exit on the right uh, we think this creates a very clean and simple composition that fits well within the neighborhood sort of bridging the traditional with the modern the brick the building itself is going to be built of brick with large windows and detailing to pick up some of the traditional detailing that you see in the neighborhood within an overall modern conceptual design. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to turn it over, I think, to uh, Andrew at this point, who will go over a little yeah. bit about the process. Sure. Just to follow on a little bit to some of the points that Howard made uh, in terms of the lakefront plan of Chicago, um, you know, obviously it established standards to ensure uh, the, you know, maintaining the fauna and flora of the lakefront parks and also Lake Michigan itself, and also to ensure a harmonious transition between, uh, you know, the, the parks themselves and buildings as, you know, development begins to the West. And, you know, Howard had talked a little bit about, you know, how we've tried to treat uh, the entrance to the building, maintaining a uh, pedestrian scale. We have got the continuity with the, uh, you know, the character of the neighborhood and the surrounding area. So we really try to ensure a, a smooth and uninterrupted um, sort of transition between these two elements of the city of Chicago. And of course, part of the plan was to ensure that there was no further private development that was east of Lakeshore Drive. We're obviously west of Lakeshore Drive. And so we uh, feel very comfortable that we fit within that context. Next slide, please. So Howard had touched on a little bit of the community engagement that we that we've had. Uh, we did we were before the zoning board of appeals uh, in March for zoning relief on the rear and the side yards. Leading up to the zoning board of appeals, we did have extensive discussions with our neighbor immediately to the east, of the uh, the Morning Star Mansion owner and his representatives made some modifications to the building to address his concerns. We've also been in regular communication with the owner of the 13 story building to our west. And uh, for those of you that were around about a year ago when we did do our 10 story building, you may recall that there were probably about 10 to 15 objectors, uh, residents of that building that appeared. Uh, I, I think there are no objectors here today. The, the owner of the building and the tenants within the building are quite pleased that the developer is undertaking a smaller project. Uh, we've also been in touch with the condominium owner uh, extensively over the past several months, the 2550 uh, North Lake Street. They also are supportive of our project. So again, a lot of discussions with our immediate neighbors. Uh, mailing went out as is required by the Lakefront Protection Ordinance. We were always in regular contact, contact uh, with Alderman Knutson's office. He actually uh, just came into office as we were filing our applications. And so again, regular communications there. And then finally, assuming approval today and uh, getting building permits, the, the hope is to start summer of 2023. And if all goes well, uh, start having occupancy uh, late 2024. And so uh, if we could advance, Danielle, just to the next slide. And Howard, if you could just talk everyone through the, the floor plans and the site plan, that would be great. Absolutely. The, the top image is the first floor plan which shows the residential entry towards the bottom with its associated features of uh, the elevator and the exit stairs, uh, the drive aisle for the parking, which is located both on the side and in the back of the property. Again, very, very um, tricky due to the narrow width of the site. Um, the drawing on the bottom is the landscape plan, uh, which is really a roof plan because the site does fill the property line. Uh, there is setback along St. James with some planters uh, and street trees and decorative paving. Uh, next uh, slide. Uh, this is a typical floor plan for the unit. This is the second floor plan. Uh, the units, uh, the gross area per floor is about 4,000 square feet. The, uh, these are five bedroom units uh, with uh, terraces that uh, at the northeast corner and in the, at the east side of the building, but the building holds the frontage along St. James that we thought was very, very important from an urban context. Next slide. Uh, these are the third and fourth floor units. Uh, the only difference is that on the fourth floor unit, there is an interior stair that goes up to the next slide. 
uh, because it has a private roof deck over the front portion of the building uh, that would have landscaping and paving and uh, is for the use of that fourth floor tenant only. Next slide. Uh, this shows um, the elevations, uh, the south and the east, the other elevations, uh, the west elevation at least completely blocked by the 13 story building. Uh, again, it's a brick building with a variety of soldier coursing and horizontal lines with some inset balconies, uh, large windows. And uh, you can see some of the photos at the top that represent some of the, um, some of the you know, images that we were trying to achieve in terms of what we're trying to create on this, uh, this project. Next uh, section of the building, uh, again, four stories over the parking garage. What's a little bit hard to see is that the existing um, buildings to the north and to the east are actually about one story high, uh, which encloses the underground parking garage of the building. Uh, so it's uh, presenting a five story uh, height to the street, but a four story height to the north and to the east. Uh, the height uh, from a building code standpoint is about 67 feet to the highest point of the building, which is the um, penthouse uh, element, which is only at a very small feature and set significantly back is at 76 feet. Next slide. I think uh, that ends our presentation and I'll turn it over to Danielle. Thank you. So as with the last project, this is a lakefront protection application. And so there are 14 policies that it needs to be compliant with. The most applicable are bolded. Staff's review found that the project was compliant with these 14 policies, and we recommend that the plan commission approves this application. That concludes uh, what we have for you, and we're here to answer questions as you have them. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle, and the team for the presentation. Uh, do the commissioners have any questions uh, of the staff or the applicant? Not seeing any hands go up. Um, is Alderman Knudsen here to make a statement? I do not see him on the line, uh, Chairwoman. Do we have a letter on file of support? Do you know? Danielle, did you receive anything from Alderman Newton's office? I did not receive a letter. Um, our understanding was they were generally supportive of this application. So Chairwoman Flores, uh, again, Andrew Scott, for the record, as I had mentioned, we were before the Zoning Board of Appeals just last month. There was a letter of support. I mean, we worked with his, his office for the past, you know, ever since he became Alderman back in the fall. Uh, there was a letter of support uh, or no objection. Uh, to the project there, and I, he, his chief of staff transitioned out actually at the beginning of this month, and so it, it may have not been communicated to the plan commission. Thank you for that information. Okay, um, again, do the commissioners have any questions of the staff? If not, I'll go ahead and ask for a motion. Okay, not seeing any hands go up. Uh, do I have a motion on a proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lake from Protection Ordinance application submitted by St. James Interest LLC for the property generally located at 438 West St. James Place, finding that it meets the requirements for, for approval? So moved, Commissioner Lyons. Thank you, Commissioner Lyons. Do I have a second motion? Escareño. Thank you, Commissioner Escareño. I will go ahead and do a roll call vote. Commissioner Brunfield? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Burnett? Stepped away. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Escareño, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Flores is a yes. Commissioner Lyons, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Novara? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Tunney? Yes. 
Thank you. And Commissioner Wagon's back. Yes. Thank you. I believe I didn't miss anybody else. Motion passes. Congrats to the team. Thank you very much. Have a good Thank afternoon, you. everybody. Happy 420. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Okay. The next item on the agenda is D4, a proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lake Front Protection Ordinance application submitted by the Commuter Rail Division of the Regional Transportation Authority, Metra, for the property generally located at 132 East Van Buren Street and 401-407 South Michigan Avenue. The site is currently zoned IPD number 677 T District POS 1 and is within the public use zone of the, of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lake Frame Protection District. The applicant proposes to re rehabilitate the Van Buren commuter rail station. The project will renovate station components and include a green roof as part of overall roof improvements, tunnel and stair construction, elevator pop-up type enclosures, ADA improvements, platform improvements and Van Buren pedestrian bridge ADA improvements. This is lakefront item 772 and, and it's located in the 42nd ward. Um, Fernando Espinosa will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Good afternoon, can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes, yes we can, thank you. Thank you so much. For the record, Fernando Espinosa with the Department of Plan Developer. I'm a city planner. With me today are members of the development team with Sidley Austin and with Metro. We'll be available to answer questions after the presentation. The property is located in the Loop community area um, and is comprised, uh, population in the Loop area is comprised about 42,298 people. The area median age is 32.6. Most residents of this community are employed in the professional, finance, and healthcare sectors. The site is, is, the site is located within the boundaries of the Ulysses S. Grant Park. The site is owned IPD number 677, D District, POS1, and again, is within the use of the public use zone for the Link Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection District. With that, I will turn over the presentation to the applicant's attorney, Scott Safe, who will provide further details of the proposal. Mr. Safe. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, and thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the commission. For the record, Scott Safe of the law firm Sidley Austin LLP, representing Metra, uh, which is no more formally known as the Commuter Rail Division of the Regional Transportation Authority. I'm here today with David Steele, a principal architect from Muller & Muller Architects, Ken Schultz, a project manager with Metra, Kevin Nolan, who's acting as a project manager for Metra as well on the Eastern components of the project, which I'll explain, and Arsenio Pamales, who's with Metra Community Affairs. Uh, I'm gonna give some orientation remarks about the project. David Steele is gonna take over at the heart of the design the discussion of the of the various elements, and then I'll end with some con concluding remarks. The, this is a slide which indicates the overall intent of the project, which you heard Fernando briefly describe. Rehab, we're gonna rehab the Van Buren station, which goes back to about 1896 on the Metra Electric District line. It also serves the South Shore line, which is run by the Northern Indiana Commuter Transportation District, short name, a, a nickname is NICD. So Metro and NICD service this station, will rehab the station waiting area, it's a historic station, improve and expand on the accessible access, overhaul the pedestrian tunnel, which runs under Michigan Avenue, which includes waterproofing, and overall uh, um, major improvement to the rider experience, new shelters, new platforms, um, eventually new signage, and then all of this will improve and expand access to Grand Park and the lakefront. One thing that we'll talk about is that there is a direct connection in the tunnel between the Grand Park South Garage and, and, uh, and Grand Park, and we're making that newly accessible at this location south of Jackson for the first time. So next slide. The um, project is uh, overall about a $100 million project. Um, it has been planned for a number of years. Just to touch on where the trains go, 
the metro the two the train the terminus for this for these two train lines is Millennium Station. The south uh, the southern terminus for the NICTI line is ultimately South Bend, Indiana. And on the electric district line, which is run by Metro, it has three different branches. It ends at on the east southeast side at 92nd Street at University Park, directly south and a little bit southwest at Blue Island. So that's a, a sense of where the commuters are coming to and from. This is the site as you see it today. It's at the foot of where Van Buren uh, ends in at Michigan Avenue. This is the area extended east. The Van Buren pedestrian bridge is at the top of the slide. It, it is a pedestrian bridge owned by the Chicago Park District. Um, the, the, the depot is not really noticeable. It extends on either side of the um, pedestrian bridge. You can see the gray rooftop with some skylights that are closed up. We'll talk about our plan for that in a moment. It's 150 feet on either side, extending north and south of, of the pedestrian bridge. The original grant of approval for this, for this station comes in an 1895 ordinance uh, from the city of Chicago. This, this, the original station was built just after that. The current kiosks on the west side of Michigan Avenue and the tunnel was first authorized in 1924 by the predecessor to the Park District and, the, and, and was an agreement with the predecessor to Metra. So it was an agreement between the Illinois Central Railway and the entity which was then known as the South Park Commission or South Park Commissioners. The city of Chicago may have consented to that uh, agreement as well. Next slide. I'm gonna run through an orientation of this busy slide to explain all of the components one by one quickly, and then David will take over with more design details. So the slide you're looking at has west on the bottom, east on the top, north is to the left, and south is to the right. This is the area of the, of the activities going on under the Lakefront Protection Ordinance. So next slide, we'll go sort of quickly through the various components. The, the orange arrow is pointing to a new eastern platform that will be built at the station for passengers. It doesn't exist today. It will primarily serve NICTI trains, but not exclusively. There'll be a stair connection at the far north end to Jackson Drive. So this is this is a, a new platform. Just to the north of that, just so you notice it is a is a yellow stripe. That is going to be a, it's not part of our lakefront um, application. It's just going to be a paved area for crews to step off a train safely in between runs. And then just further to the north of, on, uh, to the north side of Jackson Drive, you'll see two purple boxes. That's a below grade electrical substation. We're expanding that um, below grade consistent with the current design, current look of the substation to serve additional power. Um, next slide. These two arrows are pointing out the below grade depot in green, which I mentioned and the center or island platform that's there today, it will be expanded and extended. And then at the north end, I'll describe this later, there'll be a new elevator slash stair enclosure on at the Jackson Drive bridge level. We call that the Jackson pop-up or Jackson Drive pop-up. And then we'll extend um, and improve the west platform, which also exists today. Next slide. The Jackson pop-up is small, it's about 275 square feet. These arrows are pointing at the underground tunnel. Uh, it extends to the west side of Michigan Avenue under through through the little portion of, of the park into the below grade station. The portion under Michigan Avenue will be left in place, but comprehensively waterproofed. There are water infiltration issues that have been going on for some time and the portion in, in the park east of Michigan Avenue will be removed and replaced and also comprehensively waterproofed with a, with a state-of-the-art waterproofing system. Next slide. The, arrow, the yellow arrow is now pointing at the what we know what we call the Michigan Avenue pop-up. It will be a glass enclosed structure. We'll, we'll show you uh, various images of it. It will hold a new elevator and staircase. This is the first time an elevator will be available east of Michigan Avenue. Uh, currently, the only elevator to the station is on the west side of Mission Avenue. So this is the structure that will provide for the first time uh, not only access, accessible access to the station uh, patrons on the east side of Michigan Avenue, but also to those using the Grand Park South Garage who now do not have an elevator south of Jackson. This is uh, about 800 square feet. And finally, final few items, um, I'm sorry, next slide, is uh, we'll be rehabilitating the existing stair kiosks, which the arrows are pointing to on either side of um, Van Buren Street, north and south on Michigan Avenue. There's also an elevator kiosk we'll be rehabbing as well. 
Um, next slide. The arrow currently is pointing to uh, uh, the west side of the Van Buren pedestrian bridge. It is it is not accessible. The east side is the bridge. Other than the portion that the arrow is pointed to, this bridge was re, um, re rehabilitated in 1989. This east this western portion was not. So at, after some discussion with the park district, since Metro has to waterproof the roof of the station, it is going to also implement an ADA ramp on the west side of this. Uh, pedestrian bridge, making it fully accessible for the first time. Uh, next slide. Um, the final item is that there is an existing open stair uh, where number 11 is on the slide the arrow is pointing to. That stair will be closed. It does not con conform to the new design of the, the tunnel, and it interrupts the correct ramping system in the tunnel, and I'll also, because it's open, will allow for, um, will, the, the goal is to eliminate the water infiltration in part caused by the open stair. So that staircase will be removed. It is currently surrounded by the Guimar replica sculpture, which looks like a entry to a, a Paris Metro station. Um, that was a donation from the Paris Rapid Transit Agency to the city of Chicago. We're gonna talk about Metro's commitments concerning that sculpture. It's been an important part of our plan. Um, the purpose of this arrow is to point out where it is. Next slide. One final, uh, I think, slide or two for me, and then to David. This is the area of the station. We talked about it earlier. Um, you can see the skylights on top. There's a ventilation shaft uh, that's that's to the north end, uh, to the north side of the green area in front of you. At the very end of that, you see a couple uh, trash cans, maybe, or a blue recycling area. We'll be creating a little notch out there um, to. Um, that may serve as a pedestal for a future wayfinding slash digital sign to provide real-time train information. It is not part of this um, lakefront application. It is something that will undergo further review by the city. Um, it's at it's only at a, a concept stage at this point. Um, next slide, just some history. I mentioned it earlier. The original uh, authority for the station to be built goes back to 1895. Um, in 1924, not only were the two kiosks on the west side of Michigan Avenue built, but two kiosks within the park themselves um, were authorized by the 1924 agreement. They're shown in the bottom left image. The top image is obviously the kiosk on the west side of Michigan Avenue. These two kiosks were about nine feet wide by 44 feet long. In essence, our Michigan Avenue pop-up acts really as a consolidation of these into one with a, a, a modern uh, accessible, uh, safe entrance to the station. So that's some history. Today, uh, next slide is um, a focus now. We're going to turn to the pop-up specifically. I'm going to turn the next slide over to David Steele from Miller & Muller. Here you see the open stair that we are closing. Uh, the sculpture is visible in this image. We're going to come back to it in the presentation. And there's an area just to the north of the um, of the open stair that we plan as of now to convert from paving, you see the paving, to future uh, green area where it doesn't exist today. So I know I went quickly. Uh, happy to answer questions. The next slide, please, and David Steele will take over. So here you um, see a view of the proposed uh, pop-up. This will contain a stair, an enclosed stair and elevator. Um, and it's actually centered on the historic bridge and pylons beyond um, in the, the um, Landscape Island, uh, the uh, landscaped area will be slightly raised behind a wall and landscaped um, per the park district standards. Um, we could go to the next slide. Um, a little bit about the materials and the, the form of the, the project. It'll be mostly glass with uh, painted metal accents, a stone base uh, to uh, promote uh, maintainability and longevity. Um, the shape um, I'll talk about in a minute, the glass was chosen to provide um, visual lightness and laciness, um, views into the station, and also very importantly to bring um, light, sunlight down into the tunnels, which are very dark at the moment. Um, the glass also um, gives users a sense of safety as they can see, you know, what they're approaching and entering to. The height is based on uh, the elevator override uh, requirement, which um, sets the, the top of the, the um, 
structure. Uh, the length is set by the stair clearances and land landing um, inside the, the space. Um, next one. Here you can see um, some precedent. Um, we saw the historic stairs with uh, earlier slide and the stairs across the street. Um, some other kiosks, uh, CTA kiosks in the in various parts of the loop um, have this swooping shape down into the tunnel. So this, um, you know, basically this design is taken from precedent existing and in the past. Um, you can see the the lower view there with the kiosk centered on the bridge pylons beyond using the historic and Beaux-Arts style of uh, axial symmetry. Um, next slide. Um, here we see the existing condition. You can see the Gimard's, uh, you can go back just one, just a minute. You can see the Gimard stair there that's very close to the road and offset uh, uh, on the symmetry of the site. And then the next one, the um, next slide. Um, here we see the similar view with the stair in place beyond, and you can see how it works with the existing historic architecture. The next slide. Um, this is the stair at Jackson, which is at the end of the island platform. It will contain a an, an, uh, closed elevator again um, in glass using similar detailing to the Michigan Avenue, similar detailing materials. It has a stair, an open stair going down to the platform. Again, uh, the glass promoting the uh, safety, um, visibility, and lightness of the structure. Next slide. Here we talk about the materials again, the same materials, a stone base for durability, stainless steel railings, uh, metal uh, and glass uh, framework. Um, and again, the height is set by the elevator override requirements. Um, there is a small waiting, enclosed waiting area at the elevator that um, protects the elevator from the elements, but also allows passengers waiting to be protected from the elements. Next slide. Uh, here's another view of the uh, pop-up. Um, you can see how we've worked it with the historic railings at the opening. Um, I think the next view shows it from the other direction. There you, you know, can see and um, very you know friendly, um, inviting entry for people and provides new accessibility at this site that uh, wasn't available isn't available now. Um, next slide. Um, we'll talk about the platform design a little bit here. Um, on the left is a historic view of the platform and canopy. Uh, you can see the distinctive bell shape of the roof. Um, we use that for precedent in designing the new canopy. On the right is the existing condition that the station was built in the 1980s, I believe, uh, in a modern style. Um, it's extremely severely deteriorated at the moment, and you can see that the space around the structure is very narrow for people to walk along. They have to walk along this very narrow space between the tracks and the and the headhouse to get to other parts of the platform. So we wanted to correct that as part of this design. The next slide. Um, here's an example of the canopy design. You can see we took that um, bell shape. Um, will imp be improving the lighting, um, quality of materials, durability of materials. It's all designed to um, maintain itself um, over a long period. Next slide. Um, here you can see, this is basically the view you'd see if you're crossing the, the bridge, the pedestrian bridge, you'd look down on the station. Um, the flat roof area contains stairs and elevator. Um, and a small area of enclosure to wait out of the elements if you needed to. The structure has been narrowed up, as I noted earlier, to provide better walkway clearance on each side next to the tracks. Columns are clad with a painted metal finish similar to the pop-ups. Um, signage is integrated um, within the column structures to reduce clutter and um, promote better wayfinding. Um, next slide. Uh, here again, uh, materials, similar materials with painted metal, metal roof, um, uh, all again designed to uh, for durability and ease of maintenance, but also you know providing attractive uh, attractive appearance for users and in the park. Next slide. 
Um, this is a view of that Jackson stair from below um, in the elevator. Uh, again, stainless steel railings will be durable and attractive. The glass promotes a sense of safety um, and also makes the structure a bit more lacy and light in the park. It doesn't become a, a highly impactful addition in this area of the city. Next slide. Again, another view of the elevator and stair. Um, all designed to promote easy wayfinding, logical pathways for people to use the, the, the station. Next slide. Um, the next portion we'll talk about is the uh, stair at the west end of the bridge. Um, the stair has to be removed and reconstructed in order to repair the roof of the station, the historic station that's below this structure. Um, as part of that removal, we want to take advantage of this work to uh, add uh, accessibility. So the, the project includes the addition of a ramp as part of the reconstruction of this stair. Next slide. You can see to the north side, we've integrated a, a ramping system leading to the top of the stair. Um, to accomplish this and to integrate it with the historic architecture, what we've done is we've moved the stair about 20 feet to the west. This allows us to integrate that ramp within this stair. In the next view, you'll see that it is, next slide. Um, you can see that we've we've integrated really very successfully with this historic architecture so that it will appear as if it's not an add-on, but something that's always been here and is respectful of the park while providing, you know, modern accessibility that we expect in, uh, in, in our parks. Um, you'll also see that there's a railing, um, there's a bike ramp, uh, wheel ramp integrated with the railing at the center of the park. This will also increase usability for other, other people and biking. Um, next slide. Here you can see the, the stair reconstructed, the bike ramp and the, um, the uh, ADA ramp beyond. Um, this will be enhanced, of course, with um, wayfinding, directing people to various facilities and, and the accessibility of this, um, of this um, ramp and stair system. But we 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 can we can recreate this stair exactly as with the exact details of the um, existing bridge and historic architecture while in enhancing its accessibility for everybody. Um, next slide. And at this point, I'll turn it back over to Scott for the rest of the presentation. Thanks, David. I'm just going to cover a few of the remaining elements um, and then happy to answer any questions. The rooftop will be converted to an quote, extensive green roof. It's the original, in some ways, the original condition, which is shown on the right uh, with, um, so next, next slide. Here's an image of what that uh, might look like. We'll restore the skylights, the green roof was shown. And then one of the other new elements is trying to cluster the mechanical equipment, which is mostly heating and cooling to the north and to the south there. It's not necessarily more equipment, just better clustered with some screening that doesn't exist today. So that is the, the roof plan. There's also a, a closure of an, a stair that's not used just to the south of the, of the pedestrian bridge. And that may be also uh, available and utilized for additional ventilation. Next slide. Switching to the west side of Michigan Avenue, this is just an image of the two stair kiosks and the elevator enclosure next stair. I'm sorry, next slide. Uh, the, the real focus here is a rehabilitation of the kiosk. You can see the issue with standing water on the left. So there'll be improvements made, which I'll describe in a moment uh, to deal with that issue along with uh, addressing the deterioration that's occurred because of exposure to the elements. Next slide. More specifically, the, the plan is to implement proper drainage by new waterproof solid roof with a slot drain, replacement of the rusted components that are there today, also correction of the vandalized glass, repairing it as needed, and replacing, importantly, the base granite with decorative relief style uh, panels, uh, you know, being cognizant of the, of the history of those panels. So an effort really made to go back to something similar to the original design. Next slide. This is just an image straight on of one of the existing kiosks. The text on the right is very busy, but really just emphasizes what 
the essence of what I just described, plus new signage and lighting, correction of exposed wires, um, and overall rehabilitation. Next slide, similar kind of treatment to the elevator enclosure. Um, nothing really new in this slide, but you can see the panels at the base of this as well that will be replaced with decorative relief panelized style, similar to the original design. And then the final couple slides focused on the Guimar sculpture. Next slide shows you just outlines the location and an image of it on the left. Next slide. So going into a little bit more detail, um, Metra's worked very closely with the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. Nathan Mason, I think, is participating today. He's been the key person that uh, we've had a long series of discussions with. Uh, so part of the commitment by Metra in its project is to dismantle and store the sculpture during construction so it's not harmed and to rehabilitate it while it's in storage, which will include rust abatement and refinishing. DCASE will oversee that rehab. It, Metro will do the work per DCASE standards, which themselves incorporate the specifications of the Paris Transit Agency, which donated it. They're the donor agency. And then Metro is funding a reinstallation of the sculpture at a location selected by DCASE. DCASE is the owner. Metro has also indicated that it is willing, as part of that installation funding, to fund a production of explanatory information about the sculpture that would accompany its reinstallation, not the content, but the, the funds necessary to produce it. Um, that ends the, S, the substance of the presentation, a word about community engagement. It's been extensive. Um, we have a letter of support on file from the Chicago Loop Alliance. We've had a, a series of ongoing interactions with the Grant Park Advisory Council. Art Institute, which is our neighbor to the north, the Grand Park South Garage, which shares a door with us in the tunnel, obviously the Park District, Alderman Riley, uh, and his office, I believe he's uh, provided a letter of support. Separate, and in, 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 in conjunction with all that, there is a federal uh, review process going on spearheaded by the, uh, by the FTA, which is pro providing a significant amount of the funding for this project. There are two components to that, one for NICTI, which is either complete or nearly complete, and the other for Metra, which is headed to, um, there's there's uh, an ongoing process that's moving into its mid to late latter phases right now. Timing, um, preliminary railroad work, railroad sort of track, uh, infrastructure kind of work might begin in 2023. The first phase of the station would begin in 2024, which is the Eastern components. And the major part of the project for Met that that is the part of it would is targeted for 2026 and 2027. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it's many different components. Appreciate your patience as we walk through that. And again, for the record, Fernando Espinosa, Grant Department of Planning and Development. TBT has found that the project is in compliance with the policies and purposes of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Protection Ordinance, ordinance especially, especially policy number four, policy number eight, policy number 14, purpose one and purpose three. Please refer to the department's staff report for further details of this project and the plans identified here today. Based on the foregoing, is the recommendation of the Department of Planning and Development that like for application number 772 be in conformance with the provisions of the Link Michigan and Chicago Lake for Protection Ordinance and the application be approved. This concludes the department's presentation. Staff and the development team are present to answer any questions the commission may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fernando, for the presentation. Um, I do have a small comment uh, just in regards to the new ramp that's next to the stair that's gonna be uh, reconstructed. I, I am concerned that it is not uh, visible to a pedestrian walking by because of that wall that we are copying. Um, have you considered making that a little more transparent or, or visible, accessible uh, to, to people walking by? Uh, David, I'll let you take that question. Sure. Um, you know, the, we, we've, we're trying to retain the architectural symmetry of this space and the um, space 
each side of this bridge has a different use. The wall is the height of a 42 inch high barrier at the ramp level um, that that height would be required. Um, additional enhancement for visibility could be done with wayfinding. Um, and if that was deemed not adequate, we could potentially study additional means of, of providing better visibility to that um, ramp. The ramp is visible through the balustrade on the stair side as well as it follows through that area. Yeah, I'm thinking that maybe we do the same on the front uh, with a more open balustrade, um, just, you know, a, a possibility, um, mm -hmm. but hopefully, you know, the wayfinding will help. Sure. Any other comments or questions by the commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Cox, followed by Commissioner Escarino. Yeah, I just want to elaborate. I mean, I have to say I'm just uh, very, very impressed with the uh, sensitivity uh, that the team has taken to res respect the historic context. It's a very difficult uh, line to walk, and I think you've done it um, quite elegantly. Uh, so I'm very appreciative of that. I, I do um, agree um, with uh, Chairwoman uh, Flores that for a handicapped person coming onto the stair, uh, they might be hard to, hard pressed to find the ramp um, because there are not many visual clues. Uh, certainly signage would help, but I think the point about the um, open balustrade uh, as, a, as a, a mechanism to show that there's something behind there could be uh, just the right thing. And again, it allows you to continue to use the historic elements. Um, but again, overall, I think uh, it, it feels, it feels um, like it's always been there. Um, and we know how difficult it is to integrate uh, handicap accessibility into these historic contexts. I think you've done it very well. I think if, with that extra additional push to give it some visibility, um, I think it would be most welcome, but we, we, this was something that came up, um, through the internal reviews that we've had, uh, but we didn't think that it was, um, a reason to not advance this, uh, and, uh, uh, item in these type of adjustments, I'm assuming that there's still time, uh, to make those, um, um, but again, I just want to, uh, applaud you for, uh, a, a job extremely well done. Thank you. Commissioner Escareño. Thank you. Um, I'm going to have to recuse myself from voting on this project, but I did want to just make uh, comments along the lines of what's uh, been mentioned. But I, I'm really proud of the way that the development team has really been respectful of all the elements on the parks, uh, making sure that the preservation of green and, the, and respecting the greenery, adding the green roof, uh, as well as not just the accessibility here on the bridge, but the accessibility uh, from the actual transportation onto uh, the, the lakefront area, including the elevator that I believe is the only one right now east on the east side and, and specifically giving access to this um, beautiful part of, of the, uh, the district. So I just wanna commend the team for really uh, listening and working with us to make sure that the preservation of all that we consider beautiful on park space is being honored and respected. And um, certainly for our accessible community, uh, this is really, there's a lot of elements here that are really uh, gonna go a long way to making sure that we're making the parks even more accessible. So I uh, just wanted to make those statements, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Escareño. Are there any additional questions or comments by the commissioners? Um, if not, I'll go ahead and, and uh, do a roll call vote or ask, sorry, ask uh, for a motion. Chairman, I'll make a, yeah. a motion to pass Commissioner okay. Wagner's back. Um, let me just actually read the motion first. Um, but before, is Alderman Riley here? I'm not seeing him um, on. Sure, but... he, he's not on the call, but he did send okay. a letter for the site. Okay, thank you. And we have that, correct? We do indeed, yes. Okay, thank you. 
Um, so then let me do uh, the motion. Do I have a motion on a proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance application submitted by the Commuter Rail Division of the Regional Transportation Authority, um, known as METRA, for the property located at 132 East Van Buren Street and 401 407 South Michigan Avenue, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? So moved. Um, motion by Commissioner Tunney, correct? Wagon spec. Oh, wagon spec. Sorry. Uh, do I have a second? Second, Novara. Thank you. Second by Commissioner Novara. Uh, roll call vote. Commissioner Brumfield? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Burnett? Not here. Uh, Commissioner Cox? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Escareño? So we recusal, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Commissioner Flores is a yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Murphy? Stepped away. Commissioner Novara? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tunney? Yes. Thank you. And Commissioner Wagonspack, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Uh, motion passes. Thank you to the team. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and members of the commission, and um, Fernando as well. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is D5, a proposed technical amendment to plan development number 1342. Submitted by 322 North Clark LLC for the property generally located at 314-332 North Clark Street, 315-333 um, North LaSalle, 101-131 West Carroll Street, uh, Carroll Avenue. The amendment to the plan development would allow dwelling units as a permitted use type, as well as identify street grade development and public access. And this is item 22102, and this is in the 42nd floor. Uh, Fernando Espinosa will provide the context overview, and the applicant will present their proposal. Okay, good afternoon. Just uh, confirming you can still hear me. Yes, we can. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yes. Perfect. Okay, again, for the record, Fernando Espinoza with Department of Planning and Development. I'm a city planner with DPD. Property is located at uh, 314, 322 North Clark Street. There's a tactical amendment for PD 1342. The site is uh, located with the New North Side community area. The total approximate population is 105,000. 481 people. About 92% of the residents live in one or two person households. And about 67.2% of residents are employed within the city limits. The median income for the area is approximately $109,049. And we'll now turn over the presentation to Mr. Jack George, who represents the applicant. Mr. George, are you available? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chairman and members of the commission. My name is John George. I'm an attorney with the Ackerman Law Firm with offices at 71 South Wacker. I'm appearing this afternoon on behalf of the applicant, which is 322 North Clark LLC, in connection with a proposed technical amendment to PD 1342 for the property, which is bounded by the river on the south, uh, LaSalle Street on the west, Clark Street on the east and Carroll Street on the north. Uh, the slide that's up there now shows exactly the arrows pointing to the subject site. And as you can see, the Chicago River is to the south, the Sal is to the west, Clark is on the north, and then to the north is just Carroll Street. Uh, what this is, is this is a, an amendment we're seeking to this plan development to permit a residential use as a permitted use under the plan development. There are no other changes being made to the plan development. We have met with uh, DPD, we have met with Alderman Riley on this matter, and we have received a letter of 
support from him on this application, which should be in your file. Uh, at such time as the applicant does move forward with a residential development of this property as a component of the property, we would then be required to come back to the plan commission and the zoning committee uh, to obtain approval for that because right now there are not a, a designated number of residential units. And so all of that would have to come back before the plan commission and the zoning committee. In addition to that, uh, when they do come back, they would then have to be complying with the, uh, the ARO regulations with respect to MBEWB uh, would also be a requirement for them to comply with. And uh, in the amendment, uh, it does provide the commitments that the developer has made with respect to the development, uh, not only of the building, but also just to the north of it over Carroll Street, we have, we'll be doing a deck. And so the in statement number five of the plan development documents, the specific requirements that we'll be adhering to are contained in that plan development statement. Can you go to the next slide, please? This shows the property, the Reed Murdoch building is what we're looking at. And that's the, the, the very south of the property. And then go to the next slide, please. This is the site that's outlined in red is the proposed area where the hotel and the residential building would be built. And then just to the, and that where you see those trucks parked along, that's Carroll Street. And under this proposed plan development, that would be decked over. And then uh, that would be open to the public then during certain hours. And then there would also be an entrance for cars that would come in off of Clark and go all the way through and stay to the right. And they would then exit onto LaSalle Street. The next slide, please. This shows again, a, a more of a, a clear depiction of what I'm talking about. It shows the existing Reed Murdoch building, the existing high rise, and then it also shows the existing garage too. The next slide, please. Yeah, this, uh, this is a, again, a commitment that we have made that when we do at, at, at such time as the residential development does go forward, that would re then require a commitment and trigger the affordable housing ordinance and also trigger uh, the 20% of the units being affordable. The next slide, please. And then we haven't built the building, so and we and the building isn't up yet, so we don't know exactly what the cost of the uh, project would be, but there is the commitment, which is always there, that we would have 26% uh, MBE, 6% WBE, and 50% city residential, residential hiring. Um, the next slide, please. That this goes to, that's that's really our our presentation. This is just a simply a technical amendment to permit residential as a permitted use under the PD, so that when people come to the developer now and talk about doing something like that at this project right now, the PD does not permit it. So it's just a technical amendment to allow that use under this existing PD. Uh, I stand ready to answer any questions that any of you might have, Madam Chairman. And uh, as I said earlier, there is a letter of support from Alderman Riley. And again, thank you to the Department of Planning for the help they've given me on this matter. Thank you, Mr. George. Uh, this is Fernando Espinoza, City Planner with Department of Planning. TBT has concluded that, the, that this proposal is appropriate for this site and supports this amendment for the following reason. The addition of 20 units located above the ground floor and the permitted use to PD 1342 would not negatively impact the remaining uses on the site, adjacent uses to the site, no uses in the immediate area. Finally, please refer to the department staff report for further details of the proposal. Based on the foregoing, it's recommendation of the zoning administrator and Department of Plan Development that the application for a technical amendment to plan development 1342 be approved and the recommendation to the city council committee on zoning landmark and building standards be passage recommended this concludes the presentation staff and development team are available to answer questions thank you thank you thank you for the presentation uh pretty straightforward amendment um but i'm uh you know, opening it up to the commissioners to see if there's any questions or comments on this item. 
If not, I'll go ahead and ask for a motion. Do I have a motion on a proposed technical amendment to plan development number 1342 submitted by 322 North Clark LLC for the property generally located at 314-332 North Clark Street, 315-333 North LaSalle, 101-131 West Carroll Avenue, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? So moved by Tony. So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Tony. Do I have a second? Second by Escareño. Thank you, Commissioner Escareño. Uh, roll call vote. Commissioner Brunfield? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Cox? Commissioner Burnett, vote yes. Oh, Commissioner Burnett, thank you. Did we lose Commissioner Cox? Commissioner Cox, we can't hear you, so I'll come back to you. Um, Commissioner Escareño, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Flores is a yes. Commissioner Lyons? Sorry, Chairwoman, she's a recusal on this item. Recuse, okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Novara? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tunney, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. And Commissioner Wagenspack? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Congratulations to the team. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is D6, a proposed Institutional plan development submitted by the Chicago Board of Ed for the property generally located at 5049-5133 West Harrison Street, 601-629 South Laramie Avenue, 5000-5132 West Flournoy Street, 609-628 South Laverne Avenue. The applicant is proposing to rezone the site from a RT4 residential two flat townhouse and multi-unit district and an a, um, M1-2 limited manufacturing business park district to a B3-1 community shopping district and then to an institutional plan development. This will allow for renovations to the Michelle Clark High School campus that include a new turf football field along West Flournoy Street, a new 56 space parking area at the western portion of the campus, along South Laramie in a new artificial turf practice area and walking track immediately east of the school building. This is item 22038, and this is in the 29th ward. Uh, Brian Hacker will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Thanks, Madam Chair. Good afternoon to you and uh, all the members of the Plan Commission. My name is Brian Hacker. I'm the planner at the uh, West Region of the Department of Planning and Development, the city of Chicago. And I'm here to present uh, this institutional plan development application for uh, Michelle Clark High School from the Chicago Board of Education and uh, joined by their council and uh, members of uh, their staff. Sorry, just a moment. So uh, the Board of Education is proposing the uh, following actions for consideration today. And uh, this is a project to expand the existing campus of Michelle Clark High School to uh, include an adjacent uh, vacant uh, site of vacant land for some additional athletic facilities. Uh, the proposal is to rezone the project area from an RT4 and the M1-2 uh, district to a B3-1 district, and then establish a new institutional plan development. And this will allow for the construction of a new artificial turf football field with bleachers and a press box, a 56 space parking lot, and a turf field with a walking track. Project is generally located at 5101 uh, West Harrison Street. This is in the 29th Ward, uh, where the elected official is Alderman Chris Talia Faro, who uh, we've received a letter of support from for this project. It's in the West Planning Region in the Austin community area. Austin is a Invest Southwest uh, 
community, although this is not on the Invest, uh, the Invest Southwest Priority Corridor in the community. Uh, Austin is a community area with uh, roughly 97,000 residents in it. This map shows the location of the proposed project. So this is uh, on a block that's bounded by Harrison Street to the north, Laverne Avenue to the east, uh, Flournoy Street and the uh, I-290 Expressway to the south and then uh, Laramie to the west. So uh, the block is currently occupied by a two-story uh, building uh, for the Michelle Clark Magnet High School and uh, uh, an existing surface parking lot, some tennis courts, and, as well as some vacant land and uh, unprogrammed open space. And then you'll see too, there's also a, a light industrial building that's at the northeast portion of the block there. And, uh, current net site area is 8.76 acres uh, that's with the uh, proposed expansion. This map shows the existing zoning. So as previously mentioned, uh, the site is currently a RT-4 district where uh, the high school is currently located. And then the property that would be part of the expansion is an M1-2 district. And again, this would be rezoned to a B3-1 and then to a new institutional plan development. Provide some context for the location here. Uh, this view is looking towards the Southeast. So you can see the existing uh, high school building. Uh, to the right of it, there is a uh, green space where some tennis courts have actually uh, been constructed, which are not viewed on this map yet, uh, but that was kind of the first phase of this uh, campus expansion. Uh, on the opposite side of the building, you can see uh, some uh, existing tennis courts and a surface parking lot that would be uh, demoed to uh, allow for the expansion of the campus here. So uh, just provide a little bit of background. Uh, this has been a, uh, the school has been around since 1971 when it was first built as the Austin Area Middle School. Uh, according to CPS's most current data, there's 425 students and roughly 80 faculty and staff members. Uh, the existing building will not be affected by the, uh, this project. And uh, it's in an area that has other institutional uses, uh, such as the Leland Grade School, which is just to the north of Harrison Street. There, uh, there are a couple of churches that are immediately across Harrison from it. There's the uh, Build Community Center, with, which is a, a, a youth-focused uh, community use. And uh, it's also surrounded by some industrial buildings to the, the east, which would actually be to the uh, upper left in this view. And then the uh, Eisenhower Expressway to the south. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to hand it over to uh, Scott Borstein, the uh, council uh, representative on this project. Thanks, Brian. Um, can everybody hear me? Thank you. Great. All right, so Scott Borstein, uh, an attorney at Neil and Leroy here in Chicago, 20 South Clark Street, um, here on behalf of the Chicago Board of Education um, with a, a nice improvement project for um, Michelle Clark High School. Um, I'm joined by Evan Smith, our Director of Planning for the Capital Group at CPS, uh, Jamel Chambers, who's our Intergovernmental Liaison, uh, Chris Meal, uh, who's our uh, engineer, uh, designer of record. And there probably are other people as well, if necessary, uh, to chime in on, on matters. Um, so just, uh, just quick background. The, this is a mandatory plan development, which is why we're before you today. Uh, anytime you have a school project that's uh, in excess of two acres, it's required to come in as a plan development. So. The, the original school site was already in excess of two acres, but when you add land, um, that's the, the technical trigger that brings us before you today. Um, and the, the land that was acquired, it was actually acquired several years ago. Um, and so this kind of has been in the works for a while, um, but you know, with CPS, there's always funding issues and so forth, but we're, we're now ready to move forward with the project. Um, as Brian mentioned, this project does have the support of Alden Telly Faro and whose ward this is located. You do have a record on uh, or letter on file 
indicating his support. Um, and we've had some community engagement, which we can talk about as well, if necessary. But with that, I'm really just going to turn it over to Chris, who can run through uh, the details of the of the design. Thank you, Scott, and thank you, um, DPD staff and members of the commission for the opportunity to uh, present, as Scott mentioned, a, a very transformative project for this uh, existing school building. So yeah, I'll, I'll run through a few slides here on the little bit on context, and then we'll dive into what's proposed. The first slide here, I think Brian touched on net site area, um, total you know, contiguous ownership parcel is 8.76 acres. Gross site area of the PD is just a touch over 11 acres. Uh, south, this, next slide. <laughs> uh, pictures for context. The, the two uh, pictures on the top are basically of that existing vacant parcel that will become part of the plan development. Same on the south, you can see the industrial building, uh, the south elevation of the industrial building that Brian mentioned, as well as the vacant parcel. Here are some views along Flournoy, which is just adjacent to I-290 Eisenhower. Um, some, also some views of the existing tennis courts uh, that have been that are currently on site. And then there was a new tennis court project that was completed last year. Uh, that is currently built uh, today. Next slide, please. A few photos of uh, the school property and right of way along Harrison. So now we're on the north side of the school. Uh, you can see the existing parking lot um, that will be completely removed and replaced. And then you can see some of the access to the existing school. The main entrances to the school uh, you know, student access buses come off of Harrison. Next slide. So what are we doing at the, at the school? What's being proposed uh, really high level is a football field is first and foremost being proposed on the Eastern uh, side of the project. So that's a full size uh, artificial turf football field. Accompanying the football field will be lighting, uh, as well as press box uh, area and bleacher system, um, obviously for spectator viewing, um, for calling the games. In the center of the site, we'll have a uh, synthetic turf play field and a walking track. And then on the west, we will have a, a new parking lot and the existing tennis courts. Next slide. A little bit about the project timeline and outreach, really the outreach on the project in coordination with the community, school, et cetera, started in uh, the beginning of last year. So 2022, January, 2022, a number of meetings occurred, a CPS documented here um, with the community and the school. Uh, really design began last year and it was introduced to uh, city council last December. Uh, and here we are today at Plan Commission on the 20th of April, and then hopefully looking to get substantial completion completed by the end of this year. A little more detail about what we're, what we're proposing. So as I mentioned, there is um, full-size synthetic turf football field on the eastern extent of the property. There'll be a concrete plaza space adjacent to the press box that I previously mentioned. Um, so that plaza space will have tree gates, benches, uh, places for students, staff, and um, the community to, to sit during events. Uh, as I mentioned, we're also adding a um, sort of centralized play field. So that could be used by kids during PE um, and other opportunities for the school. It'll have a walking track around it as well. Uh, all new concrete flat work as well, kind of surrounding all these improvements here on the east side along that vacant parcel. On the west side of the project, oh, can you go? Yeah, thanks, Brian. On the west side of the project, we'll have a proposed 56 stall uh, parking lot. That'll include an EV charging station, handicap accessible parking, and two new curb cuts, one to Harrison and one to Laramie. Uh, next slide. 
So the other part of the improvement really is the enhancement of the landscaping surrounding all, you know, sort of the major improvements I just discussed. There'll be a large number of new um, ornamental and shade trees proposed around the parking lot on the west side, the new parking area, uh, as well as in that centralized plaza space uh, between the, the artificial turf play field and the uh, artificial turf football field. There'll also be improvements uh, into the right of way, uh, including new street trees around the campus. Um, and there will also be substantial right of way improvements to sidewalk, ADA ramps, and curb and gutter along uh, Flournoy Street at the intersection with Laverne. Next slide, please. As part of our um, work on the plan development, we are proposing uh, to meet the sustainable development policy of DPD uh, by implementing um, working landscapes, uh, EV charging station and waste diversion. Next slide. Stormwater management for the project is substantial as you can imagine, given the extents of the improvements and just the overall size. So we'll have three different stormwater detention basins provided for the project. One will be on the west side, which will be an infiltration basin located under the uh, proposed parking lot. The second and third detention systems will be infiltration basins located under the proposed synthetic turf fields. And so the whole project will be in compliance with the city of Chicago stormwater ordinance. Next slide. Economic and community benefits um, include um, some of the items listed here, uh, MB, M and W, um, BE uh, percentages, 30%. Um, for MBE, 7% for W. Next slide. I think that's it. I'll turn it back to you, Brian. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris and Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, uh, it's Brian Hacker from DPD. It is the department's recommendation to approve the zoning map amendment proposed by the Chicago Board of Education mm -hmm. uh, to rezone the site from an RT-4 district and an M1-2 district to a B3-1 district establish a new institutional plan development to facilitate the expansion of the Michelle Clark High School campus. Uh, the justifications in the Chicago Zoning Ordinance are listed below on the slide. There's further detail available in my uh, staff report that's posted with the uh, Planning Commission materials. And it's the recommendation of the Department of Planning and Development that this application uh, be approved uh, and recommended for passage to the City Council Committee on Zoning, Landmarks, and Building Standards. So that concludes my presentation. And, uh, we're happy to take any questions or feedback uh, from commissioners. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I do see that Commissioner Cox and Commissioner Murphy are back on. Would you like to record a vote on the previous item? Um, thank you, yes. Uh, I am a yes on the METRA um, um, item that was before the commission prior. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. Commissioner Murphy? Yes, uh, the same regarding Metra and the Clark Street proposal that preceded this one. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, now on to the comments for this, for this item. I do have a question for the team. Uh, if someone can speak to um, having any plans for improvements to the actual school? Because uh, I know that's a, a, a building from the 70s. I'm not sure if there's been recent uh, renovations to it or, or there's future plans for that. Commissioner, this is Evan Smith, um, Chicago Public Schools and Jamel Chambers can chime in. But um, in the last four or five years, um, we've invested um, an additional or prior uh, funding for things such as interior classroom renovations, science classrooms. We installed a new roof to the tune of $7.6 million. Um, so we're in tune with the school who also has, I think it's uh, the Parent Teacher Academy with private funding. Um, but you're right, it's, it's an older school, but it's actually more modern because the average age of our schools are 80 years old. But um, we have... Uh, put in money 
consistently at this location and in the future, hopefully, depending on budgeting, we will continue. I'm not sure if Jamel Chambers has anything to add to that. No, that was good, Evan. Uh, I do want to um, indicate that we're going to continue to do assessments um, at not just Clark, but all of our schools to ensure that they're uh, running to the best abilities to provide um, a safe space, uh, safe learning space for all of our students. And sorry for the record, Jamel Chambers, City Council Liaison for Chicago Public Schools. Great to hear. Thank you both for the clarification. Do the commissioners have any questions um, or, or comments on this item? Not seeing any hands go up. Okay. Then uh, what about uh, Alderman uh, Talia Ferro? Is, um, is there a letter on file uh, of support or no, is anybody no. from his staff? We have his support, statement? but he's not okay. on the call, Chairwoman. Okay, thank you. Um, so if there are no more questions or comments. Chairwoman? Uh, yes? Excuse me so much. I'm sorry. Um, this is Marie, C Commissioner Navarra. I wanted to just note, um, per the mayor's executive order, we don't need letters of support from alders. Um, so okay. it, um, we can certainly ask for, a, you know, if they have a position, but we don't need a letter of support to, to advance a project. Thank you. Um, okay, so then we'll go ahead and ask uh, for a motion on this item. Uh, do I have a motion on a proposed institutional plan development submitted by the Chicago Board of Ed for the property generally located at 5049-5133 West Harrison Street, 601-629 uh, South Laramie Avenue, 5000-5132 West Flournoy Street, 609-628 uh, South Laverne Avenue, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? So moved, so moved by, by Tony and seconded by Commissioner Cox. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Tony and Commissioner Cox. Roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Brumfield? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Burnett? Stepped away. Commissioner Cox was a yes. yes. Thank you. Commissioner Escareño? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Flores is a yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Novara? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tani, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Wagensback? Yes. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, Commissioner Burnett, Burnett, I see you're back on. Yeah. Thank you. I got you. I say yes. Um, motion passes. Congrats. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the commission. Appreciate it. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Um, Next item on the agenda is D7, a proposed plan development submitted by Pictor 4435 Southwestern Boulevard LLC for the property generally located at 4435 Southwestern Boulevard. The applicant seeks to change the zoning designation from M2-3 Light Industry District and Plan Manufacturing District, PMD8, to a plan development. The applicant proposes to develop the property with three buildings intended for warehouse and distribution use. The planned development will carry a maximum height of 45 feet. The proposed development will contain 89 loading docks, 703 vehicular parking spaces, and 37 truck parking spaces. The maximum allowed FAR in the planned development will be 3.0. Um, this is item 22030, uh, and this is in the 12th ward. Uh, Roberto Astudillo will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the commission. For the record, my name is Roberto Astudillo, urban designer for the Southwest region with the, planning, with the Department of Planning and Development. 
The proposed uh, plan development is generally located at 4435 Southwestern Boulevard and is located in the new city community area within the 12th Ward. The applicant, Picture 4435 Southwestern Boulevard LLC, and their development team appear here today for the purposes of establishing a commercial industrial plan development at the subject site. The applicant requests a rezoning of the subject property from the M2 3 light industry district and plan manufacturing district 8a to a commercial industrial plan development to permit the construction of three industrial buildings containing a total of approximately 588,880 square feet of floor area 703 vehicular parking spaces 37 truck parking spaces and 82 loading docks the subject site is in the new city community area it is within the stockyards industrial corridor the New City community area has a population of 43,628 people, of which 23.1% are Black, 12.4% White, 1.9% Asian, and 61.8% Hispanic of any race. This community area has a median household income of $35,396. In this slide, please note that North is oriented to the right. The proposed plan development is located between West 47th Street and West 43rd Street. It is bounded by existing freight and CTA rail to the east and Southwestern Boulevard and an existing Home Depot to the west. The site is at the border between the New City and Brighton Park community areas. Shown here, the site is currently improved with three single-story industrial buildings operated by the current site occupant, the Wheatland Tube Company. The Wheatland Tube Company is one of the largest independent steel and pipe manufacturers in the country. It is anticipated that the Wheatland Tube Company will vacate the property in the coming years. The applicant plans to demolish all existing buildings. Shown here are the existing conditions around the site. Image number one shows the existing view from the inter intersection at Southwestern Avenue and West 45th Street. Image number two shows one of the existing buildings to be demolished at Southwestern Boulevard and West 45th Street. Image number three provides context of the existing conditions within the site. Image number four demonstrates the existing conditions of the entrance at West 47th and Oakley. Image number five shows the existing landscape buffer between the current building operations and the sidewalk. Image number seven uh, is, an, is an additional uh, image showing the existing landscape buffer next to the viaduct at West 47th Street. And image number eight shows the existing view from the Home Depot parking lot. The proposed plan development will be within a quarter mile of the new park district headquarters. Nearby institutions include uh, the back of the yards college prep. This site will also be behind yards plaza separated by existing freight and CTA tracks. The site is located within a quarter mile of the CTA Western Orange Line stop. CTA bus service is provided via the 47, 48, and 49 bus lines with nearby stops at West 47th and South Oakley and West 45th and Southwestern Avenue. In the pink, you will see anticipated pedestrian circulation. The site, outlined in red, is currently zoned to two different areas. The eastern portion of the site is currently zoned as Plan Manufacturing District 8A, and the western portion of the site is currently zoned M2-3. The applicant proposes rezoning the site to a commercial industrial plan development. The site is across residential and commercial land uses to the west and south, and buffered by manufacturing, industrial, and commercial land uses adjacent to the site and to the north and west. There are no city adopted plans for this region. Now I will turn the presentation over to Liz Butler, the applicant's attorney, who will further explain the details of the proposal. Um, Ms. Butler, are you ready to begin? Ready. Thank you, Roberto. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the commission. My name is Liz Butler. I'm a partner at the law firm of Taft, Statinius, and Hollister, located at 111 East Wacker Drive in Chicago. I am appearing on behalf of the applicant, Picture 4435 Southwestern Boulevard LLC, um, an affiliate of Brookfield Properties. I'm joined today by Jason Bengert, who is the Vice President of Development for Brookfield Properties, Mike Mondes from Spaceco, who is the civil engineer for the project, Lue Abuna from KLOA is the traffic engineer, 
for the project and Lauren Zangle is appearing um, on as the environmental and air quality consultant for the project. So Roberto mentioned the subject property is uh, the Wheatland Tube facility bounded by 43rd Street on the north, rail uh, right of way on the east, 47th on the south, and western on the west. Um, the property is approximately 32.54 acres in size. And also, as Roberto mentioned, it's split zoned currently as part of the manufacturing M2 dash three light industry district and part of the planned manufacturing district eight a um, it's located in the stockyards industrial uh, corridor the um, pd that's before you today this is a mandatory plan development um, that is uh, triggered by the city's air quality zoning ordinance so Roberto mentioned that there are the existing improvements on the site today are these three industrial buildings that are currently operated by Wheatland Tube. Uh, Wheatland Tube is a division of Zeckelman Industries, a manufacturer and fabricator of steel pipe and other metal tubes. Wheatland has operated at the property for, uh, for decades, and the site is used for Wheatland's fabricating and manufacturing processes, as well as storage of raw and finished goods, warehousing distribution and administrative functions. Brookfield purchased the property in 2021 and uh, leased the site back to Wheatland. So Wheatland is now a tenant. It's anticipated that Wheatland will vacate the property in the coming years. And in anticipation of that, uh, of Wheatland vacating, Brookfield is envisioning um, a cleaner and more modern future for this site. Brookfield's proposal for the site, as you see on the screen, is to demolish the existing structures and redevelop the site with three modern Class A industrial buildings um, shown on the site plan. No specific tenant has been identified at this point, but heavy manufacturing and fabricating operations will be discontinued. It's anticipated that the site will likely be used for uh, warehouse and distribution. So the development is a, is master planned to accommodate traffic and loading internally, as we'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, the the project will have 703 vehicular uh, passenger parking spaces, 37 truck parking spaces, 82 loading docks, um, as well as bicycle parking provided for employees. Access is from the three uh, driveways that you see shown here on the site plan from West 47th Street, from Western, and from West 45th Street. The proposal will incorporate sustainable uh, design best practices, which we'll also talk about a little bit um, later on in the presentation, one of those being uh, that the buildings will be designed to be LEED certified. So with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Jason from Brookfield Properties, and he'll go through the project design in more detail. We can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Liz, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Jason Benger with Brookfield Properties. Um, as, as Liz noted, uh, Brookfield only develops Class A facilities, and obviously this development will be uh, no different, um, utilizing precast, painted precast panels for, for the bulk of the structure, as well as uh, metal accent panels. And as you can see, curtain wall um, with aluminum framed glazed areas in the office, uh, both on the <clears throat> north and south of the elevations. Um, this is for building one, next slide. Building two is very similar other than the um, dimensions of the building. Again, you see the precast uh, panels, metal accent panels, and um, curtain wall glazing sections at the potential office corners. Next slide, please. Building three, which is facing Western Avenue, uh, we decided to uh, utilize um, a, a system that would work well with the adjacent neighborhood and to, to really Capture the uh, architecture in the in the neighborhood on Western, so you can see the the red brick like facade um, will be on that entire elevation. Uh, it should also be noted the the bulk of the heights uh, for the buildings is around 37 feet, with some areas that go up to 41 and 45 uh, feet in total height. Next slide, please. In terms of sustainability. 
Um, Brookfield, again, leading, leading the industry with uh, a lot of sustainability mandates. Um, th this building or this development will be no different than that. Uh, LEED certified, uh, light pollution restrictions at the site boundaries, utilize a white TPL roof, which eliminates the uh, heat island effect, energy efficient uh, modeling and commissioned facilities, um, EV charging stations throughout the development, low water consumption, uh, utilizing high efficient fixtures, and LED lighting throughout the facilities. We're also looking at some other innovative sustainable technology uh, during this time, actually in Texas. Um, if, if that uh, pans out, we'll perhaps be using that here as well, um, e even further reducing our, our carbon footprint. Um, that system is a, a, a low carbon concrete, um, which reduces the amount of cement in the mixture and, and therefore reduces our, our carbon footprint. Um, all Brookfield projects in the city of Chicago will meet or exceed the Chicago Sustainable Development Policy by obtaining at least 100 points or more, as you can see in the matrix in front of you. Next slide, please. We added some outdoor tenant amenity spaces in this development, um, similar to the images, images you see on the screen, um, a place where tenants and employees can enjoy the outdoor air, um, which obviously promotes health, wellness, and overall satisfaction uh, while they're at work. Um, and I think that's about it on the outdoor amenity. I'll turn the presentation over to Mike Mondes from Spaceco to run through uh, additional site design details. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, good afternoon, Michael Mondes with uh, Spaceco. Um, the, uh, the slide on the screen uh, shows the uh, landscaping that uh, is proposed for the site. Um, this development will meet uh, the city landscape ordinance, re ordinance requirements and proposes um, a robust landscaping and, screen, uh, and screening, including uh, generous uh, perimeter setback, setbacks um, and will uh, increase the, the quality and quantity of uh, landscaping that exists on the site currently. Um, the chart on this slide shows the, um, the existing landscaping and the uh, proposed landscaping and, and the net increase uh, of approximately 388 trees and 144 shrubs that are provided in the proposed plan. Um, the landscaping uh, proposed also, uh, also provides an enhanced uh, buffer along 47th Street um, that uh, is to match or mimic the, uh, the current one that exists there today. Uh, next slide, please. These are uh, uh, cross sections of um, the frontages that we have along 47th Street and, and Western Boulevard. Um, both frontages, um, parkways and buffers will, will meet the city uh, landscape ordinance requirements. Um, however, the 40, 47th Street buffer um, is being enhanced, which is the top, which is the top cross section. Um, to provide a, mini a minimum of a 30 foot setback um, between the property line and, and parking area um, in lieu of what would be a required seven foot setback. Um, this enhanced buffer will, will also include a, a three foot berm um, and an addition of uh, 25 evergreen trees um, that are in addition to the required buffer trees that would be provided normally under the, uh, the landscape ordinance. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this, this slide outlines uh, how this development will, uh, will meet the city's stormwater management ordinance requirements. Um, the current property um, provides, no, um, provides no means to manage uh, stormwater runoff and, and water runoff uh, currently runs, uh, runs off the property uh, uncontrolled to the, uh, the adjacent city sewer system. Um, the proposed development will provide uh, approximately 8.8 .8 acre feet of stormwater storage um, and will release stormwater runoff into the city systems at a controlled rate. Uh, this storage and, and controlled release rate will benefit the city surrounding uh, sewer system. Next slide. Liz, I think you were up. Yep. Thank you, Mike. Um, 
Brookfield engaged KLOA to complete a traffic impact study. Because this was an air quality ordinance plan development, the uh, traffic impact study was made publicly available. It was posted on the city of Chicago's website, and there was a, a public uh, review and comment period um, as required by the, uh, the air quality ordinance. The purpose of the traffic study was to determine the existing vehicular, pedestrian, bicycle, and public transportation um, conditions to understand and establish a baseline. The study assesses the impact uh, that the proposed development would have on the transportation conditions in the area, and it evaluates uh, whether any street access, bicycle, pedestrian modifications, or improvements were needed to accommodate or mitigate future conditions. The study concludes that because the proposed development will replace Wheatland Tube, which operates with a similar access system and generates uh, similar truck traffic, that intersections in the area have sufficient capacity to accommodate the traffic that will result from the proposed development. No changes or roadway improvements or modifications to the traffic control in this area were recommended. Louie Abuna, our traffic engineer, is on the call and he's available to answer any questions in greater detail. And we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So again, because this was an air quality ordinance uh, plan development, we um, in the development team engaged ECS to complete an air quality impact study uh, intended to identify the potential air quality impact of the redevelopment of the site. The study used methodology from the EPA based on guidance from the Chicago Department of Public Health. This study was also posted to the city's website and made available for public review and comment. Uh, we're not aware of any comments that were received to this study. Um, the city's Department of Public Health reviewed the air quality impact report and agreed that the proposed development does not exceed the national ambient air quality standards and it issued its approval and recommendation for the project in December of 2022. Uh, it's important to note that the existing Wheatland Tube facility holds a permit through the Illinois uh, Environmental Protection Agency that allows it to discharge up to 226 tons of volatile emissions per year. The proposed development will discontinue that permit and that practice and will not have industrial manufacturing processes at the site. So the air quality impact study found that the proposed development will, is not anticipated to cause or exceed limits for emissions, um, and the discontinuation of Wheatland's operations will, will ultimately result in a net benefit to the neighborhood in terms of air quality in the vicinity of the site. Um, our, our air quality expert from ECS is available to dive into further into the methodology and findings of the report. Um, and we'll talk more about the community process that was undertaken, but uh, uh, these findings were also presented publicly at a community meeting. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, the project is committed to local hiring and has committed to 26% um, MBE and 6% uh, WBE, as well as Chicago and 12th Ward resident hiring. Uh, Brookfield uh, sent out um, a, a letter to agency assist um, uh, recipients announcing the opportunity and will work with uh, the local elected official um, to host um, host hiring, hiring fairs when the project becomes closer to uh, the construction period. We can go to the next slide, please. So some of the, the some of the benefits associated with the project are the enhancement um, in the environmental condition and improved air quality. Um, it's replacing an outmoded, obsolete industrial uh, use with a new, modern, LEED certified development. It'll create approximately 60 full-time uh, uh, employment um, equivalent construction jobs. We estimate that about 200 jobs um, exist at the Wheatland Tube facility today, and that will be replaced with between 400 and 600 new jobs. The project budget is uh, approximately 90 million. Um, you heard Mike Mondes summarize the landscape enhancements of at least 400 new trees um, and uh, 
well, we can go to the next slide to show the, the initial version of the site plan. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the public process, but <laughs> we'll go to we'll go to the site plan next. So as I mentioned, Brookfield acquired the we can stay on the on the timeline. Thank you. Brookfield acqu acquired the site in 2021. And before closing on the land, we had an initial meeting with the Department of Planning and Development. We continued to engage with the alderman at, at the time, who was Alderman Cardenas. We met with the back of the yards neighborhood council, um, as well as immediate neighbors of the facility. In October, um, we had an, an additional intake meeting with the Department of Planning and Development and then hosted a public community meeting in the fall. Um, the PD was filed in December of 2022, and here we are today in April of 2023. So we can go to the next slide, please. This slide demonstrates the outcome of the design review process and some of the enhancements to the project. Um, the ones that I'll point out are uh, the original site plan at the at the top of the slide. You can see that the building ultimately was the building along Western was ultimately shifted to uh, abut Western um, to correspond to the setback um, of other buildings along Western. Parking was relocated to the rear of the building. And then um, on 47th, um, another uh, row of parking was ultimately eliminated in order to create a much more robust landscape setback along 47th. 50 parking spaces ultimately were eliminated at the north end of the site to allow for that enhanced landscaping. Um, and you heard Mike Mondes describe that that um, 30 foot densely planted landscape buffer with the three foot tall berm and additional trees to enhance the pedestrian safety uh, and comfort. We, you heard um, Jason describe the outdoor landscaped tenant amenity and wellness spaces that were added. Um, and that uh, summarizes the enhancements to the design that were made in coordination with the Department of Planning and Development. That concludes our presentation. Um, our team is available to answer any questions that um, that the commission might have. Thank you for your consideration of this project. Thank you, Liz. Um, the Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the material submitted by the applicant and has concluded that the proposal would be appropriate for the following reasons. The proposal promotes economically beneficial development patterns that are compatible with the character of existing neighborhoods. It ensures a level of amenities appropriate to the nature and scale of the project. It promotes the safe and efficient circulation of pedestrians, cyclists, and motor vehicles and provides bicycle and vehicular and vehicle parking while minimizing the adverse visual impact of any off-street parking areas. The proposal matches a typical setback and facade aesthetic along Western Boulevard, creating active street or building walls lining the sidewalk. Please refer to my staff report for further details on this project and the plans identified here today. Based on the foregoing, uh, the zoning administrator recommends that the application for this plan development be approved and forwarded to the City Council Committee on Zoning, Landmarks, and Building Standards as such. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Tenney, I see you have your hand raised. Are we finished with the present? I'll wait till the presentation is ended. It is, it is over. It is. Okay, okay. Um, this is not about the current development, but Department of Planning is on, let me get my video on. Okay, um, What what is happening with the steel company? Is there a relocation plan with them or are they just leaving the city or whatever, discontinuing operations? Whatever. Jason here again. Um, we, we don't have the specific details from Wheatland. We, we do know they're, they're relocating and I, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly uh, the location of, of their redevelopment plans. Um, Alderman Tiny, uh, we have been in touch with World Business Chicago. They're aware of the project and they'll be in touch with the Wheatland Tube Company to help facilitate whatever their plans might be. Well, Liz, it, they've been renting, you know, it was, a, you know, they've been renting. So obviously that exit plan has been in the works, I would assume. 
So yeah. Yeah, their their exit plans aren't until 25. Um, so the, I, I believe they're still working through some of those details and, and finalizing what that looks like. Okay, that was my question. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, Commissioner Lyons. Thank you. Uh, wondering um, if you can go through for the community meeting um, that was held in October, um, how many folks were participating? And can you mention if there was um, a communi community meeting since that October 22 <clears throat> meeting? And then my follow-up question is, what um, letters of support do you have from local community organizations? Oh, I can address that. Um, the meeting was... Uh, we notified neighbors of the meeting by sending notice to the same folks that received notice of the uh, filing of the application. Um, and we also published a notification of the community meeting in the in the Sun Times. Um, we had one phone call uh, asking about the the proposed development. Um, after new num actually numerous letters have gone out to the neighborhood. Um, in this regard, and only one person had a question about the project. Only one neighbor attended the community meeting, though uh, the previous alderman, Alderman Cardenas, attended with his staff. At the time, Alderman Abarca was not yet in office. She also attended. Um, the uh, We had a meeting with the Back of the Yards Community uh, Neighborhood Council, and we have a letter of support from that organization. Thank you. Um, is it possible to get a copy of the letter of support? Yes. Liz, if you want to send that my way, I'll make sure all the planning commissioners get it. OK. And just to clarify, that letter is coming from uh, the back of the yards neighborhood, but not um, Alderman Abarca. We have an all we have a letter of support from Alderman Cardenas. Um, I'm not sure if we've received a, received a letter from Alderman Abarca at this time, um, but she's aware of the project and, and is supportive of, of the project. Okay, thank Chairman you. Chairman Noah, just to clarify, I'm not sure if you uh, know the timing here, but Alderman Cardenas was holding the seat at the time this project started and that they sought that approval. So uh, since then, Alderman Abarca has taken over the seat. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Cox? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, one, thank you for the uh, adjustments that were made to the site plan, um, which I think are in direct response uh, to uh, issues that we've heard um, and uh, uh, patterns that we've um, that we track very closely relative to uh, what do we what kinds of buffers are necessary when you have a, a different land use a residential. Uh, across the street. So I think the um, the owners, the homeowners on 47th Street will be very pleased to have that berm um, landscape and a 30 foot setback um, so that the building really doesn't encroach on uh, on their um, the, the presence of their street. Uh, and I think as well, uh, the bringing the building up to the main street um, using material that is found uh, along the main street uh, brick is also uh, a really uh, strong enhancement. I must admit, I uh, question I had was um, relative to the traffic pattern. Um, you said there's gonna be uh, four, 400 to, to 600 uh, jobs. I didn't know how many of those jobs are located on site. Uh, and I, somehow, I mean, I'm assuming that this a lot of there's going to be a lot of uh, truck traffic of coming and going. And I didn't know if you were calculating in that number uh, truck drivers uh, or people who are actually working on site. So if you could clarify that, and then uh, I needed I was also interested in understanding how many trucks currently um, are on the site versus how much how many trucks will be on the site after this is fully built out? So I think that is a two-part question and part of it can be addressed by Jason uh, from Brookfield based on your experience with employment at your facilities that you develop 
And then the second part, maybe we can have Louie uh, Abuna address the, the second truck traffic question. Yeah, sure. So, so typically, I mean, it's a wide, it could be a wide range of uh, total employee headcount uh, on the site. Um, we were basically utilizing what we've seen in the past across other uh, assets we own across the country. And, and again, it's a wide range between 200 and 400. It could be less um, depending on, you know, the final tenant. And, and again, um, currently we're, we're building this on spec. Um, so that's still not uh, determined mm -hmm. at this time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what, what, is, uh, what is not clear um, is what, what of the access roads are being uh, used to uh, access the site. Um, and so none of the diagrams that showed the street grid showed where the trucks will be coming and going. So I don't know if it's possible to go back and just clarify um, where, how, how, how uh, vehicles are coming and going from the site. Because you said that there was no need for enhanced signaling or anything on the surrounding um, street grid. Um, once again, uh, I think a diagram um, illustrating, you know, 20% will be leaving from this, 40% will be leaving from that, 60, et cetera. That's, that's really kind of what I'm looking for. Um, Roberto, could we put a, a site plan up on the screen? And I think that some of the those diagrams might be contained in the traffic study itself, but perhaps Louie could speak to, Louie or, or Mike Mondes could speak to that with one of these site plans. Um, Liz, let me, let me give it a shot. This is uh, Louie Abuna with KLOA. Uh, as far as the first question regarding truck movements, uh, Commissioner, based on our traffic study, we anticipate for this type of development, uh, you know, about 170 truck movements in and 170 truck movements out uh, over a 24 hour period. Uh, we don't have specific information on what the current use is, is generating in terms of truck traffic on a daily basis, uh, but based on our observations, at least during the peak hours, we did observe uh, several truck movements in and out. Uh, of the of the facility, uh, as far as access is concerned, uh, there is one major access point, which is uh, the traffic signal at uh, 45th Street um, at, at Western Avenue and Western Boulevard. Uh, that's really where the majority of the traffic uh, will be coming in and out of the facility, particularly the truck traffic. Can someone um, point to that on the drawing because it's not labeled? 45th Street. Yeah, so it's Western Boulevard. Um, all right. I don't know who has control of the pointer, but it's- uh, I think it's, Roberto does. Can you just point to which one is 40, 45th Street? It's right there. That's where the that's where the signalized intersection is. There is a signal at both Western Boulevard and Western Avenue, and through that signalized controlled intersections, the trucks will be able to access Western Avenue okay. uh, to access to go north or south. And then there is also an, another access of uh, 47th Street, um, which is right there. Um, that is currently you being used by trucks, and we anticipate so, that some trucks will also utilize uh, that intersection to ingress and egress the site. Uh, okay, th thank you. That's uh, uh, that that's helpful. Any thank other you. questions or comments by the commissioners? Commissioner Lyons. Um, yes, I'm, uh, you'd mentioned the number of jobs that are going to be created. Um, I'm wondering about what, um, what uh, in terms of the, the folks who are currently working on site, um, if, they, if there's any plans for them to be able to work if they so choose at this facility, um, and the quality of the jobs that um, you expect to create, um, and how you think that'll impact the surrounding area. Yeah, I can I can certainly comment on that. Um, in terms of the Wheatland folks that are there today, um, there, there certainly could be manuf not not really manufacturing type jobs, but if you're a millwright or a welder, I mean, there would be construction jobs um, during the initial phase of development. Um, 
again, it's, it's a little tough to say exactly what type of tenants will be in the space, but we've seen everything from um, your, your typical fork truck driver to um, obviously there's some office staff in each facility as well. So there could be some office jobs, um, you know, lead hands on the floor, uh, shop managers, uh, some light maintenance in terms of the overall building operations. Um, and again, some, some truck driving positions as well. Commissioner Lyons, did you have, you, I know you, the, that was like a two-part question. Did that answer most of it? Um, I was curious about the quality of the jobs, if you could speak to what you expect. Yeah, I, again, I mean, I mean each, each, each facility could potentially have each uh, of their own offices. So you would have office positions, um, whether that's accounting, payroll, um, some of these facilities will often have a bit of a showroom, so you could have some sales folks on the floor, and in, in addition to any warehouse type positions, whether it's fork truck drivers, uh, you know, larger truck operators, uh, maintenance staff in, in, inside the building, whether it's um, janitorial type positions. It's really a wide range depending on tenant use. And at this point, we, we don't have tenants uh, in place. Hopefully that kind of describes what we typically see. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Tunney. Just to dovetail with uh, Commissioner Lyons, of course, you know, I have my bias about trying to keep companies in our city. Um, what it, are the number, if, if you don't know now, how many jobs are currently on site and are they, I would assume union, uh, living wage jobs. Does anybody have that information? Um, I, I know it's two, right around 200 positions are currently at Wheatland. Um, I'm not exactly sure what their, what their wages look like. I, I mostly, believe, mostly union jobs. I, I believe so. Okay. Uh, I don't have that breakout on union versus versus non. Well, I just hope whether it's World Business Chicago or anybody in the Department of Planning in regards to retaining and keeping these companies mm -hmm. in our city is really important. And I know you're specking this out for future uses, but this is, in my opinion, a loss for our city. And that's, that's my two cents worth. If we don't, if we can't keep them in an, another area of the city. So that's my uh, two cents worth. So, well, your comments are, are duly noted and uh, uh, DPD will be following up uh, to make sure uh, that they have uh, a, a plan um, for relocation, um, hopefully within the city. Um, but uh, comments are, are, are a well, um, well received, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lyons. You're muted. Thanks. I would echo um, Ald um, uh, uh, Alderman Tunney's, Chair Tunney, Commissioner Tunney's um, uh, concerns. And I think it just seems like that's part of the, the overall impact that this project's going to have. And it's difficult to evaluate it without having that information. Um, I'm also concerned that one, it was <laughs> attended by one community member. Um, that's concerning to me. Um, and so, uh, you know, I guess I, it's gonna be hard to support this project um, based on some of those unanswered questions. Any other comments or questions by the commissioners? Commissioner Escareño. Yes, just quickly, and, and I'm sorry, I may have missed it, but can, can you uh, again show the uh, traffic uh, flow and, um, and trucks? And I thought that there was a need for some uh, lighting in this area uh, for traffic, uh, purposes of tr truck traffic. Can someone on the team speak to this? Um, to, to clarify the question, do, do you mean um, signal signalized lighting? 
Right. And um, also the amount of uh, tra traffic, is that remaining? Is that enhancing? Is there improvements to uh, um, traffic in this area? I know we have a couple of parks and we have our headquarters that's coming with a big field, um, uh, field house that uh, community is really looking forward to. One of the things that are, is of interest to us is, is safety of uh, pedestrians. And this is really close. To, and, and I was just wondering whether the um, truck traffic would increase, remain the same, and or is there added uh, lighting associated with traffic? Louie, could you address this one, please? Yes, uh, Louie Abuna with KLOA again. The site currently has a signalized access uh, at 45th Street, uh, which is at Western Boulevard and Western Avenue. Um, so, you know, we analyzed that intersection and uh, it, we, we found that there is uh, adequate capacity to accommodate the increase in traffic, both from passenger vehicles as well as truck traffic. And as I indicated earlier, there is additional access uh, to the south at 47th Street uh, that would provide additional ingress and egress for both uh, passenger vehicle and truck traffic as well. Um, so because of that adequacy of the access, you know, we, we didn't, uh, our study did not indicate that there will be a need for any adjustments or any additional signalization of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, access drive of 47th Street. And then as a result, did you say traffic will remain the same, increase or reduce? Um, you know, in, in our traffic study, just to be conservative, what we did is whatever traffic that is currently generated by the site, uh, we left it as part of the background traffic conditions, so we added on top of it the traffic from the proposed development, and even under that scenario, our study indicated that uh, overall the street system can accommodate the increase in traffic. Um, so, you know, uh, so we believe that our analysis is conservative um, in, in that respect. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions? Okay, if not, um, I'll go ahead and ask for a motion on this item. Um, do I have a motion on a proposed plan development submitted by Victor uh, 4435 Southwestern Boulevard LLC for the property generally located at 4435 Southwestern Boulevard, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? Uh, so moved by Commissioner Cox. Thank you. Do I have a second motion? I'll second second. By okay, second by Commissioner Brumfield. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Brumfield, I say yes. Uh, Commissioner Burnett? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Cox, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Escareño? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Flores is a yes. Commissioner Lyons? No. Thank you. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Novara? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tani? Did we lose him? Yep, okay. Uh, Commissioner Wagensback? Yes. Thank you. Uh, motion passes. Congrats. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's see. Um, so we still have four items left. Um, Next item on the agenda is the eight, a proposed residential business plan development submitted by 548 Development LLC for the property generally located at 8840-8856 South Commercial Avenue and 2954-2964 East 89th Street. The applicant is proposing to rezone the site from B3-2 Community Shopping District to B3-3 Community Shopping District and then to a plan development. The plan development will support the renovation of an existing three-story mixed-use building at 8840 South Commercial Avenue to contain 2012 residential units and two ground floor commercial units with commercial and retail uses and to construct an approximately 76 tall mixed-use building 
at 8848-8856 South Commercial Avenue, containing 46 affordable residential units and two ground floor commercial units with commercial and retail uses, and to construct 12 accessory parking spaces. The overall FAR of the plan development will be 3.0, and this is item 22089, and this is in the 10th ward. Uh, Michael Penishnak will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Good uh, afternoon, members of the commission. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Michael Penishnak for the Department of uh, Planning and Development. Uh, so as mentioned, this is for a development at 8844 South Commercial Avenue, which is in the South Chicago community area. Uh, these population, uh, 27,300 people. The community is 75% Black, 21% Latino, and 3% White. Uh, the area skews uh, younger than the city at large. Uh, current land use in South Chicago is 17% uh, single family, 12% multifamily, 3% uh, commercial, 1% uh, industrial, and 1% uh, uh, mixed use. The proposed development uh, complies with uh, Invest Southwest. Uh, this is uh, Mayor Lightfoot's initiative to reactivate uh, neighborhood cores that have historically served as focal points for pedestrian activity, shopping services, transportation, public spaces, and quality of life amenities for residents. While these plans were not passed by uh, the Plan Commission, Invest Southwest was informed by South Chicago's commercial revitalization plan done in 2016 by UIC's Great Cities Institute and the South Chicago Quality of Life Plan completed in 2007 by LISC. So South Chicago is approximately 10 miles uh, south of the loop. Uh, the property itself is at the northwest corner of 89th and Commercial. Uh, the three other corners at this intersection are stable and this development I would create just a truly vibrant, strong intersection. Additionally, immediately west across the public alley, uh, Pilsen Wellness Center has converted uh, a former police station into a mental health clinic. The uh, property is a transit served location um, along a P Street and the South Shore uh, bus line. It is within a 10 minute walk of two uh, Metro Electric stations at 87th Street and 93rd Street. Uh, this proposal uh, it comes from the Galleria 89 team, uh, which is the selected uh, proposal from the Invest Southwest RFP uh, put forward by the Department of Planning in November 2020. Uh, the request uh, for proposals was for the highlighted lot, approximately 24,000 square feet, to become mixed use affordable housing uh, with public open space. Uh, the adaptive reuse of the building highlighted in red was a requirement uh, for any respondent to the RFP. Uh, the facade of that building can be seen here. Uh, as mentioned by the chairwoman, Gallery 89 proposes the renovation of an existing three-story building, mixed use that contained 12 residential units and the construction of a new passive house building containing 46 uh, affordable residential units and commercial units on the ground floor. Uh, the development will have 12 accessory parking spaces. And notably, this will be one of the largest uh, passive house developments in the city. Uh, the Galleria 89 team is composed of developers, AJ Patton and Rachel Voss, uh, architects Doug Farr and Cyrus Ravetna, and attorney uh, Carol Stubblefield uh, from Neil and Leroy. The uh, development team uh, will go further into uh, the development. Oh, thank you, Michael. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair, uh, members of the commission, Carol Stubblefield with Neil and Roy, offices at 20 South Clark here on behalf of the applicant 548 Development LLC. Um, and as Michael said, uh, with us today um, from the applicant team is AJ Patton from 548 and the project architects, uh, Ravetna and uh, FAR architects. Uh, before we get started um, in presenting the project design and land use details, 
I'd like to invite AJ to speak briefly about his vision and uh, goals for this site um, and the community. AJ? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Carol. Uh, good afternoon. I'm AJ Patton, founder of 548 Development. I uh, want to uh, thank the commissioners for the opportunity to present this development. I'd like to also highlight my co-developer, uh, Rachel Voss, who's the CEO of Syzygy Cities, uh, a women-owned firm uh, based in New York City. Uh, we are excited about this opportunity. Uh, we've been actively engaged in the community, uh, working uh, in coordination with the Alderman's Office, Alderman Sue Garza, um, and uh, you know, staying true to our mission of sustainable uh, communities for all, but incorporating uh, Rachel's uh, vision uh, with Syzygy Cities about how to program in sync with the city's needs and the community's needs. And so we're excited about this opportunity and this development and, and uh, to present it to this uh, uh, group here. Great, thanks, thanks AJ. Um, as Michael mentioned, this is a request for rezoning to a residential business plan development. Uh, it is an adaptive reuse, as Michael mentioned, of an existing building, which will have 12 affordable units and then a new, uh, the construction of a new uh, uh, project development uh, five story mixed use building for uh, 46 uh, affordable housing units. The subject property is owned in part by the city of Chicago and in part by the applicant and uh, AJ and his team will acquire the city land uh, through a negotiated sale application and redevelopment agreement. Um, the project will be financed in part uh, through uh, low income housing tax credits and with that um, all of the units that are proposed for this project will be affordable units setting rents um, at levels based on an average of uh, income level of 60% um, of area median income. Um, the, the, the project design has gone through um, an extensive uh, uh, collaborative uh, uh, working process. Um, and the design that you'll see today does reflect uh, discussions and input from DPD, uh, the community and the committee on design. Uh, as AJ mentioned, uh, this project has the full support of Alderwoman Garza and the community. I'd like to turn the presentation now over to the architects who will take you through the design of the project, um, a little background of, of the site itself, and then we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cyrus Rivetna of Rivetna Architects. We are the design architect for both buildings and the architect of record for the existing building. Uh, and first, I'd just like to take a moment to thank uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, Commissioner Cox, and the rest of the Department of Planning and Development uh, for creating the Invest Southwest program. Uh, we are architects that have been developing on the south side of Chicago for the past 15 years, and it's an honor to work on this project. And it's encouraging to see high quality design and development come to these underserved neighborhoods. Uh, what you're looking at here are uh, pictures of the existing buildings on 89th Street. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, on Commercial Avenue on the same block. And this project was designed specifically for uh, the uh, South Chicago neighborhood. Uh, it's a neighborhood that has a history of a steel town. And we wanted to incorporate that history and uh, culture into the design of our buildings. And we've done that through uh, steel detailing and uh, other uh, details in the, in the building. And here you'll see these long steel lintels, uh, which were incorporated into the, build, into the existing building and new construction building. Next. Next slide. Uh, to the left, uh, the Department of Planning, I believe it's the Department of Planning is doing a new streetscape and it currently ends at 89th Street. Uh, it's a very colorful streetscape and they are planning to once the Invest Southwest project in Gallery 89 is complete, it's planning to extend over 89th Street. So we were, uh, kept that in mind uh, throughout the design. On the right is one of the murals that you see throughout the neighborhood. Uh, South Chicago is truly a diverse neighborhood uh, with people of all um, cultures and communities. Next slide. So here's a rendering of the building, uh, the two buildings. Uh, the new construction building, which is 46 apartments, all affordable. And to the right, you see the existing building, which is being remodeled. Uh, between them, we created this courtyard. And with the courtyard, we really wanted to give something back to the community. And that to us is that courtyard. It's not only the entrance to these buildings, but also becomes a community space in which the community can gather. 
the retail opens up onto that courtyard. There's a stage there. There's specific areas for artwork. Uh, and we envision it as a place that the community can come and uh, enjoy and use uh, as, in addition to the residents of these buildings. Next slide. So this is the view towards the site that one story white building will be demolished. Uh, and you can see just to the left of the streetscape, which ends right now at 89th Street. Uh, we are intending to draw that commercial corridor across 89th Street uh, with modern retail, quality living, and design excellence. Next slide. This is the same view. Uh, so with our new building on the left, and just in the distance, you'll see the existing building. And way in the distance, you see the uh, cathedral, the tower of the cathedral for the project you saw earlier today. Next slide. This is a view looking back down Commercial Avenue. Uh, to the right is the uh, existing building. Uh, what you see in patina green there, that's the existing long steel lintel that I mentioned earlier. And that, that steel lintel is an existing lintel and we wanted to celebrate it. Uh, by painting it a contrasting color. And uh, the new construction building is reminiscent of that with the uh, long steel lintels creating those masonry bays. Next slide. Uh, the project fully complies with DOH architectural technical standards. And we have referenced the neighborhood design guidelines as well from DPD. Next. So we have, uh, this is a timeline of the project. Uh, the original RFP was released in 11 of 2020. We submitted our response in uh, March of 2021. And throughout the process, we have engaged with um, the Department of Planning. We've met with the D Committee on Design. We've met with the Department of Housing. Uh, and I'd like to uh, just say a special thanks to Alderwoman Garza. She's been an advocate for this project from the start, and she's been a, a great resource for us. And most importantly, though, I would like to thank the community. Uh, we have met with them several times, and they seem to be supportive of this project. Next, prep, next slide. This is an evolution of the design. Up in the upper left is our original RFP response. It went through several iterations until what it is today, um, in the lower right. Next slide. Uh, so this is a quick rendering of the courtyard. Again, it's this is our gift back to the city. We wanted to give something back to the city and back to the community. Uh, to the right, you see building A up at the top and building B, that's the new construction building and the courtyard in between there with stage, the stage and specific areas for art and the entrances to both buildings. Next slide. This is our site plan. Uh, the site is a very tight site. Uh, we were uh, able to include 11 parking spaces and one loading dock. Uh, one of those parking spaces will be a level three charging station for EV charging. And there is the future hookup for a second level three charging station. Uh, on the slide, you can also see the four retail spaces, two in the existing building and two in the new building. Uh, those are flexible retail. So uh, we will have up to four tenants, um, could have one in each retail space, or there's a possibility that one tenant, one larger tenant could rent both of, uh, all, or all four of those retail spaces. Next slide. This is the ground floor of the existing building. In the purple, you see the two retail spaces. Uh, in the, the middle, uh, that darker purple is the entrance, which is off of the courtyard. And in the rear, we have two loft style uh, residential apartments, and those will have 13 foot high ceilings. Throughout the existing building, we retained as much of the old brick as possible. And the intent is to create these loft style buildings. And it was also important for us to have um, exterior outdoor space uh, for every apartment. We were able to do that with everything except uh, two of the apartments. And uh, we believe that significantly increases the quality of life for people, especially in affordable housing. Next slide. 
To the left, you see our typical floor plate, which is five apartments. And again, each of them has exterior outdoor space, except the one in the upper right. Next slide. So again, this is a classic Chicago facade. Uh, we didn't see any reason to significantly modify it. We consider this a restoration project. Uh, we are putting in new uh, storefront glazing. And again, to celebrate the steel town's history, we're doing some uh, steel details uh, that celebrate steel technology and steel construction. Next. This is the courtyard elevation. It has your classic Chicago common brick, uh, which brings that brings back that sort of steel town feel. And again, it has in the those dark rectangles are areas for artwork. Uh, and there's a there's an organization in the community called Sky Art, and the intent is to collaborate with them for art and murals. Uh, the large white rectangles are glass garage doors that open out onto the courtyard and really activate that courtyard to uh, bring the retail out there to really make that courtyard a community space. Next. And the building sections. And with that, I will turn it over to the architect of record for the new construction building, Doug Farr of Farr & Associates. Good afternoon. Thank you, Cyrus. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, thank you. Um, it's my honor to present this and thank you all for your time. Um, I'll be brief. Um, I'm going to lead you through Building B. And as Cyrus indicated, we collaborated very closely with uh, Rivet and Architects on the design of this. So here's the ground floor. A few things I want to point out. The blue uh, indicates the residential lobby and the community room. The salmon uh, represents the two community spaces along uh, commercial and 89th. You can see there are up to four retail entries that are possible there. Um, we have two ground floor units in the yellow, the lighter, lighter and darker yellow. Um, and then gray indicates loading zone, bike storage, and tenant storage. Uh, next slide. So this is the second floor, and I'll show you uh, floors two through five. One of the key um, moves we made design-wise was to step the building back to uh, minimize shading of the courtyard. So um, on the second floor, there are 11 units as there are on all of the upper floors, but I'll point out to you how the, the building steps. But a couple of other things to point out, 11 units, uh, ones, twos, and threes. You can see um, uh, along the facade, along um, commercial and 89th, we have recessed balconies. So they're very uh, lovely amenities, recessed, private from the street um, that carry the, carry themselves up through the facade. And I'll point out to you the upper two um, uh, apartment units are three bedrooms on floors two and three. And I'll show you in a minute how those uh, step back as we go within a U-shaped uh, hallway in, in violet or purple. Next slide, please. So this is um, this is the fourth floor, and as you can see, the two everything is the same except the two units to the top of the plan have gone from three bedrooms to two bedrooms to create that setback and admit more natural light into the courtyard. Um, next slide, please. This is the fifth floor plan, and we've done a second step where those uh, northernmost two bed. Uh, two apartments have gone from three to two and now to one bedroom units, creating two steps. And as you can see, the, the recessed balconies carry themselves uh, from grade up to the roof. Next slide. A roof plan isn't usually a sexy thing, but it is in our project. Um, so what you see here is the um, uh, all those little boxes are future solar panels, the capacity to have quite quite a large number of panels. Part of the 548 mission is renewable energy and uh, reducing utility costs for tenants. And so um, shown here, um, preliminary is more than 200 uh, solar panels. Because of the incredible energy efficiency of the building, and I can talk about that in a minute, um, these panels, if we build out this many, will provide 30 to 40 percent of the estimated total annual load, energy load for the building, which is incredible for a five-story building. Next slide. Um, this slide just shows that we are our um, electrical stairway and elevator penthouse is uh, 477 square feet, smaller than the 750 square feet allowed. Um, the building is under 70 feet uh, height, except for this. 
um, elevator and stairway overrun, which is 74 feet to next slide. So here are uh, two street elevations. The south one is um, on facing 89th Street and the east is facing commercial. Um, um, as Cyrus's the um, 3D rendering showed, we have a three-story masonry base and then an aluminum panel, fourth and fifth floor that uh, sits atop that and also slides behind it uh, both. We also, the element of the recessed balconies shown here without shadow lines will be a very powerful sort of massing move along the facade. And to Cyrus's point about the, the green accent colors, the green accent colors manifest itself in the new building on those uh, balconies, sort of a, a patina copper, copper green. Um, and then on the right hand side on the east elevation, just point out to you the courtyard recess there and how the building steps back to make sure that natural light finds its way to the courtyard. Next slide. Two more elevations. Uh, the north elevation faces the alley and we have kept some of the architectural quality uh, wrapped it uh, to the backside on the alley. Um, and then uh, the west elevation is really the courtyard elevation. So we've uh, very excited to have a strong masonry base, in this case, using structural brick um, for that. Um, next slide. Um, this um, graphic is curiously cut off. The thing I want to point out to you is that one of the features of the uh, building B is what we call an active stair. So this is a stair that um, the, you come in the lobby, you see the stairs straight ahead, we have hold open doors, and then we have a skylight at the top of the stairs. So as you come in the lobby, you will see a brightly lit, naturally lit stairway. And we're hoping that that, that allows tenants or encourages tenants to take the stairs um, and get a little exercise instead of just riding the elevator the whole time. Next slide. So this is um, a simple axonometric of our construction. So this building is, as mentioned, is Passive House certified. One of the things that uh, compels you to do to deliver that high level of energy performance is to keep a consistent uh, building assembly and wall enclosure systems. The way we do that here is the lower three floors are a structural brick that actually sits outboard of the wall assembly and enclosure and then above that metal panels. So um, it's, it'll be a really deep facade which uh, will create architectural and pedestrian interest uh, as well as help us a little bit with our uh, win window shading. Next slide. This next slide demonstrates that we uh, comply with all of the pedestrian uh, P Street aspects that we should be doing here. Um, it's a good urban design. It will enhance the street. It's got uh, visible glass in all the right places, ample uh, entries uh, all along the street frontage. Next slide. The next slide shows that we comply with the landscape ordinance, both aspects uh, pertaining to the parking lot and to the parkway, both. Um, I won't read it to you, but um, I'm really excited that uh, just this plan always makes me very happy to see all the uh, vegetation and landscaping proposed. Next slide. This is an initial, these are our uh, preferred uh, material selections. And so on the left, you'll see uh, a dark brick uh, 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 on the base, the three-story structural brick base, dark brick, upper aluminum panels um, is a kind of a more sort of warm gray um, uh, powder coat aluminum panel. And then, as I said, the balcony accents are kind of a patinaed copper. Um, and so those are the three colors. And you can see here by reference, um, a, you know, a face brick and a common brick uh, from the building. Next slide. We um, comply uh, robustly with the city's sustainability development policy. Um, building B achieves its 100 uh, points, required 100 points, 70, 70 of them through Passive House, and then 30 others through a variety of uh, stormwater uh, and EV charging moves. And then Building A also exceeds its required 50 points uh, by 20 points. So uh, we're looking pretty good on sustainability. Next slide. Um, two slides sort of uh, touting the benefits of Passive House. So Passive House, for those of you who don't know, is the emerging, it will be the code in just a couple of years. So um, it's neat to be ahead of the curve here. FIAS as an organization happens to be based in Chicago. So it's kind of a homegrown thing to do this. So uh, anyway, a lot, lots of information here, but we are certifying under the FIAS protocol. 
It, it uses, relies on a proprietary software called Woofy, and I will say no more about this slide. Next. Um, what's cool about the next slide is that um, what you'll see here, the two bar charts on the left there, what's labeled standard construction is what the, the worst building that code would allow us to build on this site. And our building will use 60%, a little over 60% less energy than is permitted under the code. And that's an extraordinary level of performance. And, um, uh, and then that will translate to a benefit to residents of a 40% lower utility bill. We can talk another time about why it's not 60%, but it's pretty good. Several other things to call out, um, induction cooking. So those of you who have been following the news lately, about the health impacts of indoor gas cooking. This will be a very healthy building. It will be all electric, it'll be quiet. Um, and as I said, solar ray. Next slide. This next slide demonstrates the, the pathway by which we comply with the, the city stormwater ordinance. We have two underground vaults, one at 4,780 cubic feet under the parking lot and a 3,000 cubic foot one under the, the courtyard. And so um, working very well um, together, we found, found good places to put those. Next. Next slide um, uh, just demonstrates that we are meeting the city's participation goals um, uh, for uh, minority women and Chicago residents. And uh, we will comply with all three of those standards. Next slide. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Doug. So the Department of Planning and Development has uh, concluded that this development is appropriate for the site and supports its adoption. The development ensures public review of major development proposals. This project has been reviewed by the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, the Chicago Department of Transportation, the Chicago Fire Department, and the Chicago Department of Planning and Development. This development encourages unified planning and development. The proposal will not adversely affect nearby developments and is compatible with its B3-3 base zoning. The project promotes economically beneficial development patterns that are compatible with the character of the existing neighborhood. The proposal is in line with existing development patterns in the area, which are predominantly commercial and residential. And as Doug mentioned, uh, planned developments should minimize human exposure to toxic materials, conserve non-renewable energy and scarce materials, use renewable energy and materials that are sustainably harvested, and support pedestrians, bicycles, mass transit, and other alternatives to fossil fuel vehicles. Further information about this uh, proposal can be found in my report. And the team and myself are more than happy to take any questions from the commission. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and to the team. Um, very exciting project. I, I want to go on record uh, just saying how excited I am about uh, the team uh, not only complying to, to sustainability goals on this project and, and minority participation goals, but exceeding them by, by a lot. And that obviously is a great um, president for, for future projects. Uh, I'm a geek for passive house projects, so this is going to be something I, I follow uh, throughout construction um, and hope to, um, to, to, you know, bring into our practice as well. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I see Commissioner Novara has her hand raised, so please go ahead. Thank you, Chairwoman. I just wanted uh, also to extend my thanks to AJ Patton and the team for really pushing this industry, pushing all of us on how to bring passive house and the kind of sustainability features that to affordable housing that you are doing here and have been doing. Um, I think the, the kind of energy and work that you are doing to bring teams together like this and make this happen is really, really important for our field. And uh, you're really raising the bar. And I just want to thank you for that. Thank you. Um, any additional comments or questions by the commissioners? Commissioner Cox? Uh, yes, I'm, uh, 
I'm one happy camper. I feel like a sustainable development star is born here. Uh, this is the far south side folks uh, leading the way in sustainable development practices. Uh, it, it's just, it just bears uh, noting um, that we have completely reversed the table here. Uh, and the south side is now showing the north side uh, what sustainable development should look like. I don't recall seeing a project uh, of this aspiration uh, coming uh, from other regions. So I really appreciate um, the partnership. I, 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 I think uh, much of that is uh, uh, owed to um, AJ Patton. Uh, it's certainly one of the signatures of his development company, but he, but he also found uh, his partner in crime uh, with Fire Associates. Uh, probably could not ask for a, a better partner to, to make this real. So I'm just uh, really, really impressed. Um, I appreciate um, the evolution of the project. Uh, Ravetna, I think, uh, done a wonderful job of uh, retaining your original design intent, uh, and but getting the, the density right, the aspirations right, the material right, uh, and ultimately the, uh, the the goals for the project, right? I think an all electric building, a, a low energy building, uh, this is really what um, folks who, um, uh, who who need that extra affordability uh, built into it um, to, to have someone being mindful of their utility use uh, so that that's not a burden uh, on the future residents. I also would just re remind people, I mean, it's been like 24 months since this was awarded um, on a, the city owned one vacant lot of this. <laughs> the other was a Cook County property uh, and uh, a legacy owner who was not able to um, attract this type of investment. So this was definitely not an easy project to take on. Uh, but I think the um, it means a lot to Commercial Avenue to see a project like this happen. Um, and I'm glad that we took it on, even though we didn't have majority ownership of it. And I appreciate the patience of the developer um, to work with all of these entities to assemble the site to create, I think, a very memorable place. I particularly appreciate the reuse of the uh, beautiful uh, mercantile building. Uh, that is also becoming a signature of Invest Southwest. You know, throw nothing away, uh, adaptive, reuse, uh, adaptive reuse, but also just selective demolition. So very, very sophisticated in what you uh, what you keep and what you um, uh, demolish in favor of a new public courtyard. Uh, and I think that that those pocket spaces are so incredibly valuable to the quality of life. I don't think there are many uh, like this on Commercial Avenue. So I think it's going to be a real hit uh, for outdoor dining, for uh, performance. It's just, uh, again, um, I think it'll be a great place to, to, to actually have your residential address to come into that courtyard uh, every day um, and just kind of get into the mood. Uh, so really just my hats off uh, to the entire team. Uh, for giving uh, Invest Southwest uh, yet another signature um, project, which I think will uh, be a case study uh, for others who are trying to do uh, passive house anywhere in the city. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. Um, Commissioner Reyes? Just briefly, um, I just wanna echo what has been said by both commissioners um, and uh, I, I truly, uh, you know, uh, commend the team because to do affordable housing is extremely difficult and to do it this way where you are preserving in, and creating new units with passive housing methodology. I, I truly, I wanna learn all the details and the performance and all of that because truly this is an amazing uh, model as it was said and also because it is located in South Chicago, an area and community that desperately need this kind of incentive, economic development in affordable housing. So uh, 
beautiful uh, and um, wow, we all need a lot to learn from this one. So I'm eager to look into the details. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any additional questions or comments by the commissioners? Sounds like okay. we need to get AJ to do a webinar for our <laughs> exactly. affordable housing for community. The, yes, we'll be fans. Mm -hmm. um, okay, if uh, nobody else has any comments, so I'll, I'll go ahead and um, call for a motion. Uh, do I have a motion on a proposed residential business plan development submitted by 548 Development LLC for the property generally located at 8840? 8856 South Commercial Avenue and 2954-2964 East 89th Street, finding that it meets the requirements for approval. So move, so move. Reyes. Second. Okay. Novara. Okay, motion by Reyes, seconded by Commissioner Novara. Is that Novara? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Brumfield, are you still here? Yes. Yes, you are. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. Uh, Commissioner Burnett. Not here. Yeah. Oh, you are here. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cox. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Escareño. A big yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Flores, yes. Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Murphy. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Novara, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Reyes, can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Tony stepped away. Uh, Commissioner Wagonspack? Yes. Thank you. Hope I didn't miss anybody else. Motion passes. Big uh, congratulations to this team. Looking forward yeah. to seeing it, seeing it get done. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, three left. Let's see. Oh my God, I'm losing track of where I'm at. Just a second. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is item D9, a proposed plan development submitted by Calumet River Fleeting Inc. for the property generally located at 3025 East 104 uh, Street. The applicant is proposing to rezone the site from Plant Manufacturing District 6, PMD 6, to plan development to allow for the establishment of a new business license for a motor vehicle repair shop on the subject site. The applicant does not contain, <clears throat> excuse me, contain provisions for the construction of any new, new structures. The overall FAR of the plan development will be 0 0.03. This is item 22032, and this is in the 10th ward. Michael will be presenting again. Uh, We'll be providing the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I am here today to uh, present a plan development at 3025 East 104th Street uh, in the 10th Ward. For purely informational purposes, I do have a letter of support for this project from Alderwoman Garza. Uh, this planned development is to support Calumet River Fleeting. The property has been used as a barge cleaning facility by Calumet River Fleeting and its predecessors for the past 20 years. This planned development is being sought due to a lapse in the business license, which on a technicality triggers a new use on the waterfront, necessitating a PD under the Chicago Zoning Ordinance. The subject property is in the South Deering uh, community area. South Deering has 14,105 uh, residents with a median household income of $30,128. Uh, the community area is 63% uh, Black, 31% Latino, and 5% White. Um, 
and the land use uh, in uh, the South Darien community area is 65% uh, transportation, 10% commercial industrial, 9% open space, and 16% uh, percent, sorry, 8% 8, 8 uh, vacant. So the subject properties in planned manufacturing uh, district six, it is located within the Calumet industrial corridor and is surrounded by other industrial users or vacant property on all sides. Uh, the planning context uh, for this area includes the Calumet land use plan, which examines the history of the area, its landscape, waterways, transportation assets, and uh, potential for economic growth while protecting the natural environment. The subject property uh, is under the Calumet design guidelines, which the applicant and his team will be able to go into uh, their compliance of, with that. Uh, this is also under the uh, Chicago Sustainable Industries, which places the subject property in the Calumet uh, Industrial Corridor. So Calumet River Fleeting um, is bound by a, the proposed plan development is bound by dock slip number four to the south, the Calumet River to the east, a private railroad road uh, to the north, and then its property line to the west. There's going to be a lot uh, that we see in aerials. I would like uh, to stress that the proposed plan development is only in uh, the red box, which is the only land uh, on in the corridor that is uh, operated on by the applicant. You can see uh, their civil engineer uh, has this nice drone photo uh, facing westward. And then uh, facing eastward, uh, I am joined today uh, by Terry Hockendorf, the owner of Calumet River Fleeting. Uh, Rico Ramos of REM Architecture, Abby Veer, a civil engineer with Bono Consulting, and uh, Michael Esger, the applicant's attorney. Uh, Michael will now go into uh, more details on the development. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, my name is Michael Esger from the law firm of Acosta Esger. And um, Madam Commissioner and members of the commission, we're pleased to be before you this afternoon. And then the next slide, you'll see that we have been through uh, quite a process. It's an unusual process to reestablish this use. It's, it, the use has been here for, as Michael said, for over 20 years. And Terry inherited this as a new steward of a company that is now leasing the space. So he's not the owner, he's the, is a lessor of the business and the space. And we uh, first went to Alderwoman Garza, who was tremendously supportive and very helpful in, as guiding us through this process. And we quickly uh, met with DPD. And uh, I'd like to also thank uh, DPD, uh, Michael Penistek and Noah Safranik in particular, who really helped guide us through some unusual circumstances. Uh, there's nothing being constructed here. This is all about a use. And we wanted to make the use uh, compliant with all of the applicable codes and the Calumet uh, design guidelines. We think we've done a good job of that, and you'll see on the next slide. The site, when when Terry inherited it, um, realized that the business uh, license had expired. We met with uh, DPD in the, in the first order of business, and the instruction was to clean up the site. There was some environmental issues. Again, that Terry inherited. He doesn't own the site. You can see on the north uh, side of the site, there's uh, taconite and iron fine piles uh, that were sitting there and that we had to remove that. And Terry worked hard with the ownership to get that removed properly. Um, we also um, embarked on a year-long mission to clean up the site um, as, as required. And if you look at the next slide, you'll see the progress that Terry and his team at Calumet River Fleeting made uh, to really organize and clean the site, remove um, any of the uh, non-approved materials. And this is what the site is starting to look like now. We're further organizing the site. If we go to the next slide. Uh, you can see the site plan. We wanted to show 
where things are temporarily stored. Uh, Calumet River bleeding is a barge cleaning operation. Uh, many ships come here or boats come here, barges, tugboats from all over the city. People that are doing business on the river and on the lake come to uh, Calumet River fleeting to be cleaned, to be serviced. Um, this includes even the architectural uh, boat tours and uh, that we see on the Chicago River come here uh, for service. Um, if we go to, and it's an active uh, river dependent use. If we go to the next slide, you can see that um, under the Calumet uh, design guidelines, we, we are an active use and uh, still we wanted to maintain some setbacks around the river, uh, which I think uh, Terry has done a good job to organize it in that fashion and to sort of identify things that we can do for stormwater, um, additional plantings, which you'll see on the next slide. So the next slide shows us that um, there are certain guidelines that um, we're trying to meet that are applicable. Some of those are the landscaping. So right now there's there's really no landscaping to speak of on the site. We're introducing four new areas of landscaping around uh, a vehicular use area. So the cars for the 16 employees will be parked right in the front with uh, expansive spaces around them that are gonna be uh, greened, greened up with landscaping. Um, there's a new green space to the east of the vehicular use area on the north property line on the north side of the building and on the west side of the building. And th these are areas, just as the guidelines suggest, where employees can go out and have lunch. There, it can be a break area, but it's also an area that sort of shields the, and uh, creates a better view from the street. The street is very far away. Um, as Michael said, we're sort of uh, landlocked to our, to the way to the east of any uh, right of ways. Still, we're introducing 16 new trees and um, and native plantings as well. If we go to the next slide, um, you'll see a blow up of the vehicular use area, some calculations that we did working with uh, DPD and um, uh, landscape uh, sustainability, um, the river ecology task force as well. Um, and we are required to have 2000 square feet based on our vehicular use areas. However, um, we're introducing more than double that at 5,400 square feet. Again, with uh, native plantings um, and uh, 16 new trees. If we go to the next slide, we talk about um, the fact that these plantings, these native plantings and these a rain garden that we're essentially creating on the whole west side of the building um, will create a, a stormwater management system whereby there's a catch basin that's already existing uh, where water is collected. It'll run to that garden area on the west side of the building and then drain through this native planted area uh, before it exits into the river. And uh, we're, again, we reviewed this with the River Ecology Task Force and uh, got some really great feedback and I think um, followed some of their recommendations as well in terms of uh, the kind of plantings that are going to occur here, which are which will again be native, and that we'll pick out from a guided, uh, prescribed uh, instruction booklet from the Friends of the River as well. So, if we move to the next slide, um, you can see on the west side of the building, there's some it used to be perhaps some grass, but anyways, that will be the planted area, and you can see that there's already a drain drainage system that flows through the uh, seawall, which is in good shape. The seawall protects the site from the river. Everything is graded slightly to the north and west away from the river. Um, it is an active river use, uh, but you're going to see um, more green space introduced. And it is a way to, again, just uh, comply with all of the requirements that we have been instructed to comply with. If we move to the next slide. Um, sustainability being one of them, uh, we, we're not building anything again. This is, there's, this is all about a use. The use has existed. We just need to, uh, reapply for the business license. Um, and, but we are going through this process and we will meet 
uh, a sustainability uh, requirement of 25 points. And some of the uh, items that we picked, uh, working closely with DPD and River Ecology, to pick those that are appropriate for, for the landscaping, for stormwater, et cetera. Um, we also are introducing bicycle parking and some, we're gonna upgrade some plumbing and other things in the building itself. Uh, next slide. Uh, public benefits, and I think this is one of the reasons why everyone's been really trying to work together to make this happen. There's, besides the 16 jobs that Calumet River has, uh, Terry's other business, the um, River Marine Transport, They've been doing business down here for years. They uh, support the business community that uses the river and the lake system. We're retaining those jobs. And it's it's not just retaining the local business. This business helps so many other businesses with their, with their uh, operations, again, on the river and lake, including the tourism industry for Chicago. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Michael uh, Penistack to wrap up the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michael. Um, DPD finds that the uh, proposed development is in compliance with plan development standards and guidelines, ensuring uh, adequate review of major development proposals. This proposal has been used, has been uh, reviewed by the mayor's office for people with disabilities, the Chicago Department of Transportation, the Chicago Fire Department, and the Chicago Department of Planning and Development. It encourages unified planning and development, the proposal will not adversely affect any of the nearby uh, industrial users and it is compatible with its base zoning of PMD6. It also promotes economically beneficial development patterns that are compatible with the character of the uh, existing neighborhood. This proposal is in line with um, existing development patterns in the immediate Calumet Industrial Corridor area. Uh, further information on this proposal can be found in my staff report. I and the development team are more than happy to answer any questions the commission may have. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, do the commissioners have any questions of the uh, staff or the presenter? Commissioner Wagenspeck? Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, I was just wondering if there had been any further discussion since um, we had a quick discussion in this commission about uh, improvements to the um, to the plans for issues like landscaping in this area. So the Calumet plan or the city plan to improve those over time. And that's probably more a question for Commissioner Cox. If, um, I don't know if you had a response, but um, I do support this proposal. I think it should move forward, but um, maybe from the city side of things, what can we do again in the future to improve a lot of these sites as, as we vote on these items? So, uh, Michael, I don't know if you have uh, any update on the, the framework plan for the Calumet. I, I, the details are escaping me, but I do know we are um, planning to look holistically uh, at the river. I just don't know where we are in that process. I don't, maybe maybe Noah is uh, has information up to date on that. Yeah, but, and, it, and I don't want to take up your time today on it. No, no, but it is a, it's an extremely valid point, and you yeah. know we we uh, work on these uh, site plan by site plan, uh, but uh, that the regreening uh, along a sustainability agenda for that. Um, Calumet River is is uh, front of mind. Uh, what we end up what we end up doing is dealing with it case by case until we can catch up with the overarching uh, guidelines that will um, uh, be deployed uh, uh, holistically as these um, uh, site plans come forward. But to date, we've been doing it um, almost case by case. <laughs> So, so, Commissioner, I'll just add some high-level stuff for uh, for you on that. Uh, to the Commissioner's point, we are that is still ongoing. There is still some discussions to look at the calumet guidelines and to look at the sustainable matrix as a whole. That's something that'll be ongoing by the department. Um, in this particular case, you know, we've also talked about industrial site guidelines being uh, adopted. In this particular case, we when they went to the river design, river ecology task force to talk about best management practices and 
and improvements that should be made. You know, one of the unique scenarios here is they don't touch a public right of way. They access their site completely by an easement across another property. And they use the entirety of the river frontage on both or all three really of their edges. So there was no ability to really share this riverfront like you would typically see with our river edge uh, uh, projects. So we had worked out with the team some best management scenarios, some way to drain water to not contaminate the river and make sure that provisions were accounted for to have a, the best sustainable situation we could here, which was agreed upon with some of River Ecology Task Force members and their, their professional opinions. And that's what we uh, had them incorporate here. Um, and, and this was a unique site too, because this gentleman had a, a license for the site for years and years and years. And it was some oversight and some bookkeeping that they learned a valuable lesson from that they'll never do again. They let their license lapse. Had that not happened, we would never even have this project in front of us today. So by an error of their own, they're, they're sort of doing the mea culpa to, to continue operating here. So a long story, but hopefully that gives you some insight on, on where we're going and why we're here. No, that sounds great. And I, I think that's a, a good update to hear. And um, I understood where they were with the lapsed license. Sometimes that happens on a lot of other projects throughout the city too. So I just look forward to all of DPD's work and, and the ecology task force on uh, changing or updating that plan and mm -hmm. uh, thought, thought it would be a good moment for you just to uh, give a quick update. So I appreciate that. Thank you all. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner. Um, I, I'm not seeing any hands uh, raised, but uh, do we have Alderwoman um, Garza here or anybody from her staff? Uh, she's in support, Chairwoman. She had to leave for an afternoon meeting. I was hoping to catch her and let her know to come back before uh, before this was over, but unfortunately she's, she's tied up, but she is in support uh, and she offers her holistic support to this company and their operations. Thank you, Noah. Um, are there any other comments or questions by the commissioners? Okay, then I'll go ahead and ask for a motion. Um, do I have a motion on a proposed plan development submitted by Calumet River Fleeting Inc for the property generally located at 3025 East 104th Street, finding that it meets the requirements for approval. I'll make that motion, Chairwoman. Alderman Wagenspack, I mean, uh, Thank Commissioner Wagenspack. Thank you, Commissioner Wagenspack. Do I have a second? Second, Alderman. Thank you, Commissioner Burnett. Okay, roll call vote. Commissioner Brumfield. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Burnett is a yes. Commissioner Cox? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Escareño? Would you have to step away, maybe? Okay. Commissioner Flores is a yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Novara? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Reyes? Yes. Thank you. And Commissioner Wagenspach, can you? Yes. Yes. From? Thank you. Uh, motion passes. Thank, Thank you. you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Okay, two more items left. And as a reminder, item D10 was heard first today. So we're gonna go on to um, item D11. Uh, a proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance application submitted by the Chicago Park District for the property generally located at 5950 South Stony Island Avenue. The applicant proposes to improve a 3.3 uh, acre outdoor area at the eastern end of the Midway uh, Pleasance Park. It will include, include a new playground, lawn, gardens, and associated utility work. This is Lakefront item 777, and it's in the fifth ward. Yandi Wang will provide the context overview, and the applicant will present their proposal. 
Thank you, Chairwoman. Good afternoon. My name is Yang Di Wang. I'm an urban designer in the Southeast region with the Department of Planning and Development. I'm here today to introduce a proposed lakefront protection ordinance item in Midway Plansons in the Fifth Ward. The applicant, Chicago Park District, is requesting the approval of the lakefront protection ordinance to improve the outdoor area at the eastern end of the Midway Plansons. Peter Gleason from Chicago Park District and Rob Rowland from Site Design Group are here with me today to present the project. The proposed project is in the fifth ward as represented by Alderman Leslie Hurston. It's in the Hyde Park community area, which is a diverse community on the south side of Chicago. The site is at the east end of the Midway Pleasance. The Midway Pleasance is a, line, a linear park connecting Jackson and Washington Parks in the Hyde Park community. The site is bounded by Metro Tracks and the South Stony Island Avenue and is adjacent to Jackson Park and the future Obama Presidential Center. The proposed project is in the RM-6 zoning district. It's in the public use zone of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance. This proposal is a lakefront protection application only and does not involve any zoning changes. The site will remain zoned as RM-6. The surrounding land uses for the site are primarily residential neighborhoods, educational institutions, and parks and open spaces. Now I would like to turn the presentation over to Heather Gleason. Thank you so much, Yang Di. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Heather Gleason. I'm the Director of Planning and Construction for the Chicago Park District, and we'd like to thank the Commission for hearing this proposal today. Um, we're really excited to share this project with you. Um, this is an inclusive inclusive play and nature play space that has a lot of unique features for our patrons that we think will be a big benefit to the community. I would be remiss if I did not thank Alderwoman Hairston for raising the idea of a unique inclusive playground in the fifth ward we think will be big several years ago by introducing us to the Magical Bridge Foundation out of Palo Alto, California. That organization identified a need for a more broadly inclusive, multi-generational play space as the founder, Olenka Villarreal, had two daughters, one with special needs, and found that there were no playgrounds that could meet the needs of Robin Clay could meet the needs of both of her daughters to be able to play together. Thus, the concept of the Magical Bridge was born. Though their foundation structure and our procurement rules did not exactly allow us to contract with one another, much of the inclusive play spaces that you will see in our presentation today are inspired by their vision that everyone deserves to play on playgrounds that improve improve physical, social, emotional, and mental health of everyone in the community, regardless of their age or ability. Again, we'd like to thank Alderwoman Harrison for bringing this important concept to Chicago. So the slide here is showing you just the project study area and some of the features that you'll see now. So right now it is passive open space. Um, and the there are several features that we will highlight throughout the presentation. If we could go to the next slide. And this slide just zooms in a little bit to show you the project area. Yeah, um, our limit and some of the surrounding area. So the site is bordered by 59th and Midway Plaisance on the north, 60th and Midway Plaisance on the south. The 59th Street Metro stop and tracks are located to our west, and then Stony Island and Jackson Park are to our east. Next slide, please. And then these images just show a little bit more context on the site. The first image on the right shows the Metro embankment to the northwest. The second one shows the site looking northeast from Stony Island. The third image is looking southwest from the Metro embankment into the site. And then finally looking towards, uh, looking from Jackson Park towards the southeast and into this eastern panel of the Midway Plaisance. Next slide. And this just shows a little bit more of the, the site conditions now. Um, as you can see, um, we have a large, as you can see, uh, we have a large open space that's surrounded by trees. There are drainage issues on the site that you can see as well. Um, and then we are mandated actually as part of this project to address. Next slide, please. And then some more context photos. So I think you heard some of the speakers speak earlier that the Cheney Good Memorial, which you can see in that third picture at the top row there. Um, it has been painted black um, over the years, um, and we want to make sure that we correct that for the community. That's something they asked us to do. And then also you can sort of see the conditions of the sidewalks, um, and we want to make sure that we are improving all of those features as part of this project. Next slide, please. 
So there is quite a lot of planning context to this project that we wanted to make the commission aware of before we give more details on the design. The project is actually mandated by a federal agreement governing the improvements in Jack and Park related to the construction of the Obama Presidential Center. The agreement is called a Memorandum of Agreement and was signed on November 10th of 2020 by the Federal Highway Administration, the National Park Service, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, the Illinois Historic Preservation Office, the City of Chicago Department of Planning and Development, the Chicago Department of Transportation, and the Chicago Park District. We generally referred to this agreement as the MOA, and it required a series of mitigations in order to mitigate the effects of the construction on historic and cultural resources in Jackson Park. Altogether, there are eight mitigation measures, and this one is referred to in the agreement as Stipulation G, which requires um, design review of the modifications to the east end of the Midway Plaisance for a new play area in keeping with the city's responsibilities under an agreement called the UPAR. Uh, UPAR stands for the Urban Park and Re Recreation Recovery Act of 1978. It is a federal program that provided federal grants to park spaces as long as the recipients kept the sites for recreational use in perpetuity. Jackson Park was one of the parks that received a UPAR grant, and as a result of the OPC going into Jackson, a private entity going into a public park space, the National Park Service determined that a replacement site needed to be found for to comply with this grant. The site that was chosen to replace the lost recreation space was this east panel of the Midway Plaisance. As such, the city, the Park District, and the National Park Service signed an amended UPAR agreement on May 21st of 2021. Both of these federal agreements can be found on the city's website listed in red below. Next slide, please. So this image just highlights some of the required elements that we have under this UPAR agreement for the Midway Play Space. So we are including um, play space. We're doing a lot of historic restoration. So we're restoring the historic tree plantings and walkways. We're installing a playground structure that includes both nature play and inclusive play facilities on the west side of the site. We're improving the drainage on the east side um, to provide more improved informal recreation. I think you heard from some of the speakers earlier that um, soccer has played here quite a bit. And the agreement with the federal government actually says that we need to provide a space um, that is approximately 30 by 50 yards um, for informal recreation. Next slide, please. So moving on to the project timeline and outreach, the Chicago Park District presented various stages of design for public comment throughout 2022, beginning with sharing the early in which they early design concepts at Alderwoman Harrison's Ward Night on January of 2022. The Park District then hosted five additional community meetings throughout 2022 to obtain community feedback. The videos of those five meetings are posted on the Chicago Park District's features, featured capital projects webpage if anyone would like more information or watch the videos. And then we also made changes to the design um, that came forward as a result of the community's requests throughout these meetings. So the original federal agreements did not um, mandate us to restore and preserve the Cheney Good Memorial, but we agreed it absolutely needed to be restored. So we've now included that in the plans. They also asked us to consider site access, safety, and proximity to restroom facilities. Also, they wanted to maintain the embankment near Metra as a hill for sledding, which the kids use now for sledding, um, which we've agreed to do. And then they also wanted us to look at mitigating noise pollution, maintaining calmness and serenity of the space, as well as maximizing the green space um, on the property. So I will now turn the presentation over to Rob Roiland from SITE to explain how we designed the space to both meet the federal requirements of the MOA and the UPAR agreements, as well as to meet these additional community requests. Rob. Thank you, Heather. Uh, good morning. Uh, good, afternoon. good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rob Ruin. I'm a landscape architect at Site Design Group, and I'm going to walk you through some of the design elements here um, at Midway Play, which we're extremely excited about. So um, this first slide that we're looking at is what we're calling our overall concept and framework plan. Um, as Heather mentioned, there's a couple things that we really had to make sure that we were going to accomplish with this project. And the first was restoring the historic uh, tree alley that defines the, really defines the character of the midway along the north and the south ends of the site, um, bringing back a north-south connecting walkway highlighted in uh, yellow along the west side of the site. And then this idea of this universally accessible nature-based play space, which is a large yellow ellipse um, just immediately east of that, and then our large um, open lawn space in the, the play space. Go to the next slide. Dive in a little bit more detail here um, on some of the, the big notes of the design. Um, but so we talked a little bit about restoring of the mixed use uh, 
trail and tree alley along the north and the south side. So we'll be uh, repairing those pathways and uh, bringing back uh, those trees and infilling there, updating that uh, connector pathway that ran north south. Um, we'll be restoring the Cheney Good Memorial. Um, a little bit more info coming on that here in the up subsequent slides. Uh, we'll be maintaining the landscape immediately to the west. We talked a little bit about buffering. Um, we do have an active rail line um, that runs um, on a lot of elevated tracks um, uh, by Metro. And so we want to make sure we maintain that vegetation to the greatest extent possible. Um, and then we're going to be providing some fencing around the site in certain areas, uh, restoring ornamental plantings um, at the four corners. Um, along Stony Island and Midway, and then um, making sure that we're providing this great uh, university accessible play space. So maybe go to the next slide and I'll provide some more detail on that. Before we get into that though, um, the Cheney Good Memorial, um, one of the things that was identified was the restoration of this memorial. If, if you all haven't had a chance to look into the history um, of Cheney and Good, it's extremely um, interesting in terms of securing voting rights for women um, and, and uh, you know, politics and everything else going on in the state of Illinois. So I highly recommend uh, following up on that history. If you go to the next slide. So for the uh, play space, for the site plan, um, a few things I wanted to talk through that I think are extremely important um, to the overall design. Um, our big goal was to provide a university inclusive play space. We did extensive research um, into some cutting edge techniques for that. This isn't just about providing a wheelchair accessible route um, through a play space. You know, we're trying to provide a play space that's free of any social and environmental barriers for people um, with all sorts of different levels of ability, right? So opportunities for people of all abilities to play alongside each other, as Heather mentioned earlier, but this is where I think it gets really interesting. It's about providing acceptable levels of risk um, so people can uh, be challenged and graduate to different uh, levels. So within that, we're looking at providing um, play space that uh, challenges folks and is designed for all the ranges and abilities and levels of effort in age groups, um, whether they have a, a mobility or a physical impairment in a wheelchair, maybe there's a sensory impairment, maybe they have issues um, with their vision or colorblind, or maybe there's something going on intellectually and we have some cognitive or emotional things. So all of our design work works to um, mitigate that and challenge um, users. And so with the design, there's three main pathways that run through this design. Uh, we have a universally attainable route that's um, low sensory stimulus, easier to navigate through. And it's typically on the outside because we want to make sure that users engage on their own um, conditions and their own speed. We have a moderated challenge course. Um, so this is a little bit more physically challenged. It's got a little bit more sensory and a medium level of energy. And then finally, the most difficult um, in the middle of the site is what we're calling acceptable risk. So this is the opportunity where you can really challenge yourself physically and requires the highest level of energy and movement. And this is a great opportunity for brothers and sisters and who else might be along playing with others to make sure that they're having as much fun um, on the play space as well. So um, I know it's a lot to talk through and there's a lot of labels on here. We have some renderings on the next slides that we'll go through that I think highlight some of these pieces. Um, but I think this uh, rendering here uh, might illustrate this the best. Um, this is from the northwest corner of the site looking towards the southeast. Um, along the bottom of the drawing, you'll see that north-south connector pathway that I mentioned that we were bringing back and the Cheney Good Memorial just under that tree right there in the bottom right corner. What you start to see though um, are a series of gathering spaces um, located throughout um, the playground. And so opportunities to get up and explore nature, um, shade opportunities, opportunities to explore your various senses um, and, and play, and opportunities to gather and recreate throughout the space with the large lawn um, off in the distance. If you go to the next slide, please. So we've talked earlier about um, working through the, the senses. And so we do have different nooks we're calling it for right now. We're working, still working on our terms here, um, but we have opportunities for sight, sound, touch, all, we're going to make sure we hit all of the senses within this garden. So providing these sensory nooks within the garden space. So this first one is a butterfly garden um, that would utilize native plantings, um, attract local um, butterflies and things like that and provide that opportunity to have that sight and that vision um, of all these um, attractive uh, insects and things like that within the space and provide an opportunity for refuge within the playground. Go to the next slide. 
Another item that we're looking at um, extensively is we're incorporating public art. And one of the public art pieces that we're looking at is this uh, musical play note. And so what you're seeing here uh, are a series of tuned wood elements. And so it provides the opportunities for users to walk by and touch and hit the different pieces with their hands to cr create different um, notes um, on the, the instrument. And so a great deal of fun, um, something that's very tactile uh, and provides that immediate feedback and gratification for users. Go to the next slide. Um, one of the things we're really excited about is the treetop adventure course. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about providing moderated and uh, more challenging levels of risk and challenges within the site. Um, and this, op this element provides users um, an opportunity to achieve different levels within um, a play structure that gets you up into the treetops, as we like to say. Um, and it has great uh, accessible features within this, this space. And so within here, um, there is a series of talk tubes, uh, braille panels, and other elements. So you just can all communicate within the space and then an opportunity to challenge themselves as they cross the bridge into the upper um, tower in the slide there. Go to the next slide. Uh, again, working with the nature play space, um, we always, always want to include water as just uh, something that is just universally fun for kids. Um, and this is the water play area. And what's really great about this is it provides um, users of all ages and abilities to play together, right? You can have smaller kids, little kids, but you have to actually work together to dam up the water, to pump the water um, and everything else. And so what you'll see to the top right is a accessible platform for uh, users to uh, work a hand pump, to work on their gross motor skills, um, to pump the water. And then other users along the way get to play um, with the water and do different things. Go to the next slide. One of the things that I think we're most excited about, and what's really interesting for this site is we don't have a lot of very traditional playground equipment, but this is probably one of the more traditional pieces, but this might be one of the only, I think the only um, within the Chicago Park District uh, repertoire, fully accessible swing. So this provides an opportunity for a wheelchair user to roll on, secure themselves within the swing, and then play with others on it. You know, a lot of swings you see, like at the playground, right, they're just maybe a bucket swing or a different type of um, accessible swing. This is something that's uh, relatively new, and we're really excited to um, install at the playground. Go to the next slide. Um, couple of slides, and we'll wrap up here. Uh, one of the things that um, is critical to this project, right, is the stormwater ordinance. Um, and so our project is designed in accordance with all the city of Chicago stormwater management requirements. Uh, we'll be utilizing, utilizing a number of um, best management practices through infiltration gardens um, and, and things of that nature. You go to the next slide. Um, additionally, the Chicago Park District uh, requires 25% um, minority business enterprise and 5% women business enterprise participation for all of their contracts. Um, so this project will meet or exceed all of those um, requirements outlined by the Chicago Park District. Um, I believe that ends the presentation for our end and hand that back to Yang Di. Thank you. For the record again, my name is Yang Di Wang with the Department of Planning and Development. The Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the materials submitted by the applicant and concluded that this proposal complies with the applicable places of the Lakefront Plan of Chicago and the purposes of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance based on the following policies. Policy number two, the proposal will maintain and enhance the character of the Lakeshore Parks by providing landscape improvements to this area of the Midway Plaza. Place number four, the proposal will preserve the cultural, historical, and the recreational heritage of the Lakeshore Park system by enhancing the recreational services for children and keeping the historical character of the Midway Plaza. Place number six, the proposal will increase the diversity of recreational opportunities by providing a universally accessible playground designed to cater to the needs of physically, developmentally, and emotionally impaired users. Police number eight, the proposal will increase public safety by encouraging the use of the area during park hours. Policy number 10, the proposal promotes a harmonious relationship between the lakeshore parks and the community edge by maintaining the current public path and providing safe access to the lakefront. Policy number 11, the proposal will help to improve access through the park with pathways that connect to the larger lakeshore parks. Policy number 13, the proposal will enhance the lakefront character through the improvement of recreational features. 
the Department of Planning and Development has determined the policies not immunerated here are not applicable or not the primary objectives of this proposal. Please refer to the staff report for, future, uh, for further details regarding this project. It's the recommendation of the Department of Planning and Development that this application being in conform conformance with the provisions of the Lake Michigan and the Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance be approved subject to compliance with the plans presented to you today. Thank you. Thank you, Yandy. Uh, do the commissioners have any questions of the staff or the applicant on this item? Commissioner Escareño. Yes, thank you. I'm going to have to recuse myself from a vote on this project, but I just want to highlight the importance of this project to our accessible community and the, the value that it brings to the expansion of recreation that we at the Park District are also providing the many residents uh, at the city of Chicago. Having unique elements like this are so uh, great to be able to address the needs of the community. So. For us, having a lot of the firsts, uh, specifically when it comes to filling a lot of those gaps, is, is just really uh, of great value to who we are as, as an agency. So I just wanted to say uh, thank you, and I will recuse myself from voting on this project. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Cox? Um, I just wanted to uh, thank um, Heather Gleason and the Park District for your work on this. Um, this has been a very a uh, long time coming. Uh, I recall from my first days here as we were um, going through the various um, phases of the Obama Presidential Center, uh, this particular item to activate the plaisance was one of the items uh, I was looking forward to. Uh, and uh, I'm seeing, I think in its full uh, sense, its full aspiration uh, really today. And I just can't help but, um, uh, I, I can't, what I'm seeing does not uh, jibe with the testimonies that we heard earlier. And so I, I'm just wondering, do these folks, uh, the folks who spoke very passionately that nothing should happen in that space, uh, have they seen this? Uh, and I think you have answered it because you showed the, the community process. There have been numerous uh, community meetings to get input to create what is a one of a kind uh, playscape in the entire city of Chicago. And so I just, you know, it's part of me is like disturbed that people can't see the future. They can't see a future which is beyond what we see today. And we, but I think it's crystal clear uh, that Jackson Park and the Plaisance is, is becoming um, a world class park through these amenities. And so I'm just thankful that the Park District, you know, you know, perseveres, brings folks along, uh, but is willing to create signature moments for people on the South Side because uh, they deeply, deeply deserve it. Uh, so just thank you for your steadfastness, for setting the bar really, really high and assuring that uh, Jackson Park and the Plaisance will be um, a really signature park in our system. Thank you, Commissioner. Much appreciated. Thank you. Are there any additional comments or questions by the commissioners? If not, I believe um, Alderman Hairston is here to make a statement. I am. Um, hello. Hello. How are you? We are good. How are you? I am. I am good. Um, I just want to say thank every. I want to say thank you to everybody because this has been. Um, that as Commissioner Cox said, a, an incredibly long uh, journey for something that started many, many years ago. Um, and I'm glad to see it come into fruition. Um, you know, as with anything that is new or cutting edge, uh, there's always a lot of skepticism, um, but once it gets there, uh, people uh, will enjoy it. And I think uh, that it is keeping with, um, the trajectory uh, in the way that we are doing mindful development, uh, not just in the city, but in our communities that address 
uh, a variety of needs of many of our citizens. So um, I wholeheartedly uh, support this. Thank you, Alderwoman Hurston. Um, any other comments or questions by the commissioners before we um, ask for a motion on this one? I, I don't know if this is appropriate, <laughs> but I just want to, uh, I, I need to give uh, Alderman Harrison her, 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 her roses, her flowers for being such a phenomenal uh, leader of her ward and for the South Side. We, we really all thank you. Um, this project and all of the things that we come to know and love about your ward would not be without you. So you will be sorely missed, but your legacy is so well imprinted on everything we do. Just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, um, I think I'll go ahead and ask for a motion on this item. Do I have a motion on a proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lake from Protection Ordinance application submitted by the Chicago Park District for the property generally located at 5950 South Stony Island Avenue, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? So moved. Commissioner Brumfield, do I have a second? Seconded by Commissioner Cox. Thank you. I will go ahead and uh, do the roll call vote. Commissioner Brumfield is a yes. Commissioner Burnett? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Cox is also a yes. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Escareño is a recusal. Uh, Commissioner Flores is a yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Murphy? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Novara? I think she stepped away. Uh, Commissioner Wagenspack. I think you're in the last one. Yes. Thank you. Did I miss anybody? Okay, motion passes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. On to the last one. This is item D12, a proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lake from Protection Ordinance application submitted by 1200 South Indiana LLC for the property generally located at 1225 South Indiana Avenue. The property is zoned plan development number 499 and is within the private use zone of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lake from Protection District. The applicant is seeking to construct a residential building that will contain 100 residential units that will measure 70 feet to the penthouse roof. The development will include 87 off-street parking spaces and approximately 12,000 square foot of open space. This is Lakefront item 778, and this is in the third ward. Emily Thrun will provide the context overview and the applicant will present their proposal. For the record, my name is Emily Thrun with the Department of Planning and Development. The applicant appears here today because they are seeking to construct a residential building that will contain 100 residential units that will measure 70 feet to the penthouse roof. The development will include 87 off-street parking spaces and approximately 12,000 square feet of open space. The subject site is located within the private use zone of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection District, and therefore the proposed improvements of the site are regulated by Section 16-4 Dash 150 of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Lakefront Protection Ordinance and require approval from the Chicago Plan Commission. The subject site is located in the near Southside community area. 77% of the population has a bachelor's degree or higher. Almost 52% of the residents are one-person households, and the median household income is just over $150,000. The site is bounded by South Indiana Avenue to the west, Private Drive South Prairie Avenue to the north and east, and Private Drive 13th Street to the south. The surrounding land uses in the area are predominantly residential, commercial, and open space. The site is located within a transit served location and is under a quarter mile from the CTA's Roosevelt Red, Orange, and Green Line station. The subject property is located in plan development number 499 within parcels 2A and 2A-1. 
Parcel 2A permits a maximum of 120 dwelling units, a maximum FAR 3.44, and a maximum building height of 180 feet. Parcel 2A-1 is identified as a restricted development zone in the plan development, which allows no floor area and must be dedicated to open space. Plan development number 499 entirely encompasses the areas adjacent to the site. The plan development, also known as Central Station, was originally approved in 1990 and was last amended in 2005. The site is located within the private use zone of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection District, and if the proposed project receives Lake Michigan and Lakefront Protection approval, the applicant will need to submit their plans to the department for site plan approval. This is an image of the, of the site, showing it in context of the immediate area. And here is a rendering of the proposal looking northeast. The site is currently vacant and these images show the existing context looking north and south along Indiana Avenue. The next few slides include rendered pedestrian level views of the proposed project. This is a view along Indiana looking northeast. Here is a view of the resident, residential entry along Indiana. Here's a view along Indiana looking south. Here's a view of the duplex entries along Indiana. And here's another view of the residential entry. And then finally, here's a view of the building from the proposed park. The project is subject to the Central Area Plan, the Chicago Central Area Action Plan, and the Near South Community Plan. It is also subject to the Central Station Development Guidelines and Central Station Master Plan 2 for Sub-Area 1. The Central Station Development Guidelines are a long-term vision of how the Greater Central Station Area could be developed and set forth the general land use, transportation, open space, and urban design guidelines. The Central Station Master Plan 2 for Subarea A includes a description of public improvements and design criteria that is associated with the development of parcels 2A and 2A-1. All plans and guidelines were adopted by the Chicago Plan Commission. Now I will turn the presentation over to Nick Fatikas, the applicant's attorney, who will further explain the details of the proposal. Thank you, Emily. Uh, again, my name is Nick Fatikas, and I'm one of the attorneys at the Law Offices of Sam Banks, working with the applicant and property owner um, on the proposed uh, lakefront protection application. Um, and just to give a little bit of background on uh, the timeline for review, not only with the department, but also uh, the community review process with Alderman Dow. Um, the initial intake mm -hmm. of this project actually dates back uh, to June of 2021. Um, there were a series of, uh, of revisions and resubmissions to the city um, to make sure that we were uh, in context with the uh, underlying, again, plan development number 499 um, parameters. Uh, and in terms of the community review process, we actually had our first meeting uh, just before Christmas hey, 21 with uh, Alderman Dowell and in a okay. setting. We also had conversations and participated in additional town hall meetings to show the progress of the, uh, the plan and met specifically with both the uh, Tower Residence um, Condominium Association as well as the Umbrella Association uh, for neighbors um, along our 13th Street uh, uh, to the south. Um, and again, our final presentation was in a town hall setting uh, hosted by uh, Alderman Dowell on March 16th of uh, this year. Uh, and with that, I am gonna turn the floor over to um, Bill Hornoff and Caitlin Woodward, the project architects to take uh, uh, the commission through the, uh, the planning. Uh, hi, my name is Caitlin uh, Woodward with 2RZ Architecture. I'm joined with uh, Bill Roden Hornoff. Um, as Nick mentioned, we uh, have been working closely with the Department of Planning and the adjacent community on this project. Um, as a result of some of the feedback that we've received, the building has uh, undergone a few revisions. Um, one of those being the location and design of these terrace walls that front Indiana and the park and the open space. So this is a view uh, looking south along Indiana at these duplex units. 
Uh, you can see the, the building is set back roughly 15 and a half feet from the property line. Uh, these terraces at those uh, duplex units inhabit the space between the property line and the setback. Uh, the terrace wall is uh, set back roughly 15 inches from the property line um, to kind of widen the existing sidewalk. And we've provided vegetative screening at the terrace walls. The frontage along Indiana at both the uh, duplex units and the park uh, maintain a continuous frontage along the pedestrian route. Uh, next slide. This is a view looking north along Indiana at the back at the residential entry. The ground facade level provides uh, ample glazing at the amenity spaces uh, that overlook the park as a way to kind of connect the interior and the exterior uh, spaces. We've also provided a more prominent residential entry. Uh, there's a roof canopy that extends over um, out to the property line, and we've provided uh, a continuous means of planting along Indiana. Next slide, please. Gates are provided at both the duplex levels uh, that front the park and at, along the pedestrian route on Indiana, and gates are provided at each of the main entrances for the park. The intention is, is these uh, the gates to the park lock after hours. The park will comply with Chicago Park District uh, hours, which was a request of the Alderman's office just for the security of the residents. Next slide. Um, the, the proposal has a total net site area of 44,000 square feet, which includes the footprint of the park. We uh, intend to keep all of the pedestrian amenities along Indiana intact, with the exception of the existing curb cut, which we will remove uh, to, for the safety of the pedestrian way. Uh, we're also proposing a new sidewalk along 13th with the addition of a lay-by lane for residential pickup and drop-off. Um, and access to a lower level parking uh, is access off of 13th Street. Uh, loading is located entirely inside of the building and is accessed along Prairie on the back side of the building. Next slide, please. We've been working with the Department of Planning and a landscape architect to kind of help with the design of the landscaping and the park. Uh, the park itself is surrounded by wider sidewalks uh, and planters that surround a maintained lawn. We're also intending to provide uh, ample lighting on both the building's facade and throughout the park and bench seating. Next slide. The building is five stories with 87 parking spaces located below grade accessed via a ramp again off of 13th Street. The first floor contains a loading stall that's located inside of the building, a bike storage room equipped with 100 bike parking spaces, residential amenities, and then 15 duplex units that span the first floor to the second floor. Next slide. Uh, floors one through five have a total of 100 dwelling units that uh, provide a mix of one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, and four bedroom units. The exterior of the building uh, varies in its setbacks, which uh, allow for uh, recessed balconies and balconies that hang off of the building. The roof level provides 25% uh, of the total roof area uh, will be dedicated to green roof. We're also providing an occupiable roof deck and mechanical equipment at this level. Uh, a roof canopy uh, is provided at 70 feet to kind of attempt to shield the mechanical equipment from the adjacent towers. Uh, next slide, please. The building itself, uh, from a material standpoint, has a base that uh, is at the first and second floors that wraps around the building to enhance the look of the duplex units. Above that is a brick material on floors three through five. Uh, we were asked to kind of enhance this uh, townhome appearance for the duplex units as a way to connect uh, to the adjacent townhome development directly south of us. Next slide. The building has an overall height of 70 feet from grade level to the top of the stair enclosure and the roof canopy. Next slide. 
this is the, an, an elevation along the backside of the building on Prairie. Um, you can see it's primarily clad in a brick material with some metal accents. Uh, you can also see some of the balconies, uh, both recessed and hanging off the building. Uh, you can also see access to the loading stall off of Prairie Avenue here. Next slide. Uh, this is a view on the north side of the building, again, seeing that it's primarily clad in brick um, with some metal accents. Next slide. A uh, section through the building showing uh, rough floor, floor heights of 10 feet at floors three through five, uh, as well as parking uh, underneath the park. The building consists of two main, excuse me, materials, um, a brick that is kind of a beige tone and a cast stone, which is meant to uh, mimic a limestone color, uh, as well as we're providing accents of metal panel and wood on the underside of some of the canopies. Uh, next slide. So this is a view looking at the main residential entry. You can see this base that is the cast stone that wraps around the building at these uh, duplex units. And then above is the brick material. The terrace walls that front both the park and uh, Indiana are also clad in the same brick material used above. Next slide. Uh, on the underside of the canopies uh, at the entry and at the duplex levels, we're providing, a, we're suggesting a wood material. Uh, all of the balconies that you see have a perforated metal panel that acts as the railing. Our intention is, is that this uh, perforated panel matches the standing seam metal panel around the building. Next slide. Uh, this is a view of the ter terrace units along, uh, the terraces along Indiana, kind of showing a mix of all of the materials on the building. So you can see the cast stone, the brick that comes down uh, and is also at the terrace walls, the standing seam metal panel, which is an aluminum concealed fastener panel in a smooth dark gray finish. Uh, we're also proposing an accent metal panel, uh, aluminum panel that uh, is kind of a copper tone. Next slide. This is a view of the duplex units along the park, um, showing that terrace wall that's consistent with the design along Indiana to kind of maintain the same appearance. Uh, we're also providing planters along the sidewalks at the park and then also at the terrace levels. Um, you can see the wood, uh, we're providing a wood ceiling that mimics the entry canopies at the duplex units along Indiana, and then just that cast stone and again, the brick above. Next slide. Uh, in an attempt to comply with the 13 purposes of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance, we are uh, proposing ample lighting throughout the, uh, the park and on the building's exterior to increase personal safety around the site. Um, as I mentioned, entrances around the park uh, will close after Chicago Park District hours for the safety of the residents. Um, and we're also including widening the sidewalk along Indiana as a way to promote pedestrian movement around the site. Next slide. We intend to comply with the Chicago Sustainable Development Policy. Um, the items highlighted are what we intend to provide on, for the project, meeting the 100-point requirement for our new construction building. Next slide. Uh, we also intend to meet stormwater requirements for the site. Uh, our intention is to provide a stormwater detention tank that will be uh, located below grade in the shaded region shown on, on the northeast corner of the plan. Next slide. Uh, these demonstrate the economic and public benefits that this project will bring to the community. Um, and with that, uh, thank you. I'll pass it back over to Emily and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. The Department of Planning and Development has reviewed the project materials submitted by the applicant and has concluded that this proposal is in compliance with the applicable policies of the Lakefront Plan of Chicago and the purposes of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance, such as increasing the diversity of recreational opportunities by incorporating a publicly accessible open space at the corner of Indiana and East 13th Street, increasing personal safety by improving a currently vacant property, 
The proposed development also includes additional lighting throughout the building's exterior and the park. The proposal has been reviewed by city departments to ensure proper coordination and planning for the area. The proposal promotes and provides for improved transportation access to the lakefront by widening the existing sidewalk along Indiana to encourage a more pedestrian friendly environment and includes a bike storage room with 100 bike parking spaces to promote alternative transportation options. With respect to the policies and purposes not enumerated here, the Department of Planning and Development has determined that they are not applicable or primary objectives of this proposal. Please refer to my staff report for further details regarding this project and plans identified here today. Based on the foregoing, it is the recommendation of the Zoning Administrator of the Department of Planning and Development that this application, being in conformance with the provisions of the Lake Michigan and Chicago Lakefront Protection Ordinance, be approved, subject to compliance with the plans presented to you today. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, do the commissioners have any questions of the staff or the applicant? Everybody's pretty quiet now. It's been a long day. <laughs> it's been a long day, I know, for everybody left. Um, is Alderman Dowell here to speak on this item? Chairwoman, she was unable to attend, but she did submit a letter of no objection to the department. Okay. Uh, again, uh, last minute, you know, request if anybody has any comments or questions. Otherwise, we'll go um, ask for a motion on this item. Chairwoman, I'll make a motion. This is uh, Commissioner Wagusback. We had this in finance too, so I'd be okay. happy to make the okay. motion. Let me just read it out loud and then you can be uh, the first one. Um, do I have a motion on a proposed Lake Michigan and Chicago Lake from protection ordinance application submitted by 1200 South Indiana LLC for the property generally located at 1225 South Indiana Avenue, finding that it meets the requirements for approval? Motion by Commissioner Wagenspack. Do I have a second? Seconded by Commissioner Lyons. Thank you, Commissioner Lyons. Uh, roll call vote. Commissioner Brenfield. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Burnett. I think we lost him. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Thank you. Burnett says yes. Burnett says yes. Okay. Thank you. I got you, Commissioner Burnett. Um, Commissioner Escareño, are you still here? Not seeing her, no. Okay, Commissioner Flores is a yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Murphy? Yes. Thank you. And I think Commissioner Wagon's back. Might be the last. Yes. Thank you. That is still enough votes, correct, Noah? Okay, thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congrats to the team. Um, I think we're ready to uh, adjourn. This concludes this so, month's meeting. Of, yes, Burnett? Commissioner, before we adjourn, yes. Yes. first of all, I want to take this opportunity to let all of you all know that uh, we really appreciate everybody's civic uh, duty on being here for many hours, taking time out of your job and profession to be here and, and helping to um, guide the city of Chicago with development. Um, all of you guys have been fantastic. I don't know if you're going to be here, you know, after this, um, but, um, you know, it'd be to the, to, uh, to the benefit of the city if you were. I don't know how many other uh, last people they're going to find they want to be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to say thank you guys so much for everything and your commitment, you know, for myself and the other aldermen here, here. who work for the city. It's our jobs, right? You know, so while we're sitting here, we're getting paid. You guys aren't. So thank you guys very much. But also, I'd be remiss, you know, if I did not uh, acknowledge uh, some of the commissioners, um, you know, from transportation, from the park district, from planning, from housing, you all have done a fantastic job, um, you know, with development in the city, 
uh, you know, working on all of the things that you all have worked on. Um, Commissioner Cox, you know, you interject uh, a sense of hope uh, in, the, in the West and the South Side, you know, and made some things happen. Uh, and you and Commissioner Navarro together have, uh, you know, really pushed for affordable housing and leveraged dollars for affordable housing happening in the Fulton Market in particular in my ward and, and in other places across the city. Uh, Commissioner Navarro, you hit the ground running when you first got here and and uh, you started a, a commission on dealing with the ARO to advance it. And um, and you've been doing a great job ever since. Matter of fact, uh, you know, even some of the young, young African-American um, contractors and developers in the city wouldn't have gotten as much as they gotten if it wasn't for folks like you and, and Commissioner Cock. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Gia, uh, Commissioner, you have done a great job with transportation around the city, uh, constantly trying to push these bike lanes on people. I'm just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you've been been dealing with the, you know, the emerging different modes of transportation that's happening in an ever um, emerging and changing city and, and trying to attract the young people to the city. So I just want to commend and thank all of you all. Uh, and and, and uh, Rosa, you, you know, you came in when and they needed you, you know, I don't know how you left your, your husband let you leave uh, being retired uh, to come back and, and, and put this, put the park district back on course. Um, and, you know, pretty much people forgot all of the negative things that happened over there. Uh, and you've been a steady hand over there and doing a fantastic job with enhancing our parks. And uh, I just want to say uh, thank you and also to all of the staff, um, the planning staff. Uh, they've all been fantastic. Uh, and, you know, I hope, you know, all you guys stay. I look forward to working with you guys again. Uh, you know, I, I um, you know, I'll probably get to work with you guys more than most other aldermen, or at least I feel like that. Uh, it was <laughs> true. <or not. laughs> you know, sometimes we'd be feeling like we're the only one all the time. But, uh, you know, um, I just want to say thank you guys. Uh, and, and, and again, to all of the commissioners for lending you or us your professions, uh, your professional perspective in dealing with this. Um, you know, thank you all very much. Um, I know it's, it's really, it really, it, it has really been an honor to be on a committee with such smart people and dedicated people. And I'd be remiss if I did not acknowledge the aldermen who've been here. You know, Alderman Tunney, man, you hear all the time, dude, you know, and you even hear it today. And, you know, and, you know, and um, I just want to say, man, I commend you. You are committed to the growth and you're concerned about what happens in the city. Thank you very much, Commissioner Wagaspak. Um, you know, Commissioner um, Gil Viegas, you know, uh, you know, we've, uh, you know, quite as a scale, we've done a lot of things, man. We've uh, encouraged folks to make sure that we had some set asides for minority uh, contractors, you know, MBEs and WBEs set in the planning process. I mean, those are big steps and big things that we've done uh, in the past. And, um, you know, you guys have helped people to, you know, help people feet to the fire and dealing with design. Of course, of course, you know, for me, I know all you architects love that stuff. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't forget but, but, the Invest Southwest initiative. <laughs> yeah, you guys have done a, a, a fantastic job. Uh, you know, you have set some precedents in this city that's going to carry on for years to come. A lot of seeds and a lot of things that we, a lot of seeds and a lot of things that we have voted on here, you know, we won't see the flowers of it until a couple of years from now. And when people start seeing all these infield things around the city, they're going to be like, wow, you know? And um, so I just want to commend um, everybody. It's been a pleasure uh, working with all of you all. And, you know, um, who knows, maybe we'll be here next month and I'll say, hey, glad you're still here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you never know. 
but uh, uh, or, or for some of you guys who got uh, your regular business, maybe too bad you're still here. I don't know. I don't know how you would take it. <laughs> <laughs> they asked you again. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, uh, I just want to say it's been a pleasure. It's been an honor. I've learned so much. Um, and and um, I'm so proud of all of the things that we've been able to work on. And we've been pushing things out. Um, all during all, all during the pandemic, mm-hmm. we were still moving. We were still moving and grooving. Things were still happening. And I don't think a lot of people in society even recognize that. That, mm-hmm. you know, even when everybody else was closed down, we were still rocking and rolling. So uh and and, and making things happen and, and keeping the city moving. And um I just want to say thank you. And it's been a pleasure. Mm-hmm. And um whatever happens from here. Uh, God speed be, be with all of y'all. Thank you very much. Awesome. Mm, such good words. I echo yeah. the same. Yeah. I thank you. thank you, Commissioner Cox and everybody for um, for making this a great experience for all mm-hmm. of us involved and uh, for also giving us a chance and, and trusting us and doing this. So um, I'm hopeful that you'll be here next month. So let's just say, see you next month. Um, there you go. Thanks so much. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> let me uh, still do the proper thing and uh, do roll call vote for the uh, adjournment. Um, let's see who's left. Uh, Commissioner Brentfield. Yes. And uh, thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Alderman Burnett, for your kind words. Thank you. We're committed to the city. <laughs> Uh, Commissioner Burnett. Thank you. Commissioner Cox. Yes. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. All. Commissioner Flores. Yes. Who else is left? Uh, Commissioner Lyons. Yes. Thank you. Alderman Burnett. Thank you. I think the last one is Commissioner Wagensback. Actually, Commissioner Murphy. Uh, yes. Okay, Murphy. Yes, and then Commissioner Wagenspeck, you were going to say something. Uh, just yes, and ditto to everything the alderman said because you guys have been incredibly great in helping us move everything forward. That sometimes we don't do the best on, but you guys have really added great touch and um, experience to everything that's good for the city. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have what about a... Commissioner? What What about Commissioner Butler? <laughs> he's gonna be He's gonna be recruited. I feel like um, eventually, eventually he. Oh wow. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, this concludes uh, this month's meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission, and it is now three forty nine. Thank you. There you go. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. See you next month.